from our platforms to our labs, offices, and facilities, and in communities around the world. We're continuously innovating to find better, cleaner, more efficient ways to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. Energy is essential to providing cleaner air and water, access to education and healthcare. Reliable, affordable energy improves lives. on mobile. European University Cyprus is a leading international university which stands apart with its high academic values, its modern campus and its commitment to the wider community. With an important regional presence, European University Cyprus has distinguished itself in teaching excellence, academic and scientific research with an impressive rate of growth. QS Top Universities, the most authoritative international rating organization, ranked European University Cyprus among the top universities in the world, granting it a five-star rating in the fields of teaching, facilities, internationalization, employability, inclusiveness, and social responsibility. In 2020, the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings placed European University Cyprus among the top 101 universities worldwide for innovation, industry and infrastructure. Its auditoriums have hosted globally acclaimed personalities. Its lecture halls have been graced with internationally acknowledged academics. It is here at European University Cyprus that Microsoft established the Microsoft Innovation Center, one of only 110 operating globally, connecting knowledge and research with entrepreneurship and innovation. Take one step forward onto the unfolding path of your future. European University Cyprus will give you the knowledge and the power to take that journey. For 140 years, we've been enabling human progress, knowing that everything we do everywhere in the world is in service of people. Generations of our problem solvers all around the globe working brilliantly, collaboratively and inexhaustibly to provide more reliable, more affordable and ever cleaner energy.
In a world that never sleeps, your money should work for you 24-7. That is why you need a truly global account with a professional team to support you. At Econ Banks, we gathered a team of the best global tech gurus, experienced bankers and finance specialists to create the ultimate e-accounts platform. The result is astonishing. Welcome to the era of Econ Banks, a platform to rule them all. With global reach, intuitive user-friendly interface, and secure transactions, EconBanks very simply is the ultimate international e-money and e-accounts platform. EconBanks can process more than 1,000 transactions per second, hold millions of accounts and data, while communicating with a complex network of more than 20 European and international banks. EconBanks platform will rock your world. With intuitive and modern user interface, solid security features, communicating through a multi-tier network of servers, exchanging and verifying data in split seconds using biometric user verification methods. Did we mention it was created by bankers? Therefore, there is a love for regulation, making EconBanks a European authorized and licensed electronic money institution and a member of SWIFT and SEPA payments, issuing unique IBANs, empowering you to convert and transact with immediate liquid access to 100% of your funds. We make the world a smaller place with close to zero time wasting and moving your funds from east to west and south to north. While others think in a box and still use traditional means, you can be the one who breaks free. The one who sees and uses the future. One account, everything. EconBanks will allow you to interact through multiple bank accounts globally with our PSD2 API integrations using your own IBAN and our network of correspondent banking. That's how you keep your money fit and global. Will you be one of the thousands of transactions per second on our futuristic platform? Will you give power to your money? Ecom Banks, FinTech eAccounts platform. With us, the future is today.
from our platforms to our labs, offices, and facilities, and in communities around the world. We're continuously innovating to find better, cleaner, more efficient ways to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. Energy is essential to providing cleaner air and water, access to education and healthcare. Reliable, affordable energy improves lives. Exxon Mobil. European University Cyprus is a leading international university which stands apart with its high academic values, its modern campus and its commitment to the wider community. With an important regional presence, European University Cyprus has distinguished itself in teaching excellence, academic and scientific research with an impressive rate of growth. QS Top Universities, the most authoritative international rating organization, ranked European University Cyprus among the top universities in the world, granting it a five-star rating in the fields of teaching, facilities, internationalization, employability, inclusiveness, and social responsibility. In 2020, the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings placed European University Cyprus among the top 101 universities worldwide for innovation, industry and infrastructure. Its auditoriums have hosted globally acclaimed personalities. Its lecture halls have been graced with internationally acknowledged academics. It is here at European University Cyprus that Microsoft established the Microsoft Innovation Center, one of only 110 operating globally, connecting knowledge and research with entrepreneurship and innovation. Take one step forward onto the unfolding path of your future. European University Cyprus will give you the knowledge and the power to take that journey. For 140 years, we've been enabling human progress, knowing that everything we do everywhere in the world is in service of people. Generations of our problem solvers all around the globe working brilliantly, collaboratively and inexhaustibly to provide more reliable, more affordable and ever cleaner energy.
In a world that never sleeps, your money should work for you 24-7. That is why you need a truly global account with a professional team to support you. At Econ Banks, we gathered a team of the best global tech gurus, experienced bankers and finance specialists to create the ultimate e-accounts platform. The result is astonishing. Welcome to the era of Econ Banks, a platform to rule them all. With global reach, intuitive user-friendly interface, and secure transactions, EconBank's very simply is the ultimate international e-money and e-accounts platform. EconBank's can process more than 1,000 transactions per second, hold millions of accounts and data, while communicating with a complex network of more than 20 European and international banks. EconBank's platform will rock your world. With intuitive and modern user interface, solid security features, communicating through a multi-tier network of servers, exchanging and verifying data in split seconds using biometric user verification methods. Did we mention it was created by bankers? Therefore, there is a love for regulation, making EconBanks a European authorized and licensed electronic money institution and a member of SWIFT and SEPA payments, issuing unique IBANs, empowering you to convert and transact with immediate liquid access to 100% of your funds. We make the world a smaller place with close to zero time wasting and moving your funds from east to west and south to north. While others think in a box and still use traditional means, you can be the one who breaks free. The one who sees and uses the future. One account, everything. EconBanks will allow you to interact through multiple bank accounts globally with our PSD2 API integrations using your own IBAN and our network of correspondent banking. That's how you keep your money fit and global. Will you be one of the thousands of transactions per second on our futuristic platform? Will you give power to your money? Ecom Banks, FinTech eAccounts platform. With us, the future is today.
from our platforms to our labs, offices, and facilities, and in communities around the world. We're continuously innovating to find better, cleaner, more efficient ways to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. Energy is essential to providing cleaner air and water, access to education and healthcare. Reliable, affordable energy improves lives. Exxon Mobil. European University Cyprus is a leading international university which stands apart with its high academic values, its modern campus and its commitment to the wider community. With an important regional presence, European University Cyprus has distinguished itself in teaching excellence, academic and scientific research with an impressive rate of growth. QS Top Universities, the most authoritative international rating organization, ranked European University Cyprus among the top universities in the world, granting it a five-star rating in the fields of teaching, facilities, internationalization, employability, inclusiveness, and social responsibility. In 2020, the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings placed European University Cyprus among the top 101 universities worldwide for innovation, industry and infrastructure. Its auditoriums have hosted globally acclaimed personalities. Its lecture halls have been graced with internationally acknowledged academics. It is here at European University Cyprus that Microsoft established the Microsoft Innovation Center, one of only 110 operating globally, connecting knowledge and research with entrepreneurship and innovation. Take one step forward onto the unfolding path of your future. European University Cyprus will give you the knowledge and the power to take that journey. For 140 years, we've been enabling human progress, knowing that everything we do everywhere in the world is in service of people. Generations of our problem solvers all around the globe working brilliantly, collaboratively and inexhaustibly to provide more reliable, more affordable and ever cleaner energy. For 140 years, we've been enabling human progress, knowing that everything we do everywhere in the world is in service of people. Generations of our problem solvers all around the globe working brilliantly, collaboratively and inexhaustibly to provide more reliable, more affordable and ever cleaner energy. The population has access to only basic forms of energy. Each of these global citizens deserves access to a better quality of life. Affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy and the human progress it enables is essential to this basic right. We believe life depends on human energy.
In a world that never sleeps, your money should work for you 24-7. That is why you need a truly global account with a professional team to support you. At Econ Banks, we gathered a team of the best global tech gurus, experienced bankers and finance specialists to create the ultimate e-accounts platform. The result is astonishing. Welcome to the era of Econ Banks, a platform to rule them all. With global reach, intuitive user-friendly interface, and secure transactions, EconBanks very simply is the ultimate international e-money and e-accounts platform. EconBanks can process more than 1,000 transactions per second, hold millions of accounts and data, while communicating with a complex network of more than 20 European and international banks. EconBanks platform will rock your world. With intuitive and modern user interface, solid security features, communicating through a multi-tier network of servers, exchanging and verifying data in split seconds using biometric user verification methods. Did we mention it was created by bankers? Therefore, there is a love for regulation, making EconBanks a European authorized and licensed electronic money institution and a member of SWIFT and SEPA payments, issuing unique IBANs, empowering you to convert and transact with immediate liquid access to 100% of your funds. We make the world a smaller place with close to zero time wasting and moving your funds from east to west and south to north. While others think in a box and still use traditional means, you can be the one who breaks free. The one who sees and uses the future. One account, everything. EconBanks will allow you to interact through multiple bank accounts globally with our PSD2 API integrations using your own IBAN and our network of correspondent banking. That's how you keep your money fit and global. Will you be one of the thousands of transactions per second on our futuristic platform? Will you give power to your money? Ecom Banks, FinTech eAccounts platform. Welcome to the 16th Cyprus Economist Summit. This time we are virtual because of COVID-19, but we hope to be real and physical again next year. Um, obviously, this year has been difficult for everybody. Um, my name is John Pete. Um, I am the political and Brexit editor of The Economist, and it's my privilege and pleasure to be your chairman and moderator for this summit. Um, it has been a hard year economically for everybody. Um, GDP for the Eurozone as a whole, we expect that The Economist to be to fall by something like seven or eight percent this year. Cyprus a little less, six percent, but countries like the UK, Italy and Spain more. Um, we're expecting GDP to fall by 10 percent this year, which is a very deep recession, the deepest we have had in more than a century. Um, but we are now, I hope, seeing some signs of recovery. There's favorable news about vaccine. Um, all this week, there has been good news about vaccines. Um, so although we are experiencing a very deep recession, much deeper than after the financial crisis, most economists, including us, expect that the recovery will be surprisingly rapid next year. Um, and so next year should be a much better year, economically. Um, two other comments as an introduction to our summit this year. Of course, the Eastern Mediterranean has become something of a political and even to some extent um, a diplomatic and military hotspot this year, especially over gas, but there have been regional tensions, which we will hear more about during the day. Um, the, the situation in Syria has not improved much. Um, migration across the Mediterranean, still an issue. And above all, clashes with Turkey, and we have seen the site of warships in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, as an outside observer, it doesn't seem to me that the moment is very propitious or likely for reviving the settlement talks for Cyprus, um, but maybe the future will bring better news. 
We have just also been through an American election, and only today um, we are hearing that finally Donald Trump seems to be moving to conceding that the election was won by Joe Biden and the new government will be formed, and we will hear more about that during the day um, uh, from Nicholas Burns and others. Um, and I would just add a last point for by way of introduction before we move on to, the, to hear from the president of Cyprus, Concerning the UK, um, uh, we always uh, have these summits and meetings at crunched moments in the Brexit process. The UK formally left the European Union on January the 31st, as everybody knows. Um, but the trade talks on the future relationship between the UK and the European Union are still ongoing, even now, even though the transition period for the end of will end on December the 31st. So we are at a very late stage in those trade talks, and it's very difficult even now to predict whether there will be a deal or whether there will be no deal. Either way, on the 31st of December, the UK will formally and finally leave the single market and the customs union either with a trade deal or without a trade deal. So there will there is likely to be considerable disruption in the trade relationship between the UK and the European Union which will perhaps affect the UK more than the European Union, but both sides can expect to experience this disruption. And I expect that next year there will be much more attention to the future relationship between the, Euro the UK and the European Union. Um, even after the 31st of December, this, is, this story will not be finished. And that will also have some impact, I suspect, on Cyprus. So that's really my scene setting comments for, for our 16th summit. Um, I hope it works virtually, and I hope the audience will send in questions which the organizers will forward to me as the moderator, uh, and I will put them to our panels. But we are going to begin with a video message from President Nikos Anastasiadis, who has been a long-term supporter of our summit and has always addressed us. And now, um, unfortunately, we can only hear him by video link this time, but he will speak to us for 15 minutes about Cyprus after the storm, building resilience, enhancing regional cooperation, and a test for the EU's cohesion and something on the economy. So I hope the organizers can now play our video recorded message from Mr. Anastasiadis. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is with it. distinct honor that I extend a very warm welcome to all the distinguished speakers and delegates participating at the Economist Conference, which due to the new realities, the pandemic, take place in a virtual format. The fact that the conference take place for a 16th consecutive year aptly demonstrates that it has been established as a highly beneficial annual event in support of our vision to establish Cyprus as a modern and competitive business hub as well as in discussing pressing regional and global challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, without a doubt, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused unprecedented challenges for all the countries across the globe with uh, severe socioeconomic consequences. What is even most worrying is the upward trend of new coronavirus cases and deaths we are currently witnessing, the so-called second wave, a trend which posts additional pressure to our already weakened health systems, to economies which have been severely hit by the crisis, and most importantly, to social cohesion, the social welfare system, and to work and employment conditions. Hence, I believe that the only way forward in order to effectively tackle such adverse effects and maintain social justice and sustainable development is to collectively demonstrate solidarity in burden sharing the above mentioned negative effects which in an equitable and reciprocate manner share the vaccine 
once is being developed. To this end, I highly commend the efforts of the EU and the Commission and the Commissioner of Health in preordering vaccines to cover the whole EU population as well their collective demonstration of solidarity to proceed with the necessary measures in order to avoid any further adverse economic and social effects for our peoples. Distinguished friends, in dealing with this unfortunately ongoing crisis, my government has been assertive in its decision making and proactive in providing medical and economic support to our citizens, workers and enterprises. Like many other countries, we had to take harsh, painful but necessary measures in order to deal in a timely and effective manner this unprecedented public health crisis. We immediately acknowledge, however, that beyond saving lives, we also had to safeguard livelihoods and address the potential economic and social disruption the lockdown measures would cause. To this end, we adapted a generous package of fiscal and liquidity support measures of more than 1.3 billion euros through which more than 190,000 workers and thousands of businesses were supported. This was possible since the Cyprus government, due to its prudent economic management, accumulated the necessary fiscal surpluses in the past that could be used in emergency cases as the current pandemic crisis. The aim of those measures, which were uh, devised in close consultation with our social partners, was to ensure the sustainability of businesses, preserve jobs, maintain the income of our citizens, protect the rights of workers and provide the necessary support to our economy to recover as quickly as possible. I would be remiss not to mention that national efforts have been substanti substantially complemented by actions at the European level with the provision of maximum flexibility in the application of European rules in order to allow for member states to take the national measures necessary for their economies. Additionally, the agreed package of 540 billion euros loans to support companies and workers in member states has significantly contributed in provided confidence that collectively we are ready to take the appropriate measures to protect our citizens and of course our economies. Ladies and gentlemen, as regards the economic outlook of Cyprus, following uh, the unavoidable recession of economic, of economic activity in 2020, we expect a significant rebound in 2021 with positive growth rates, drop of unemployment, budget surplus and reduced public debt. Our motto in Cyprus is that with every challenge, there is always an opportunity. In this regard, the government's broader strategy for economic recovery also includes the implementation of much needed structural reforms for the further development of key economic sectors. In this regard, it is vital to also fully exploit newly established European mechanisms such as the SURE and the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which provide the government with the opportunity to accumulate almost 1.5 billion euro 
of which the first dose of almost 500 million has already been approved. And the reforms which we aim to implement as soon as possible involve the pension welfare and labor market system, the judicial and healthcare systems, and the sectors of digital transformation, tourism, research and innovation, and the green economy. We will also continue with the sound government of, governance of public finances, complemented by a business-friendly investment environment, moving forward with a comprehensive government strategy for investment facilitation and fully reforming the public service so that it facilitates growth in a modern, knowledge-based, scientific, high-tech and innovative economy. We envisage that the Cyprus economy will be eventually transformed in such a way in order to become even more competitive in the global economy stage. It is up to us to make this happen and I'm certain that we will deliver. Excellencies, distinguished friends, while the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic remains our top priority, we should not neglect, neglect reflecting on the day after, for there will be a post-COVID world. The question is, what kind of world? To this end, Global challenges require global responses and enhanced partnerships. The current pandemic has revealed the dire need to more global cooperation to deliver universal access to treatment and medication and vaccines and whatever. Ultimately, as the socio-economic challenges we face cannot be dealt with by states alone. We must also be more innovative in our thinking than ever before. We need to think about sustainable and more equitable solutions. We need to think green and in a digital context. We need to tackle existential threats such as climate change. And as we are witnessing nations and international organizations uh, struggling to adjust uh, to the needs of our rapid changing world, multilateralism comes to mind. Effective multilateralism, beyond narrow national interests, as well as regional and international cooperation, is the only viable way to tackle the multiple and complex challenges of 21st century. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have spoken of multilateralism since this is exactly the vision of our foreign policy. To develop a predictable and comprehensive strategy, both bilaterally, regionally and internationally, which will enable us to be considered as a reliable and stable partner within the EU and the UN and a pillar of stability and security in the Eastern Mediterranean. Towards this end, we promoted a web of partnerships, including trilateral and multilateral schemes with Greece, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Palestine and the Gulf countries aim at a promoting peace, security and stability in our immediate region with tangible and significant benefit for all participating countries. Unfortunately, against this background and the latest, and the latest positive developments of gradually restoring relations between Israel and Arab countries, Turkey consistently and consciously escalate tensions by enforcing us, by enforcing, excuse me, its expansionist plans through the use of force 
Eider in Syria, Libya, Iraq, Nagorno-Karabakh, and last but not least, Greece and Cyprus. Please allow me to avoid expanding on Turkey's well-known behavior in their forced countries and concentrate on its stance and unilateral actions vis-a-vis -vis my own country. Actions which run contrary to international law and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, either through illegal drilling operations and seismic surveys within the exclusive economic zone of the Republic, or via the opening of the fenced area of Varosha in violation of the relevant UN Security Council resolutions. Actions which unfortunately take place irrespective of the UN Secretary General's intention, which we fully welcome to hold an informal conference with the aim of assessing as to whether the necessary conditions are in place so as to continue negotiations from where they were left off at Grand Montana. And as it is understandable, we do hope that Turkey will finally realize that it is an absolute necessity to establish an environment conducive to halting constructive and good faith negotiations on an equal footing and not under conditions of intimidation and threats. And having referred to the Cyprus problem, I wish once again to reiterate that our aim and top priority remains none other than to reunify our island and establish a truly independent sovereign state, federal state, by zonal, by communal state, free but free from foreign dependencies, either through guarantees, the right of military intervention, and the presence of foreign troops. For us, the current unacceptable status quo or any ideas that deviate from the established UN parameters are not sustainable options. Excellencies, distinguished guests, in concluding, I wish every success to the deliberations that are to follow as well as to warmly thank the organizers of the Economist Conference for providing all these years essential insight on the Cyprus economy and the regional and international geopolitical landscape. Thank you for listening. Uh, well, thank you for that um, uh, from the president, President Nikos Anastasiadis, um, president of the Republic of Cyprus. We move straight to our second panel now. Um, all of whom I think are, are with us. Europe putting solidarity to the test. How has Cyprus tackled the pandemic? The business and academic perspectives. Um, and this panel we hope to have a, a video message from Stella Kiriakidis, the European Commissioner for Health and Food Safety, followed by um, Ierathos uh, Papadopoulos, Theodor Trifon, and Christophorus Hadjikiprianu, and then a commentator, Andreas Paraskos. So we start with Stella Kiriakidis. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, 2020 has been a most challenging year for us all. Individuals, families, businesses, and communities across Europe have suffered immensely. Our citizens saw their lives and livelihoods change overnight. Cyprus has so far been more successful than most in containing the pandemic. 
and the effort of Cyprus frontline workers, medical staff and citizens should be acknowledged and praised. But Cyprus has not been spared completely. The recent sharp increases in daily cases far exceed what we saw in the spring. A stark reminder that all of our communities are vulnerable to this virus. COVID-19 has taught us some harsh lessons. It has reminded us of the foundational importance of our health, a prerequisite for resilient, equal and sustainable communities. The pandemic has shown us how fragile our societies are and how easily they can be upended. And it has also reminded us of the value of collaboration and unity of purpose. So I'm truly delighted to join today's important summit, which champions solidarity and which will explore the different paths to stronger, fairer and more prosperous societies for us all. This unprecedented pandemic has exacerbated many of the structural weaknesses in our healthcare systems. In doing so, it has pointed out what we need to improve and how. For example, during the first wave, precautionary measures in some member states led to export restrictions, inflated demand projections, and unnecessary stockpiling of medicines. Equally so, we had to face medicine export bans from third countries. Solidarity, tireless efforts and focused cooperation were and still are of utmost importance to combat this virus, as it became obvious from the very start that we could never defeat it by working alone. From day one of this pandemic, the Commission has called for coordination and unity of purpose being well aware that it is the most effective path forward. I am very pleased Cyprus has been fully engaged in all of the EU's coordination and cooperation mechanisms from the outset. I know that my Cypriot compatriots have made a lot of sacrifices all this time. That is why it is so important to continue our social distancing measures and personal hygiene in order not to jeopardize all those hard efforts until a safe vaccine is developed. Shortages of medicines and medical equipment is an area where collaboration is especially important. And the Commission has taken steps to enhance this cooperation. The EU Executive Steering Group on Shortages of Medicines has been collecting data and sharing experiences and insight between member states. In parallel, the European Medicines Agency has established an important communication channel with the pharmaceutical industry, improving visibility and early identification of vulnerabilities in the medicine supply chain. We launched seven joint procurement calls for essential medicines and equipment, like ventilators, ICU medicines, and rapid antigen tests. And the Commission has also worked to develop more evidence-based and common approaches to testing, quarantine, and travel restrictions. But this is not just a health crisis. COVID-19 having, is having a far-reaching impact across our societies as a whole. In response, the Commission is mobilizing all the means at its disposal to support member states in tackling the pandemic in all its forms. To aid member states protect their citizens and mitigate the severe socioeconomic impacts, the EU adopted a new instrument for temporary support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency. Sure. Out of a total envelope of 100 billion euro, 87.9 billion euro have already been allocated and financial assistance is currently being dispersed. Under Sure, Cyprus will receive low interest rate loans amounting to 479 million. This will help Cyprus to support employees and the self-employed and will guarantee income support to those that have to abstain from work for health reasons due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am indeed very pleased to note that Cyprus already received last week 250 million euros. Ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has pushed us to improve our preparedness and response capacities. 
EU citizens rightfully expect to be protected, and we are determined to do so. The European Health Union package announced on 11th November will help us to live up to those expectations. It is a major step towards a more secure, a better prepared and a more resilient EU. This package reinforces the most important roles of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and the European Medicines Agency. And it will create a dedicated European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority to strengthen our ability to deal with new and emerging cross-border health threats. These measures will be complemented by the Pharmaceutical Strategy for Europe, which will be announced and will address longer-term structural challenges. But Member States have a major role to play in this effort too. The European Semester's country-specific recommendations, which we issued in May, will help to guide this work. And, for the first time, all Member States received recommendations concerning their health systems. In the case of Cyprus, the Commission called for strengthening the resilience and capacity of the health system, including by improving health professionals' working conditions. With instruments available in the next multi-annual financial framework, including the substantial new standalone EU for Health programme, the Commission is determined to support Cyprus's efforts to strengthen its health system and promote the health of all its citizens. Vaccination offers the surest exit from the pandemic, but it needs to be underpinned by effective partnerships. The EU strategy for COVID-19 vaccines recognizes the need for safe, effective vaccines, and it is also a strong example of the power of solidarity. The strategy has helped us to accelerate the development, manufacturing, and deployment of vaccines against COVID-19. It will ensure fair and equitable access for all across the EU and globally. We have signed contracts with five companies and are in discussion with others. And these agreements seek to ensure that all member states get access to high quality vaccines at the best possible terms and conditions. Speed is important, and we cannot leave anyone behind in this effort. But, at the same time, we will not compromise on safety. Flexibility in the EU's regulatory framework allows the development, authorization and availability of vaccines to be accelerated, while maintaining very strict standards for quality, safety and efficacy. And the European Medicines Agency has introduced rapid review procedures to quickly deliver the assessments of vaccine applications. Vaccination is not the magic wand that will make COVID-19 disappear, but it is a vital part of our exit strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, we are responding to an unprecedented crisis and we are trying to improve our long-term preparedness at the same time. It is like building a ship while sailing in it, in the middle of a storm. But we are not sailing blind. We are guarded by science and buoyed by solidarity, collaboration and unity of purpose. We are guarded by determination to shield our citizens on possible future crises in the area of public health. This is the EU at its best times, of crisis, of pooling resources, of sharing expertise and cooperating in an unprecedented way to bring tangible benefits to the everyday lives of its citizens. Because every life matters. Because everyone deserves a safe and prosperous future. Now I wish you an insightful, forward-looking discussion. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you to the thank you to the commissioner. Um, I hope all of the audience could hear most of that. I think we have some technical problems, which has meant that some people have not heard everything. But we now move on to our our panel. I did not hear everything myself. But we now move on to our panel. 
starting with Eurythios Papadopoulos, head of the European Commission representation in Cyprus, perhaps you could say a little, um, particularly for those who did not hear all of all of what the Commissioner said, Eurythios, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you, John, thank you. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, dear friends, I will make four points. Uh, the first is um, on Eurobarometer on health that we published in July and the attitudes towards national and EU response to COVID-19, the first wave though. 87% of Cypriots are satisfied with national response and 59% are satisfied with EU response. The most important I think is that two out of three Europeans would like EU to have more powers in health matters and we'll come back to this again. Now, concerning the, what the Commissioner has said, um, just to recapitulate the, the points uh, uh, the Commissioner uh, made earlier, she underlined the coordination and collaboration efforts of the Commission. We launched seven joint procurement calls for medicines and medical equipment. We have signed five contracts for vaccines so far, and uh, we are negotiating with other companies. She referred also to the financial assistance and she gave the example of the SURE program with 479 million euro of loans uh, allocated to Cyprus. She referred to the building of the European Health Union, which means that in, in the future we'll be better protected uh, in such a case like the pandemic. She referred also to the EU for Health program uh, which, by the way, in the new period, 2021-27, will be 12 times higher compared to this period's budget, up to 5.1 billion. She referred also to the strengthening of uh, the European Centre for uh, Disease and Prevention, Control of Disease and Prevention. Uh, it's, uh, and she referred also to uh, the new pharmaceutical strategy that uh, will be revealed very soon. These were the main points made by the Commissioner. My third point concerns uh, disinformation. The EU is fighting disinformation, separating fact from fiction, identifying conspiracy theories, combating online scams. This is an essential point for the Commission as citizens can be severely misled with tragic, in some cases, consequences. And the fourth point I would like to raise with you is the financial support for Cyprus in 2018 prices. The multi-annual budget 2021-27 allocates around 1.5 billion approximately for Cyprus. And the new tool, the new recovery tool after the pandemic in order to address the problems that the pandemic has created, called Next Generation EU, allocates almost 1.2 billion for Cyprus. This in total is more than 2.6 billion. On top of this, we have other programs like the SURE the Commissioner referred to with 479 million for Cyprus and loans up to 1.5 billion from Next Generation EU. And it is, it is uh, quite important that I recall that the Commission activated the general escape clause for the first time ever. What does it mean? This means fiscal relaxation for member states uh, due to the uh, exceptional circumstances. And finally, concerning state aid, the Commission allowed member states to help their companies without considering it as a state aid because exactly of the exceptional circumstances we have lived in 2020. So uh, in a nutshell, these are the points I would like to raise. And of course, I am uh, at your disposal in order to uh, develop further. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that contribution, uh, Mr. Papadopoulos. Um, next, we have uh, Theodoros uh, Trifon. Um, from the Pan-Hellenic Union of Pharmaceutical Industries and a member of the board of the Hellenic Federation of Enterprises. You have four to five minutes. Uh, thank you all for the invitation. I hope all goes well. I will very briefly mention uh, some issues that have been raised during this uh, COVID unique uh, pandemic crisis regarding uh, 
uh, issues related to pharmaceutical uh, production, access of, Euro of European patients to, to medicine, and of course solidarity that has to be uh, shown. Uh, the, the role of the, the European uh, pharma industry, I think, is, is, is very specific and significant, both for access of patients to affordable medicines or to, or to medicines, and also the, it is a sector that invests very heavily in R&D and, and uh, production. Medicines for Europe is an association that uh, uh, has 400 European manufacturers, more than 190,000 people employed, and uh, we, we supply over 65% of all medicines in Europe. Uh, medicines for Europe rep represent the generic uh, industry, the biosimilar industries. Now, uh, many issues have been raised during the last months. We saw that there was a, a definitely increase both for specialty medicines, especially for the uh, ICU, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, certain trials for medicines that are related to the COVID. But also we saw in March, specifically in March, uh, a very big increase in chronic disease patients, which meant there was a large, of, uh, large stocking. And during, the, during this uh, period, the industry tried to contribute with uh, repurposing medicines for COVID-19 and uh, uh, by participating in certain clinical trials. Now, this crisis definitely has uh, significant effects uh, regarding uh, uh, procurement and access uh, for medicines or medical supplies. Many European governments have to reflect again over health priorities, health policy priorities. It is something that we will see, I think, new five-year plans. We have to see how new standards will be set so as to ensure health systems effectiveness. And of course, uh, what has been demonstrated was uh, the overgrowing dependency on medical supplies and medicinal products from low-cost countries outside of the EU. This is, a, of course, a trend that cannot be changed from one day to another, but uh, I think one of the priorities is how to be able to, uh, I think, uh, attend this issue. So we saw that many European countries with well-organized health systems uh, had some issues and shortcomings. Now, the solidarity demonstrated by the European industry was in all these above-mentioned uh, sectors, both for the hospital ICU medicines, coordination of 40 manufacturers for EU demand and supply, chronic medicines, we increased our supply uh, during March and April just to make sure that uh, all patients will be covered, and of course, COVID therapies emergency use medicine, some specific proto uh, protocols and the clinical trials for re repurposing, repositioning, and also approved medicines that had to be uh, tested against the COVID. Very, very briefly, the Greek pharma industry, uh, uh, I think, is, uh, is a very good uh, example, paradigm of the response. We covered during the, the crisis 3 million patients by locally produced products. We continued exports to EU countries, and we contributed for use of green lanes to be open so that uh, borders would not be affected. And of course, it was our, our, our first priority to establish industry-wide workplace rules to ma maintain medicine manufacturing and, of, and definitely keep our workforce uh, uh, safe. So there are some issues that will uh, be addressed and tomorrow the European Commission publishes a new pharmaceutical strategy for Europe that will be the basis for policy in the area in the coming years. And as I said, we have to, to address issues, structural issues, affordability and strategic autonomy of our union on uh, medicines. Pharmaceutical strategy and manufacturing competitiveness in order to build robust European manufacturing industry, it is necessary, among others, to invest in future healthcare needs, a new medicine trade agenda, and uh, the regulatory pathway and oversight for uh, uh, existing and uh, new medicines. So definitely EU funds now and the next generation funds have to be used, among others, to support digitalization, green man manufacturing, Definitely to stimulate investment in R&D in order to start becoming more competitive 
towards uh, the other continents and companies in other continents and institutions in other continents. And of course, old products with reformulation repurposing have some of them have to come back to Europe to lessen the dependency on third uh, world countries or countries outside EU. We have to remove import and export restrictions with trade partners, increase regulatory cooperation in the generic space, and try and build resilience and dependency on local regional European production. And of course, IP regime and also the, the ease with which the API manufacturers introduce variations in order to have alternative suppliers, especially during crisis periods, uh, is something that is very uh, important. So, all in all, I think now that we will have a new agenda for the pharma industry and the medical supplies industry that uh, uh, will we'll try and uh, make sure that European patients will have better access to medicine uh, in, in crisis like that. Thank you for my initial uh, uh, speech. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Trifon. Uh, very interesting. And now, for four to five minutes, we have Christophorus Hadji Kiprianu, um, Chief Executive and President of the Council of the European University Cyprus. You have the floor. Thank you, John. Uh, it is, first of all, a great honor and pleasure to participate in this conference in order to share with you some views related to the higher education sector and how the universities are contributing into this pandemic. Uh, I will start by saying that the outbreak of this COVID-19 pandemic has put the world of higher education in Europe and globally under great pressure. This crisis uh, actually has shaken the status quo of higher education institutions. It has forced them to change their modus operandi and dramatically affected academic communities. At the same time, this situation has also brought to light the rigidity of our current higher education system, I mean the, the education system all over Europe, a rigidity we are now confronted with and which will inevitably have to change as a consequence, not only of this disruption, but probably of future disruptions. Just to give an example, there was a huge resistance uh, among stakeholders, students, faculty, the accrediting bodies, to accept online education, just to mention one example. Like many organizations, uh, universities had to quickly adapt their educational offer into an online format. For some institutions, using digital technology was already in their DNA. And I can say that the institutions in Cyprus, the higher institutions in Cyprus, they have uh, outperformed their counterparts in most of the European countries. Uh, for others, it was a rather unexplored territory, this uh, digital technology exercise. For all of them though, it quickly became the daily way of running business. Despite this transfer to online teaching so far, universities have been operating what we call in an emergency remote format to minimize disruptions rather than fully embracing online education. It is therefore important to explore how online education and blended learning will develop in the years ahead to ensure that high quality is maintained. Of course, there are many challenges in front of us, like investments in new technology, like the engagement of the students, like the training of the faculty, like regulatory issues such as the GDPR. In addition, this pandemic has brought scientific research into the spotlight. Scientists are in the center of attention from society and the government. Experts working with this pandemic related issues have been regularly consulted ahead of important political decisions to tackle the spread of the pandemic and to manage its impact on society. This disruption and potentially future ones are definitely changing the landscape of higher education in Europe. And at the same time, this disruption has highlighted the important role of universities 
within the society. They are participants. At a time when Cyprus is looking for new economic models, not just because of the pandemic, but also because some of the old models proved very unsustainable. It is important to recall that the education sector in Cyprus represents 6% of the GDP. We must therefore appreciate the significance of the sector in shaping any new effort to transform the economy of our country. This is actually the time for our society to put its faith back into the concept of knowledge, into education and science, into research and innovation. The transformation of the economy due to the overall effects of COVID-19, as well as drastic geopolitical changes, rapid technological advancements, and market dynamics impose the need to review our economic model and future plans. Our universities should be at the forefront of the sectors that Cyprus can invest in, just to mention a few of them. Communication technologies, medicine and medical tourism, shipping, cybersecurity, and alternative financing methodologies. I have to mention that distinguished academicians, experts, and researchers are already contributing in the advancement of these fields in our country. Dear participants, I have to conclude that I have to conclude by repeating once again that the knowledge economy should be the driving force for the long term. Education is the backbone of this effort. Only by believing and investing in the knowledge economy, we can expect real transformation of our industries, of our economy, and we can expect a sustainable growth. I take this opportunity to thank the organizers for this event under these difficult circumstances, but at the same time, to thank all the participants for their valuable contribution. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Abji Kiprianu. Um, and now we turn to our commentator for this panel, Andreas Paraskos, the executive editor from Katamarini newspaper. Um, you might ask some questions after what you've heard. Mr. Paraskos, please, please take the floor. You're on mute. Okay. okay. Um... Good afternoon. I would like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to see some of, of our uh, friends uh, at the panel. I greet Mr. Trifon, whom I don't know. Uh, the rest, Haji Kiprianu and Papadopoulos, I very well know. So um, I will touch upon uh, basic uh, things that uh, uh, Cypriots uh, take into consideration. Uh, most of the time, we hear people saying that, uh, speaking about EU, since uh, we are speaking about EU, <clears throat> and they cannot understand the way um, uh, EU responds towards the provocations of uh, Turkey. This is one thing. The other thing that came now to um, restore I would say the the mistrust and make it trust is the way um, um, EU responded uh, on the tragic issue of pandemic, and I think that uh, Commissioner Stella Kiriakidis, which is our commissioner, as we say in Cyprus, uh, is performing actually very well. Um, it's responding in a very serious way. I know her 30 years now. She was always responding on issues of humanitarian um, um, character. And now I think uh, she, is, uh, she is playing uh, the game on her own field because she knows about pandemic. She knows what health is and she knows how um, uh, very uh, delicate is this issue. 
so restoring the mistrust, which uh, politicians, I would say, um, uh, showed and constructed because of the Cyprus uh, issue and because of uh, the interests, economic interests between member states of the EU and Turkey. Uh, pandemic um, as a kind of a, a, a miracle now is uh, making uh, the path of the Cypriots towards EU uh, more uh, convenient, more uh, comfortable, I would say. And um, because uh, always money makes a difference, uh, vaccinating the, the population without asking money from the people, I hope they don't ask now money from the people for their vaccination, and restoring the health problem. It means restoring the, the lack of economic, um, uh, of business, I would say, uh, restoring the market. It means restoring our lives again. So this is what I see as the seed of this um, of this uh, fruit that the uh, EU is uh, offering to the people of Cyprus. I don't know if uh, this is uh, um, um, what you were asking from me, but I think that um, speaking on behalf of uh, the community and not as a journalist, uh, I think it would be more honest, uh, a, a more honest input in this discussion. Well, thank you for that thought, uh, Mr. Paraskos. I wonder if Mr. Trifon, um, coming from Greece, would like to, and knowing knowing the pharmaceutical industry, would like to comment on the position of um, of uh, well, Greece and Cyprus inside the European Union. I mean, I think you your presentation made clear that you think it's been very beneficial and that the European Union has been very helpful during this this crisis. Um, but Mr. Paraskos also mentioned mistrust of Turkey. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts in response to him. And then we'll come to some of the other panels. Mr. Trifon. Yes, well, uh, I, I think th there, there are a number of dimensions. Of, of course, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as we have seen in the last uh, uh, months, uh, there has been, uh, for the first time in many years, I think, an increased solidarity towards uh, Greece and Cyprus uh, for the hostility of uh, uh, of Turkey. We saw it through France mainly, and it's something that uh, there we, we know, of course, the geopolitical and economic environment and uh, uh, the geopolitical uh, presence of, 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 of Turkey and how it has been valued by some of our allies. So one thing is, this is something that needs to be always tested because the, the, the issue with Turkey and the issue with uh, the, the Middle East and the issue Mediterranean is something that we'll have for the many next year. So it's something that we're in the process of seeing that. The other thing is that uh, Greece went uh, uh, under, uh, went through a very difficult financial situation and crisis for the last 10 years. So we went through numerous uh, memorandum of uh, understanding and agreements and uh, that uh, in the end I don't think that uh, they succeeded their goal. So uh, the term of support uh, for Greece to find the, uh, I think a feasible way forward within the, 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 the current uh, worldwide environment uh, and uh, the world operates in terms of prioritization, investments, R&D, of course, the social solidarity structure is something that uh, Again, it was not very successful, and we, we expected more things from our counterparts there. Of course, this is a very long discussion because Greece, uh, Greece uh, had a very big debt. It was created by our governments and ourselves. But, but in the end, the models have, have failed. So now, for us, I think is an opportunity with uh, the next generation fund to really be able to, to see the way forward. And uh, I hope that this fund and the way that the European Union allocates the fund and uh, uh, the time and the criteria are more flexible and uh, can cater to, to the needs of its economy and to the growth model of its economy. 
you have different growth models between different states. So this is something for me that remains to be seen. We are here, we invest in our country, we have a strong uh, industrial base in certain areas, pharma is the one. So we need to see how this uh, will be used. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Papadopoulos, do you want to add something? Uh, I yes. Mean, we, we know we will just be, be talking this afternoon, I think, about the recovery fund, and we know that both Cyprus and Greece will benefit from the recovery fund if it ever gets off the ground. But also, I, I, I am, Mrs. von der Leyen has just announced there will be a, a contract with Modena, the um, yeah. scenes. Yes, yes, exactly. This is the good news uh, that the Commission today decided and our President uh, announced a while ago that uh, we're going for the sixth uh, contract with uh, Moderna for up to 160 million doses, which is uh, good news for uh, mm -hmm. for Europeans. Um, coming back to uh, the, the points made by Andreas, um, from one side, uh, Cypriots are not satisfied uh, of what uh, EU is doing uh, with uh, Turkey and uh, they would like uh, us to have uh, more actions on this. And I must say that in this case, it's not about uh, the EU institutions, it's about uh, the member states. And we have 27 sovereign member states that they have to decide unanimously when they take a decision, for example, uh, uh, concerning Turkey. In any case, in a few days, uh, in the European uh, Council of December, uh, the Council uh, will uh, take a position uh, concerning uh, its future relations uh, with Turkey. So I would say let's be patient another couple of weeks and we will know what the 27 uh, will, uh, will decide vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey and if uh, these decisions uh, satisfy uh, Cypriots. On the other side, he said it is positive that the EU's uh, response satisfy uh, Cypriot uh, citizens. And this is also good news because as he, if you recall in the beginning, eight, nine months ago, a lot of people uh, were accusing uh, EU, what the EU is doing, uh, why there is uh, no uh, appropriate response uh, from the EU. But uh, I must say that first of all, on health matters, it's uh, the, the first uh, word is within member states, it's not uh, the EU. We might have uh, an EU policy in, uh, in the future, and this is what we are trying when we have a common threat like the pandemic. But apart from the very first uh, weeks where every member state was doing what uh, um, it um, considered as uh, the best uh, for its uh, citizens, which means uh, closing frontiers, uh, taking measures that are, were unilateral, etc. Then they all turned uh, to the EU to have help concerning medicines, concerning respiratory uh, units, etc., etc. And at the end, they saw uh, the added value of uh, the EU. This is why they go for the next EU for Health program with 12 times more budget than uh, the current 2014-2020 uh, budget. So uh, EU is there, but if we give EU the power, the competence uh, to, to do its job, then it will uh, do a good job as uh, citizens appreciate. John, can I add something? Yes, please do. Uh, Mr. Haji Kiprianu, uh, he pinpointed out uh, three uh, very crucial sectors, I think, for the economy. Uh, no, no, it's not sectors. Th three very important weapons, I would say, that the industry of, of the universities is using and uh, which are very important for the progress of the country itself education, science, and research. And if now it's, uh, this, uh, this sector is giving 6% on the GDP of Cyprus, if, I'm sorry to say that, they were using the, the, the smartness and uh, on the economy that they used on uh, making the golden passports, and we had the Al Jazeera video, which uh, was uh, a disgrace for Cyprus. Uh, if they were doing what Mr. Haji Kiprianu is suggesting, and what Mr. Haji Kiprianu suggested last year, we were the same panel with the three other guys who were actually in that business, and who, when I pinpoint out that there are black uh, holes, they just... Uh, uh, attacked me, uh, 
uh, this is not a revenge um, speech. Uh, if they if they were doing what Mr. Haji Kiprianu, as a twenty percent of their effort for making the passports, then the six percent of the GDP would be twelve percent, and it would be um, a, a great um, a great uh, asset for the economy of Cyprus and for the people of Cyprus and for the students of Cyprus. So we have to learn from our mistakes and don't look for solutions um, every time that we we go the wrong way. Um, for example, why didn't EU not stop this thing? Okay, they yeah. had to, they had to do it. Yes. But we have to, we have to be here when things are done the proper way to clap our hands, when things are done the wrong way to stand up and talk. And unfortunately, the journalists, I would say, uh, have not um, uh, played the, the whole of the part that they should have done. Well, there you are. So journalists are not always perfect. But Mr. Hadji Capriano, I mean, I think that's just praising your sector as a long-term, a more sensible investment than, than some of the other things that Cyprus has done in the past, including golden passports and depending on Russian in investment. Using your sector is a more, is a better way forward. John, uh, I think it's not a better way going forward, which is uh, the contribution of the sector and we have to build the sector, but we have to emphasize as well. And I think if it's one thing that we have learned out of this pandemic is that the sector can help the other, uh, the government and the other areas to grow in a very sustainable way. Uh, we have to use the scientists and the researchers and the experts in Europe uh, to contribute in developing uh, other industries, other sectors. And I think the example of Cyprus, uh, and we have to credit the government here and the, and the Minister of Health that they are using the experts in managing this pandemic. And probably that is the main reason, is the first time that the politicians are hearing the academicians, are hearing the experts, uh, maybe is that is the reason that still the pandemic issues and problems and challenges in Cyprus, we are in a much better position as compared to other countries. The other thing that I want to add, because Mr. Papadopoulos mentioned a couple of times, and this is the theme of our discussion, the solidarity in Europe. Uh, yes, there is solidarity in Europe now because of the pandemic, because of this crisis, and uh, we have to admit that, but we want to see this solidarity and this unity of actions with a long-term uh, horizon in, in many other fields. And one field is what I suggested before, that we have to bring together uh, the universities, not between countries, but among uh, all the universities in Europe, to create more European networks, more sharing of knowledge, I think more uh, sharing of research and innovation. And I think that technology, artificial intelligence and so on can provide the tools for that sharing. So we have to show solidarity, not only in times of crisis, like the two cases you mentioned now, the pandemic and the crisis with Turkey, but also uh, in, in moving forward. Thank you very much. Mr. Papadopoulos, do you want to comment on that? And, and can I just ask you one more question? We are running out of time, but. But the, the the position of the recovery fund it, it seems to be blocked now by Poland and Hungary. Do you what what's what's going to happen next? Yes, I will come um, uh, to this. Uh, but uh, first, uh, I must say that uh, Mr. Hazi Kipriano is absolutely right. And this is exactly what we are doing. We are bringing European universities in Europe together. We are sharing knowledge. And you know that during the pandemic, we were solely uh, based on science. It's not always the case. It's not always obvious. It's not always, uh, I mean, on the two parts of the Atlantic that we were sharing uh, this uh, science-based uh, approach but we were doing uh, so uh, and uh, we fully share your points of view. You're absolutely right. 
Now, concerning uh, the recovery fund, concerning the budget, uh, the multi-annual uh, budget, uh, we, from the beginning, uh, we had uh, this uh, condition that uh, the budget is linked uh, to uh, the rule of law, uh, and this is uh, endorsed uh, by the European Parliament. Now, we have uh, two member states, plus um, a third one supporting the two other member states, uh, and uh, they are blocking uh, for the moment. Obviously, we will uh, find a solution. It is always uh, the case. Uh, leaders always uh, find a solution to a problem. But uh, for us, uh, we must find this solution as soon as possible because the more uh, we delay, uh, the, 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 it, there will be a delay in the funds, there will be a delay in the programs, and we must start as soon as possible, which means 1st of January 2021. This is uh, quite crucial to have uh, an agreement as soon as uh, possible, and we hope that uh, the majority of the leaders who support uh, this, uh, this package, uh, actually even Hungary and Poland support the package. It's not about the figures, it's not about uh, the, the budget, it's about uh, the conditionality with the rule of law. We hope that we will find um, a formula and we, they will be convinced in order that we proceed uh, with uh, this uh, conditionality in the future. Thank you very much. Um, it's rather like the Brexit trade talks. We hope that they also are ready for the 1st of January, um, particularly for the UK. Um, and I think we should finish there. But let me just ask Mr. Trifon one more question, very, very briefly. Do, do you worry about the spread of anti-vax movements, people who are anti-vaccination? Is that is that a problem in your country or, or one that you come across as in your pharmaceutical activities, that people are anti-vaccination? Well, the more data that we have every day from uh, the vaccines and, and the clinical trials uh, that uh, have been performed, I think uh, uh, the less resistance we will have. And... Uh, uh, I believe that within the next month, we will analyze all the data that we have from the clinical trials. Of course, the endorsements of these very big companies is very crucial. So uh, I believe that the vast majority of people in my country will proceed with vaccination. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, all right. Well, I think we've come to, to 10 plus one, which is maximum of our time. Um, we are going to have a 10 minute break. I would just like to say that I would encourage the audience who is watching us, some on YouTube, some, in, some on the web, to send in questions for future panels, um, which the organizers can then forward to me. Um, and we hope to have a little bit more interaction for the future. But meanwhile, thank you very much to all, all four of you, to the three panelists and to Mr. Parascos for his commentary. I find that very interesting. Um, we have a 10 minute break. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From our platforms, to our labs, offices, and facilities, 
and in communities around the world. We're continuously innovating to find better, cleaner, more efficient ways to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. Energy is essential to providing cleaner air and water, access to education and health care. Reliable, affordable energy improves lives. Exxon Mobil. European University Cyprus is a leading international university which stands apart with its high academic values, its modern campus and its commitment to the wider community. With an important regional presence, European University Cyprus has distinguished itself in teaching excellence, academic and scientific research with an impressive rate of growth. QS Top Universities, the most authoritative international rating organization, ranked European University Cyprus among the top universities in the world, granting it a five-star rating in the fields of teaching, facilities, internationalization, employability, inclusiveness, and social responsibility. In 2020, the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings placed European University Cyprus among the top 101 universities worldwide for innovation, industry and infrastructure. Its auditoriums have hosted globally acclaimed personalities. Its lecture halls have been graced with internationally acknowledged academics. It is here at European University Cyprus that Microsoft established the Microsoft Innovation Center, one of only 110 operating globally, connecting knowledge and research with entrepreneurship and innovation. Take one step forward onto the unfolding path of your future. European University Cyprus will give you the knowledge and the power to take that journey. For 140 years, we've been enabling human progress, knowing that everything we do everywhere in the world is in service of people. Generations of our problem solvers all around the globe working brilliantly, collaboratively and inexhaustibly to provide more reliable, more affordable and ever cleaner energy.
In a world that never sleeps, your money should work for you 24-7. That is why you need a truly global account with a professional team to support you. At Ecom Banks, we gathered a team of the best global tech gurus, experienced bankers and finance specialists to create the ultimate e-accounts platform. The result is astonishing. Welcome to the era of Ecom Banks, a platform to rule them all. With global reach, intuitive user-friendly interface, and secure transactions, EconBanks very simply is the ultimate international e-money and e-accounts platform. EconBanks can process more than 1,000 transactions per second, hold millions of accounts and data, while communicating with a complex network of more than 20 European and international banks. EconBanks platform will rock your world. With intuitive and modern user interface, solid security features, communicating through a multi-tier network of servers, exchanging and verifying data in split seconds using biometric user verification methods. Did we mention it was created by bankers? Therefore, there is a love for regulation, making EconBanks a European authorized and licensed electronic money institution and a member of SWIFT and SEPA payments, issuing unique IBANs, empowering you to convert and transact with immediate liquid access to 100% of your funds. We make the world a smaller place with close to zero time wasting and moving your funds from east to west and south to north. While others think in a box and still use traditional means, you can be the one who breaks free. The one who sees and uses the future. One account, everything. EconBanks will allow you to interact through multiple bank accounts globally with our PSD2 API integrations using your own IBAN and our network of correspondent banking. That's how you keep your money fit and global. Will you be one of the thousands of transactions per second on our futuristic platform? Uh, welcome back to the 16th um, Virtual Cyprus Summit of The Economist. Um, we've heard from the President of Cyprus and we've had some discussion about the pandemic and its effects. And now we're moving on to foreign policy and energy diplomacy. Um, uh, we're going to start with Nicholas Burns, former US Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. And then we hear from the foreign ministers of Cyprus and of Greece. Um, so it's a very propitious time to discuss U.S. foreign policy, uh, Mr. Burns. I think um, I think the new, the next U.S. president is just just in the process of appointing some of his first appointees to the State Department, perhaps including um, Mr. Blinken as Secretary of State. So um, please, you have six to seven minutes to talk a little about U.S. foreign policy, with particular reference to the Eastern Mediterranean. And nice to have you um, on our panel. Well, John, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm looking forward very much to seeing uh, two people I respect, the Foreign Minister of Greece, Minister Zandias, the Foreign Minister of Cyprus, Mr. Chrysodolidis, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you. I'm going to be very brief because I really want to hear from them. They're the people in the public arena right now contending with uh, very difficult issues in the Eastern Mediterranean, but I'll just say, John, that it's an exciting time here in the United States. I um, supported uh, former Vice President uh, Joe Biden, now President-elect Joe Biden during the recent campaign, was an advisor on his campaign. And I think we're beginning to see his new administration take shape. He's gonna be officially announcing um, later in just a couple of hours, uh, his new Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, uh, his new National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, his new uh, Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, and uh, his new uh, Special Envoy for Climate Change, former Secretary of State John Kerry. This is a powerful team. It's a team of serious people. They're very experienced. They have a sophisticated view of the world. They understand that the United States needs to return to the world and re-engage with the world, both with Greece, with Cyprus, as well as the European Union and NATO uh, in Europe. 
Uh, and I think we're beginning to see the Donald Trump administration fade into the rear view mirror. Uh, President Trump's uh, attempts to contest the election have been widely dismissed by the courts. There is no question uh, that Joe Biden will be president, Kamala Harris vice president at noon on January 20th. So we're finally free from what I believe to have been the weakest American presidency and the most destructive, that of Donald Trump over the last four years. So what, was the, what will the future hold? I think the future is very clear for President-elect Joe Biden. Uh, he wants the United States to return to the Paris climate change talks. That's the appointment of, of John Kerry. He wants the United States to return to full membership in the World Health Organization and to take our, uh, our place along with countries like Greece and Cyprus and others to help fight the pandemic globally. Um, we in the United States prioritize our alliances. That means uh, we very much value NATO. President-elect Biden has a long track record of support for NATO, uh, and that will continue, as well as support for the European Union and our strategic partnership with the European Union. It also means, of course, that uh, the United States is going to be active in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think the most challenging issue we're going to face, apart from climate change in the next decade, will be our very complicated relationship with China. Uh, we are competing with China uh, for uh, military primacy in the Indo-Pacific. We're competing with China uh, on trade issues, on digital age uh, uh, military and civilian technologies, and we're competing on values. But we also need to work with China, and that's where the pandemic comes in. We ought to be working with China, and that's where climate change comes in. We ought to be working with China because we're the two world's largest carbon emitters. I will say this, uh, I'm very hopeful that you're gonna see a very active American policy uh, in Southeastern Europe. Uh, I wanna credit my good friend, Ambassador Jeff Pyatt, with having been an outstanding American ambassador to Greece. And my, my sense is that US-Greece relations, when Minister Dundas will speak about this, are very, very strong. Uh, that's a credit to the prime minister uh, someone I've known for 20 years and have deep, deep respect for, Prime Minister Mitsotakis. He's a true friend of the United States. I credit Minister Dandias um, and, um, and, and his counterparts for the, the rise of Greece, the recovery of the Greek economy, the extraordinary recovery we're seeing in Greek society. I know it's a tough time with the pandemic, of course, in Greece and Cyprus, but I'm just so pleased to see the United States relationship with Greece in such strong shape and I think I want to credit the minister and, and my friend Jeff Pyatt for that. I think as well on Cyprus, the United States has a very close relationship with Cyprus. And with Greece and Cyprus, we've got to be supportive, in my view, the United States, of the right of Greece and Cyprus uh, to, um, to drill uh, for natural gas in the eastern Mediterranean without interference by Turkey. Uh, Turkey has been uh, very aggressive. Uh, in contesting, and the two ministers can talk about this with far greater authority than me, but very aggressive in contesting both Greece, Cyprus, as well as Israel. Uh, Turkey has made claims that cannot be substantiated uh, legally uh, about, about the Greek-Turkish border. I think it's very important that NATO and the European Union and the United States make it clear uh, to the government in Turkey that they have to abide by international law. And so I think this trend of the United States growing closer to Greece and to Cyprus, I hope very much will continue. I think it's very important for peace and stability and the rule of law in the Eastern Mediterranean. So John, I didn't want to speak longer than this. I, I'm looking forward to a very good conversation. I'm looking forward to hearing from the two ministers and of course, responding to comments from your very good audience. And thank you very much to the Economist Conference. It's always a pleasure to be with you and to be with so many friends uh, from Greece in the process. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was a very helpful introduction and um, a, a perhaps an augur of some better times to come in the relationship between oh. US and, 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 uh, and, and Europe. Um, uh, Minister Christodoulides, I think the floor is for you now to have five to six minutes to talk particularly about energy, but any other thoughts you have on, on, on the region and peace and mutual understanding? Dear yeah, friends, uh, this year the, the economy is demonstrating in practice its adaptability and versatility. In the middle of the pandemic, it is proceeding uh, on, uh, on faith with the organization of the, of the Cyprus Summit 
this time bring us together virtually. And uh, perhaps never uh, before has the economy Cyprus summit been more relevant. As the world is eagerly looking for a way out of a health crisis that has also bred an economic crisis, as governments are put uh, under immense strain to respond and adapt to, in order to effectively manage a multifaceted challenge, uh, coming together to discuss and exchange ideas is uh, invaluable. Uh, you chose uh, two Nikos for this panel, actually three with Nicholas Burns. Uh, and I don't know if you, if you meant to have an optimist and a pessimist answering the, the question, but I will take advantage of making my intervention first and say that I will be an optimist in answering the question at hand, which is uh, energy diplomacy in turbulent times. Is there hope for peace and mutual uh, uh, understanding? Yes, I strongly believe that uh, there is hope for peace and mutual understanding in the Eastern Mediterranean. My optimism, my, my at first sight uh, sound naive, but uh, I assure you it is uh, substantiated. It might not be the obvious answer in the middle of, the, of turmoil in this fascinating region, but if one looks closely beyond the narrative of, of turmoil that makes the, the headlines to a parallel narrative that is being written in the region by the region, uh, I believe the case for hope can convincingly uh, be made. The Eastern Mediterranean and the greater uh, Middle East is, fi is fascinating for its diversity and its complexity. It is a region of increasing strategic importance, both for the challenges, but also for the promises uh, it holds. To start with, uh, the region is witnessing remarkable demographic and social uh, change. The shift in global economic uh, power that we have been witnessing has placed the Middle East firmly in the middle of the world's faster growing markets and at the heart of fast growing trade flows. It is a young region with over 40% of its population under the age of 25, according to the United Nations uh, data. The population of the Gulf state is doubling over the past 20 years, and there are, uh, there are over 3.5 trillion euro worth of projects planned or under, this, under construction in the Middle East and, and uh, in the Middle East region. Energy is a key area that points to the potential of the region and how it can contribute to building a more stable, prosperous future for the region, but also how it can be instrumental for greater energy security in, in Europe. When discussing the energy promises of, of this region, it is uh, worth referring to assessments, such as one by the United States Geological Survey, that the total quantities of natural gas in the Eastern Mediterranean are estimated close to 10,000 billion cubic meters. The presence of energy giants in the region, such as ExxonMobil, Leni, Total, Shell, Noble, is proof of the, of the energy potential of the region. Our viewpoint is that hydrocarbons can become the new coal and steel in a new regional context, a tool of cooperation and synergies that will create an economy of scale, an inviting environment for companies and investors, a tool that would meet the energy security needs of the region and that of the uh, European Union, and gradually uh, contribute to greater stability in relations among countries in the, in the region. An economic project, but also a political project with a spillover effect that could be catalytic in resolving long-standing problems. Cyprus, as you probably know, together with Greece and other countries of the region, such as Egypt, Israel, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, the United Arab Emirates, have sown the seeds for such a development through the innovative regional cooperation mechanism established in, in recent years. These were in fact triggered by the field of energy, which also led to a web of delimitation agreements full in line with international law, creating the necessary legal certainty for exploitation, but have since expanded into an array of other areas such as security, economic cooperation, health, environment, uh, education, and innovation. It is important to stress that these, uh, these fora have a positive agenda. They are inclusive, open to all countries in the region that respect international law, good neighborly relations, the sovereignty and sovereign rights of all their neighbors. 
These mechanisms are constantly uh, evolving, expanding both thematically and in terms of format and participation. For example, we, have, we had the meeting in Cairo at ministerial level between Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, France and Italy. We also had in the middle of the pandemic a virtual ministerial conference between Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, UAE and France on issues of security. And now preparations are underway for the organization in the coming weeks of more multilateral meetings with countries of, of the region participating for the first time. So at a time when uh, due to the pandemic states are led to insularities, shining away from cooperation and uh, multilater multilateralism, the countries in the, in the region have opted for a different path, enhancing their mini multilateral, as I call it, cooperation, including to, to, to address the, the pandemic. There are several concrete examples that synergies are growing, and if you allow me to mention just a few. Uh, on September 22 of this year, the statue of the Energy Forum established in Cairo with the participation of Egypt, Cyprus, Greece, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Italy was signed. Also on the energy front, uh, at the beginning of the year, we had the interstate agreement, the signing of the interstate agreement on Eastmet pipeline uh, between Greece, Cyprus, and Israel. Discussions between Lebanon and Israel on the delimitation of their maritime boundaries have restarted. Moreover, uh, the institutionalization of this uh, regional cooperation mechanism uh, was decided with the establishment of a permanent secretariat in Cyprus, which is expected to start uh, operate on January 1st, 2021. More recently, the, the government of the Republic of Cyprus and the United States sign an agreement for the establishment of, uh, in Cyprus of a regional training center for security on land, open seas, and ports. And last but not least, we have had the agreements for normalization of relations between Israel, UAE, and Bahrain. It is my conviction that uh, cooperation developed in the region, which is based, as I told you, on a strictly positive agenda, has created a dynamic that could lead to the creation of a a regional organization or a regional forum for security and cooperation, of course, when the political conditions permit. In fact, uh, the region, the greater Middle East, is the, one of the few regions where such an organization does not exist. The long term, this, this is a long term uh, goal of establishing such a body, will not only fill a vacuum that we are seeing in the region, but will also send a clear signal in favor of multilateralism at a time when its added value is under attack. Last but not least, it will send a clear signal to countries in the region that are acting as spoilers to stability and cooperation that the only viable, beneficial path is not that of gunboat diplomacy, uh, but of course that of respect of, of international law and good neighborly uh, relations. It is also my conviction that the tangible value of the cooperation proliferating in the region could have, as I mentioned before, a beneficial ripple effect in resolving problems such as the Cyprus, uh, Cyprus problem. Certainly, Mr. Erdogan has not given uh, any signs that he makes decisions based on norms of the rules-based international uh, order, quite the contrary. Yet, I believe that a rational thinking Turkey uh, will come to understand that the path that it serves, its long-term uh, interest is not the one of confrontation, defiance of international law, interference and destabilization. The path actually that is following now in the Eastern Mediterranean, Greece, Cyprus, Libya, Syria, Iraq, the list is, is very long. Rather, it, it, it uh, should join other countries in the region in cooperating to materialize a vision of peace, and prosperity. In concluding, I wish to, to note that uh, the cooperation we have been uh, witnessing in the, in the region and ultimately the creation of a regional uh, platform, a regional organization, not only serve the interests of countries involved and the region, of course, as a whole, they also constitute, I believe, a positive development for other international actors such as the European Union and, of course, the, the United States. Uh, energy diplomacy, which is part of a vision that the overwhelming majority of the countries in the region share, has opened new avenues uh, for cooperation and understanding, 
we call on all countries and that have yet to realize this, um, the only viable avenue uh, is to abandon policies of the past era and join us in this, uh, in this vision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the optimism. I'm sorry my name is not Nicolas or Nicholas, unlike everybody else on this panel. But now we hear from another Nicolas, Nicolas Denlias, the Foreign Minister of Greece. Five or six minutes. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to keep the time. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to participate in the 16th Cyprus Summit organized by The Economist. Albeit held virtually, it remains a welcome opportunity to have an exchange with such prestigious interlocutors on important issues of mutual interest. I have to say I'm very happy to see again, uh, especially Ambassador Burns, as Nikos Christodoulidis I'm seeing quite often. But it's seeing Ambassador Burns, who is very well remembered in Greece, is indeed a more unique opportunity. Uh, and I will have to t testify and verify exactly what he said, by the way, that the Greek-American relations are now at an all-time high. And Ambassador Payet has a lot, contributed a lot towards that goal. But also Nicholas Burns has contributed towards that goal in the past during his presence in Athens. So, Ambassador, thank you very much. Well, there are many issues of mutual interest. Uh, energy is one. Now, how the search for and exploitation of new energy resources in the Eastern Mediterranean are affected by and at the same time affecting the geopolitical state of play? And whether the countries and peoples of the region can hope for arrangements that will be beneficial to all. In this regard, I believe that we should be approaching the energy question in our wider region and, quite frankly, everywhere in connection to regional stability and to regional development. Two sets of notions, energy on one hand, regional stability and development on the other, that are perfectly interwined in a cause and effect circular movement. Because in order to be able to exploit energy resources, you need to have stability. And once you do, you can have more development. To most countries of the region, this is evident. Greece is one of those countries. Cyprus is another one. And I should say that in particular, Greece and Cyprus similar approach is not limited to energy issues. Our orientation towards peace, security, stability and development for all is a foreign policy choice of both countries. Our commitment to regional stability and development has, after all, been at the very core of a significant number of trilateral and multilateral schemes of cooperation which we have established in our region. Schemes whereby we have been promoting multi-secular synergies, thus deepening partnerships with Egypt, with the United Arab Emirates, with Israel, with many others. These partnerships are open to all, as long as they respect international law and the principles of the United Nations Charter. But of course, it is not just Greece and Cyprus. There are others who feel the same and act the same. There is Egypt, for instance, that proposed turning the East Medgas Forum, an Egyptian initiative, into a regional organization. The newly founded forum has already attracted the positive attention of major regional and international actors in the field, including the United States. And of course, there is tangible proof of this stance on the bilateral level, such as the agreements on the delimitation of exclusive economic zones between Greece and Italy and between Greece and Egypt, or the agreement between, in principle between Greece and Albania to refer our differences in the International Court in The Hague. Also, similar agreements have been signed by Cyprus, with Egypt, with Lebanon, with Israel. These are perfect examples of what it means to be committed to peacefully negotiating in good faith, in accordance with international law, and towards reaching compromises for exploiting energy resources. The East Med Pipeline project is another example of what would be, once concluded, a major large-scale development in the field of energy in our region. Greece, Cyprus, and Israel in this case have already signed the relevant accord, and hopefully Italy will join us. We 
believed sooner rather than later. But regrettably, against those who look at energy as an important opportunity for regional stability and development, stand those who do not. Those who look at the energy resources or the possibility of energy resources as an opportunity to promote aspirations for dominance in the region in the context of their neo-Ottoman agenda. These are unfortunately the policies and means used today by our neighbor Turkey. Through its direct involvement in all crises in the region, in Syria, in Libya, its interferences in the domestic affairs of countries of the region, as Iraq, and its ill-based effort to antagonize others, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates. Its aggressive and divisive rhetoric, as well as its suspicious affiliation, for example, with Hamas or with the Muslim Brotherhood. Its instrumentalization of migration and religion, its violation of Greece and Cyprus sovereignty and sovereign rights. Its continued provocation in contempt of the international law and the United Nations Security Council resolutions, as was the recent so-called picnic in the city the Turkish invasion and occupation since 1974 turned to a ghost. Turkey is responsible for further endangering stability, even threatening peace in an already volatile area. But this event is focusing on Cyprus. And further to what Nikos Christodoulidis had said, it is important to stress that Ankara has approached energy finding of Cyprus as an opportunity not to discuss or negotiate a peaceful sentiment of a Cyprus question, but as an opportunity to escalate tensions, to violate Cyprus sovereignty and sovereign rights. An opportunity to blackmail the government of Cyprus into illegal in terms of international law options. Of course, Turkey's sorry attempt of an excuse as regards Cyprus is that it acts with the rights of the Turkish Cypriots at heart when in fact it is exactly the opposite. The Turkish Cypriots are also victims of Turkey's agenda. And when one compartmentalizes Turkey's policies against Cyprus in the field of energy, one may miss the bigger picture. Turkey does not even recognize the Republic of Cyprus, a United Nations member, a member state of the European Union, an organization that Turkey is in theory attempting to also become a member. Greece is obviously no stranger to Turkey's idea of, quote, protecting its rights, when, when in fact it is not its rights to protect. It is about usurping others' rights. Since August, we have been faced with an explosive situation in the Eastern Mediterranean due to consecutive naftexes issued by Turkey, illegal naftexes, all for research activities in areas overlapping Greek continental south. As a result, the Turkish seismic research vessel or its race is performing illegal activities, thus violating international law, international law of the sea. Turkey's illegal actions are a clear demonstration of its attempt to create feta accompli in the region. So, to the question, is there hope for mutual understanding? The answer is no, if Turkey continues like this. No as long as there is no respect for international legality by all actors. The answer could be yes, only if Turkey changes its ways. And it is a shame because energy can be such a game changer in terms of stability and development in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially at a time where the European Union is also stepping up its energy diplomacy efforts, and the European Union is not alone. This energy transition in the making across the globe will, no doubt, have huge geopolitical and geoeconomic implications. The goals are the same. Diversification of energy resources, security of energy supply, and the need to modernize and develop new energy infrastructure. In other words, energy has the potential to change everything. It can be an opportunity for stability and development or an excuse for more problems, fragmentation and inequality. In layman's terms, what separates a dream from a nightmare, it's content. In this case, the content we will be choosing to give our energy aspiration. Will we be choosing the road of diplomacy, cooperation, synergies, and international law, or the path of unilateral gunboat diplomacy, feta complete and exercise of power? Answer me, and I will tell you 
if there is hope and how much hope. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister. I think you were more pessimistic than your Cypriot colleague. Um, uh, Nick, Nick, Nicholas Burns, perhaps you could offer a reaction. I mean, particularly on the issue of Turkey, what, um, what can be done, Turkey as a NATO ally, what can be done to bring Turkey back towards a, a more cooperative attitude and more part of the West? Well, I certainly agree with both ministers that the challenge is to convince the Turks to agree to the peaceful resolution of disputes and to reject what both of them have said is gunboat diplomacy. There is no room for that in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, because Cyprus has rights, Greece has rights, Israel has rights, as well as the countries of the Levant that are at border or are near the, Mediter the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Turkey's become, I think in many ways for the European Union and for NATO, the largest problem because of its um, undue aggression in the Eastern Mediterranean because uh, the fact that it continues to pick fights with Greece along the um, what Turkey believes is a contested border. But I think everyone understands where the borders are in the Eastern Mediterranean. And Turkey is a major problem in, in, in Syria as well as in Libya. The fact that it's imported uh, the Russian S-400 air defense system into Turkey itself uh, has really caused a crisis in NATO. Uh, as you well know, uh, NATO operates by consensus. So any decision or move by the other NATO members uh, that would be considered by Ankara to be against this interest would certainly be vetoed. I think all of us need to, Europe and America need to speak with one voice. We want to have good relations with Turkey. Turkey is a very important country for the region, but we have to observe the rule of law. And I think in the United States, there is in both of our political parties, the Democratic and Republican Party, very strong support for Cyprus, very strong support for a just uh, settlement of a dispute on Cyprus, very strong support for the U.S.-Greece relationship, and that's of long standing. So right now, Turkey is considered to be a problem in, in both of our parties, in Congress, in the Trump administration, and certainly uh, as we go forward towards January 20th. And so I think a tighter relationship between the European Union and the United States, the NATO allies pulling together to send one message to the Turkish government, peaceful resolution of disputes, not a threat of force. That should not happen between NATO members, certainly should not happen between Turkey and Cyprus. And could you just add a word or two on Israel, since it's also part of the region? Um, I mean, the outgoing administration had a very close relationship with the Israeli Prime Minister. We've just seen Mr. Pompeo, Secretary of State Pompeo, visiting a settlement in the West Bank. Um, is, the, or is the relationship with the new administration with Israel going to be slightly awkward, would you say? I don't think it will be awkward. There's long-standing support here in the United States for Israel in both political parties. So. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just speaking personally here, but my personal view is there'll be strong relations between Israel uh, and the new administration. We're dedicated, the United States, to Israel's security, and it's endangered uh, by Iran and by Hezbollah and by Islamic Jihad uh, and, and, other, and the Revolutionary Guards uh, in the Middle East. Um, personally, I think it was a mistake for Secretary Pompeo to visit that West Bank settlement and to in effect seek to change longstanding American policy, which does not see the settlements as part of Israel's future, but which represent, you know, our longstanding policy is to see uh, uh, two states, uh, obviously the uh, Israel, but also a Palestinian state with its capital in East Jerusalem. That's the better policy. So I think Secretary Pompeo was very much mistaken uh, to visit the settlement and to make the statements he did and to encourage a change a major change in the way the United States does business. Having said that, it's very positive that um, the U.S. administration, uh, Secretary Pompeo and others, have helped Israel to emerge from isolation. I think it's in both political parties, it's very much supported to see Israel now having an official relationship with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, with Sudan. I don't know if there was a meeting the other night between Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia that one is denying it, one is saying it happened. But the last thing I'll say is it's very positive for Cyprus and very positive for Greece that Israel is a partner of theirs uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's in the interest of the United States to support Cyprus and Greece and Israel and their rights uh, in their own territorial waters 
to seek a future with natural gas, uh, with greater energy independence. That's going to be helpful to Cyprus and Greece and Israel. I think that's a powerful threesome, troika, I should say, those three countries together working with the U.S. and others. And is there any possibility that the new administration might move the embassy from Jerusalem back to Tel Aviv? Sorry, you're on mute. Thank you, John. I think it's just too early to say, you know, President-elect Biden just named uh, his secretary of state yesterday, and it will be formally introducing him in just two or three hours from now. That's ahead of us. But certainly I would hope as a citizen that the United States would be much more supportive of the Palestinian people, as well as Israel. President Trump cut off all American assistance to the Palestinians. President Trump cut off all American assistance to the United Nations Re Relief and Works Agency, the UN uh, refugee camps, supported refugee camps in, in the West Bank and Gaza and elsewhere. And um, President Trump had an entirely one-sided policy. The American tradition, the better tradition, is for us to support Israel, but also su to support a Palestinian state. And I, I hope that we'll return to that policy. Um, well, let's, we only have about five minutes left. So let's, let's hear again from the two ministers, um, particularly about how they view a, a, new, a new American administration, um, which we will see from January. And perhaps Mr. Christodoulides, you could add something now to what Mr. Burns, Ambassador Burns has just said, and any thoughts on relations with a new American government? Thanks, John. Actually, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Ambassador Burns, uh, you know, some countries in the region, they have the perception that uh, there is a withdrawal of the United States for the region or um, uh, a perception of disengagement or, let's say, a selective engagement with the Middle East, the Eastern Mediterranean, the, the greater Middle East. So I wanted to hear from Ambassador Burns what is... Um, what is his uh, reading regarding the, the new administration? Do you see uh, the new administration continuing the policy under uh, that um, Secretary Pompeo follow, or do you see some changes, especially having in mind that uh, uh, for the new administration, in general, multilateralism, uh, uh, transatlantic relations, all those elements are very important. Let, 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 let's just hear from uh, Foreign Minister Dendias and then come back to Nicholas Burns. Mr. Dendias, do you want to offer any thoughts to, to, to Ambassador Burns? Well, what I, what I would say is almost identical to what Nikos just said. Nikos presented it very politely with a question. Uh, if you will allow me, Ambassador, I would say more straightforward. We would like, love, and we would like, to, and we want to see more American involvement in the region. I'm not saying that America was absent from the region, that would be unjust, but it's clear that we need more American involvement in the region because the European Union is here. It's a very ambitious project, but it's a project into making. And in those difficult circumstances, as the one we're facing now, sometimes the fact that the United States was not as present in the region as we wanted it to be, I think created more issues that in resolve. So I stand by Nikos's questions to you openly having said our opinion. Perhaps you could, in answering um, Ambassador Burns, perhaps you could offer any thoughts on the role of Russia, which also has been very present in the region, um, perhaps more present recently than the United States. Thank you very much. Well, I'll be the third Nikos to speak. Uh, and just to say that I agree with both ministers um, with the implication of their questions. I expect under uh, President-elect Biden a very vigorous American return to full engagement with our allies in NATO and with our partners in the European Union. Uh, President-elect Biden has been saying this for months on the campaign trail. He's been repeating it in uh, the period after the election. Uh, I know very well uh, the new Secretary of State, Tony Blinken. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for 25 years. He's an internationalist. He's someone who deeply believes that the United States should be working with our allies. And here in the United States, there's an impression that the United States weakened our alliances, that we weakened NATO. And certainly President Trump had a very competitive relationship, almost a dismissive relationship with the European Union. That's not in the American interest. So I fully expect, uh, Minister Dendias and Minister Christodoulidis, that you're going to see the United States return as a very active friend and ally. And certainly the Eastern Mediterranean, in my personal judgment, has become more important over the last couple of years because of this issue of natural gas, because of the struggle on Cyprus for a just solution to the problem 
with Turkey. And certainly, as we said at the very beginning, I think we can all take satisfaction that the U.S. relationship with Greece is very strong. So uh, Joe Biden is going to be an, uh, an activist president. He's going to be a president who reasserts American engagement in the world. I'm sure of it. And the appointments that he's making really testify to that. These are all people with deep experience and they want to be engaged in the world. I hope that means very good news for the U.S.-Greece relationship and the U.S. relationship with Cyprus. And, and John, John, if I'm please, allowed, please, please. Um, a question from uh, all of the countries of the region on behalf of, of Cyprus. If, if Ambassador Burns can, um, can say something about uh, Iran and if we're going to see a new policy, a new U.S. approach uh, towards uh, towards Iran. It is an also uh, it is an issue that interests all countries in the region, but it, it is an issue that also uh, uh, is interest for the for the European Union. Please, Ambassador Burns. Well, I'm just again I'm speaking personally here. Just my own personal views. Um, I think there are two issues with Iran, as you know very well, Minister. Uh, the first is Iran is a violent force uh, for instability in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Gaza, violent force. And so I hope that the United States will be continuing to try to contain Iranian power. The second issue, of course, is the nuclear issue. And there, President-elect Biden has been very clear, he made a speech about this, that the United States would be willing to return to negotiations um, with the Iranians, along, of course, with our partners, Germany, France, Britain, Russia, China, but only if, of course, the Iranians have to go back to the limits of 2015. They've been reconstituting their nuclear program. They have 5,000 pounds of low enriched uranium. That's enough for two bombs if they convert it to high enriched uranium. And so it's very important in my judgment, the Iranians go back and deconstruct their nuclear programs. That would be the place to start those negotiations. But certainly you've heard President-elect Biden talk about his interest in seeing if negotiations uh, can be the answer. And I think that that's a larger uh, symbol of the new administration's focus on diplomacy and leading with diplomacy and helping to resolve problems through diplomacy if, if that's possible in a place like the Middle East. I think we'll have to leave it there. Um, we did have a question about China from the audience, but we're running out of time. Uh, you, you said one or two things about China already, um, uh, partly engagement, but partly treating uh, con confrontational. Um, but I'd like to thank all three of you for a very interesting panel. And we will also continue to discuss energy in particular in, in the next panel, indeed in two or three panels later in the day. And you've been a very helpful introduction to, to our next panel. So we'll move on to the next panel. Thank you very much to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
next panel, um, Efforts for Peace and Stability at the Crossroads of Three Continents. It's really a continuation from the previous panel when we heard from the two foreign ministers of Greece and Cyprus and from Nicholas Burns. Uh, um, uh, this will discuss um, drilling activities, alliances in the Mediterranean and escalating tension with Turkey, this panel. And we're going to hear from Charambol, Charalambos Petridis, Minister of Defence of Cyprus. If we can get him, we hope to hear from Thanos Dokos, the National Security Advisor in Greece, and then some comments from Speros Economides from the London School of Economics. So, first of all, um, Mr. Petri Minister Petridis, you have the floor, and I understand you have to leave slightly early, so we will give you the floor now. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's an important conference at such a high level with distinguished speakers and guests taking place in this uh, admitting severe pandemic situation. Peace and stability in the Eastern Mediterranean is not simply a question of Cyprus, national interest, but also a test of European solidarity. We are deeply concerned about the illegal drillings, and the activities taking place uh, within our exclusive economic zone. Turkey, as well known, has escalated the tensions and we have to plan and to create an alternative to our energy routes. Uh, we regret that Turkey has not heeded the repeated calls by the European Union. It's well known, the recent Council and the European Council conclusion to end the unilateral and illegal activities uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean as well as in the Aegean Sea. The escalation of these tensions in our region, uh, it's even more essential for the EU to build a united and solidarity Europe that is going to be able to meet all the challenges and face uh, and defend the interests of the EU members. Uh, the latest provocation by Turkey, it's the recent decision to proceed with the opening of the Amohostos area. Uh, knows, known as Varosha as well. This is violating the status quo and it's against the UN Security Council resolutions, both number 550 of the 1984 and 789 of the 1992. Um, in Cyprus for 46 years, people are waiting for a solution in the problem. This was going to be a part of an area that it's going to be part of the solution Unfortunately, uh, Erdogan is looking forward to a different kind of uh, a solution. It's clear that Turkey is aiming at imposing a permanent division. I mean, the statements recently are clear. They are asking for a two-state solution. This, op of course, opposed and is in absolute contradiction to the agreed basis of the Bizonal Bicommunal Federation. And it's also against all the UN Security Council resolutions, the international law, and of course against the EU law and the principles and values. Um, this is something that we are now facing and I think the whole world is looking at what is happening right now. Thankfully, our close partners have shown their level of solidarity. On the other hand, the EU family has to show this diplomacy and we have to be obliged to be more effective, let's say. We feel that the foundation of the European solidarity is evolving and a strategic culture is being forged in the Mediterranean region. For Cyprus, the situation is quite clear. For us, regarding the escalating tensions with Turkey, we want to be neighbors and friendly with all the countries this is what we are doing. We are strengthening and increasing cooperation with all uh, Mediterranean EU powers and all our neighboring states. Uh, the only exception to this is Turkey that escalates the threats uh, against not just uh, Cyprus and Greece, but I think we are, uh, it's clear what is happening in the Eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean and the Middle East as well. Another example of our cooperation is the recent signing of the East Med Gas Forum Charter, 
where we have a modern and open and inclusive platform. This is for us a very clear welcome in any kind, for every country in the region that respects the international law to join the forum and in this framework to cooperate. We want an inclusive and open state with positive agenda and we welcome anybody. Again, Turkey is an, excep is an exception to this uh, call. As explained, Cyprus has no option but to continue to cooperate with all those that embrace common European principles and values, and of course, international law. In this respect, we call Turkey to accept Cyprus' invitation and engage in negotiations to the Cyprus problem in good faith, and always in accordance with the international law and with the objective of reaching an agreement both on the maritime delimination and on the whole uh, situation in Cyprus. Of course, there is always the right to go to International Court of Justice if this is what Turkey prefers. The European Union is looking for peace and stability. As such, we respect all the neighbors, we respect everyone's rights and the international law. We are used to provocation in our neighborhood, and as you can understand, the situation may become more hostile in the Mediterranean. Today, we speak about drilling and maritime zones, but inevitably, other challenges may be arise and could be unforeseen as well. The answer to these questions are by no means easy, but any response to the current and emerging challenges must be a result of a collective action taken directly uh, through the affected actors found on common values and understanding in full respect, of course, of international law and with the principles of good and neighboring relations. This is our aim. This is what we are building, trust, and we want to be a pillar of uh, trust and uh, common interest for the whole neighborhood. The Republic of Cyprus aims to promote this regional political military cooperation in order to enhance security and stability for the whole region. Our cooperation both with Greece, Israel, Egypt and many other neighboring countries is here. We are friendly states and we are aiming to increase our community and interests and our bilateral relationships and this is what we are doing currently. In this effort, it is essential to have all neighboring states on board. Of course, we want to build sustainable synergies for cooperation on this crucial topic. We have initiated trilateral, quadrilateral, and of course bilateral diverse cooperation mechanisms. And between Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, and between Israel, Greece, and Cyprus, and we are expanding this to trilateral and um, quadrilateral with Lebanon and with Jordan. We want to succeed on partnerships and have a collective uh, security for our area, for the region as a whole. We also maintain and we are further enhancing a robust cooperation with France, the United States, the UK, and of course Greece, as well as many other countries. We strongly believe that the aggregate of all these partnerships, the common understanding of so many states, but also gradually increasing pressure from the EU, will eventually convince Turkey that its own interest is also to cooperate with everyone. Last but not least, allow me to express the hope that Cyprus, as an EU member, not only will continue to defend its interests and legal rights, we are always in favor of diplomacy and we want to explore all the possibilities with the support, of course, of the European Union on the basis always of international law, European law, the UN Council resolutions, and we want by intensifying our efforts at the legal, political and diplomatic level to de-escalate all this and find a proper solution to the Cyprus problem as well. That is a catalyst uh, for the whole region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, very interesting. Um, and now we go over to, if we can, to Thanos Dokos, um, the 
National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister of Greece. Um, you have the floor. You need to unmute. That's it. I think I managed. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, th thank you very much for the for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to speak with uh, uh, such a prominent colleagues and, and, and friends. Um, well, unfortunately, the Eastern Mediterranean is an unstable region. We, we always wish we, there was more in common with the uh, you know the Scandinavian countries or Benelux. Uh, unfortunately, this is a much more complicated and unstable region, and we have quite a few problems, um, you know, old and, and more recent conflicts, uh, terrorism, um, you know, population flows and failed states and, and, and so on and so forth. And of course, there's also a, a vacuum of power over the past few years. You know, the uh, traditional powers have to an extent withdrawn from the region. Um, sorry, yeah, it should be okay now. Uh, they have withdrawn from the region, and I'm referring to the U.S. and the and the EU, who have uh, new or, or returning powers. You know, Russia, China is making an entry into this part of the world, and we have quite a few ambitious regional uh, players. So this is a, a complicated security environment, and the problem is, as the minister mentioned, uh, there is no regional security architecture. There are no institutions, no uh, discussion for a. Uh, that brings countries together to discuss their problems. Uh, and th the only game in town is those uh, trilateral, or at least that's how they started, uh, cooperation schemes between Greece, Cyprus, uh, Israel, and Egypt. Now we have uh, new interested parties, the, the, the US, France, the uh, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, and hopefully there will be others. So this is the, the basis, the nucleus for building uh, a, a regional security architecture. It will not solve all the problems, but it's a good start. Now, of course, the, the question we always get when we have this discussion is, well, should this be a, an inclusive or an exclusive club of countries? And obviously the answer is uh, it should be inclusive. And there's an obvious absence there. Uh, Turkey is an important country for the region. So if the question is, should Turkey join such uh, cooperation schemes, the, the obvious answer is yes. Uh, but if the question is, can Turkey join under the circumstances? Well, here we have a problem because Turkey seems to be reversing the order of cause and effect. It has been complaining about uh, being isolated in, in the region. Well, it didn't happen exactly that way. Turkey has become isolated because it has been behaving aggressively towards a number of countries. And if you look at the situation, Turkey has no diplomatic relations with Egypt, has quite a few problems and a low level of dip diplomatic representation with Israel. It doesn't recognize the Republic of Cyprus and has its own share of problems with Greece. So, so I think, uh, yes, Turkey would be welcomed and there are many common interests, energy, uh, security, economy, trade, and so on and so forth. But it needs to play by the rules of the game, and it needs to modify its aggressive behavior. Uh, when that happens, I think you know, the door will gradually be opened, not only to Turkey, but of course to other countries. So that's where we are. Turkey has been behaving as a spoiler. Um, hopefully it will modify its, its behavior. We haven't seen any signs of that yet, unfortunately. Um, but one can always be optimistic. But until that happens, well, we are forced to uh, cooperate and try to contain any spoilers, be that Turkey or other countries in the region. Uh, thank you very much. Um, perhaps I could put a question to you before bringing Speros Economides in. Um, uh, one of our audience, Ioannis Turkides, asks, can Turkey join the gas forum and is it realistic to isolate Turkey from the gas forum? I think you've partly answered that question, but what, what do you think about that? Well, obviously it's not an ideal situation, but Turkey has done that to itself. You know, by uh, behaving aggressively towards many of the existing members of the Mediterranean gas forum, you know, like Cyprus, Egypt and others, 
Well, uh, it's obviously impossible for uh, any of those countries to consider a more normal relationship with Turkey. That could change. Uh, Turkey has to change first. Okay, Spiros Economides, your your thoughts on uh, efforts for peace and stability in this region. Uh, Thank you, John, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak on this panel. I just want to make three very brief points, uh, touching both on what the minister said and what uh, Dr. Doko said, and also generally uh, talking about the current situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, The first point is that I think we need to be very clear that the whole issue surrounding hydrocarbon energy reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean has become increasingly politicized and has lost any kind of economic residual value that it may have had. Uh, A lot of what we talk about in uh, in terms of what's happening in the Eastern Mediterranean since the summer is about the politicization of hydrocarbons and the political contestation that's going on around them. And in a sense, we've lost sight of any commercial or economic value they may have and how this may be utilized. We speak the language of regional development, etc. But in practice, what is going on is a highly politicized game around these energy reserves, which could have very unfortunate consequences. The second point, broad point I'd like to make, and this reflects both on uh, the remarks made by Thanos Dokos and by the minister's remarks, is that what we've seen returning to the Eastern Mediterranean in the last few months is a very harsh form of geopolitics. Uh, We may speak the language of good neighborliness. We may wish to have uh, stability and peace in the region, but what's happened increasingly in the last few months is an increasingly complex a web of geopolitical entanglements, if you want, entangling alliances, uh, which include not only uh, the states of the region, but also extra uh, actors from beyond the region, which makes the situation complicated. It adds uh, a degree of, 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 of strategic value to the region, which perhaps has been lost over time, and really reinforces the fact that we've moved away from the politics of values and rights and norms in Europe, and uh, really moving towards uh, a realization uh, that uh, realpolitik and geopolitics uh, do matter in our international interactions, and we have to appreciate that. Uh, The last point I'd like to make, and I know we're pressed for time, so I'll keep this very brief, uh, relates directly to the point the minister made about European solidarity. And I think what we've come to see uh, very recently is that what is going on in the Eastern Mediterranean is posing extremely difficult problems to the European Union in its foreign and security policy. Because what is at stake here are the rights uh, and increasingly the interests of two member states, Greece and Cyprus. And the European Union, if it is going to show solidarity, if it is going to follow all the precepts of European foreign policy with respect to promoting rights, uh, in this case, international legal rights, and defending the interests of its member states, in this case, uh, the the, the interests of Greece and Cyprus, uh, it has to move forward and and be very clear and categorical about what kind of actions it's going to take vis-a-vis those who are challenging the rights and interests of Greece. But we've seen that within the European Union, there are diverging paths. There may be other member states who see value or perhaps greater value in geopolitical interests which are served with countries who are outside the European Union. And this causes ruptures within the foreign policy facade and the security interests of the European Union, which have immense consequences. There is evidence for this. Uh, The EU has procrastinated endlessly about, for example, imposing economic sanctions on Turkey. We move from one summit to the next threatening and then removing the threat and threatening again and removing the threat. So there is a conundrum here for Europe. Does it defend the rights and interests of two member states or does it succumb to some kind of other geopolitical concern which renders it uh, impotent to act in the face of external provocation? Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Very helpful um, comments. Um, I think, Minister, we have Minister Petridis briefly back. Uh, I don't know if you have to go, Minister, soon, but I would like to ask you one question before you go, if I may. Um, you talked about pursuing a, a settlement one day of the Cyprus problem. I wondered how worried you were by by the by the election of Ersin Tatar as the new president, so called, of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Yes, yeah, surely this election is not helpful at all. Uh, we have seen already statements uh, saying that they are looking forward for a, a two-state solution and not. Um, by zonal, by communal federation, that it's the base that both the European Union and the UN Council resolutions also are uh, in favor of. Uh, we hope that this stance will not 
be there forever and that we will start the negotiations from where we were left uh, at Kranz Montana um, some time ago. Uh, really, the Varosha case that is uh, showing the escalation of Turkey in practice, uh, I repeat that for 44, six years, the legal owners are waiting to be part of the total solution uh, for this area. To the contrary, Turkey denies even this, um, you know, what is left behind to be given as a solution and um, verbally indicates that uh, the whole situation is now with Mr. Tadar changes completely. And, and one more question, which I will also put to Mr. Dokos, um, because uh, Spiros Ekonomides raised this, and one of our questioners, Ivagoras Drakos, from the audience has also raised the question, would you, Minister, wish to put pressure on the European Union to impose sanctions on Turkey? Well, I believe that the economic sanctions, you know, is not the way forward. But at the end of the day, uh, if uh, Turkey is not de-escalating the tensions. And we're seeing that, to the contrary, they are uh, maintaining the tensions and they are finding other ways, as I mentioned with Varosha, uh, or uh, in other situations to, uh, I mean, for the tensions to prevail, then maybe that should be the way to be on the table. Um, it has to be there, but I repeat, that's not uh, the main task and issue. The main task and issue is to retain and sit on the table, find a solution based on the international law and based on the UN Council resolutions. And uh, it has to be there because of what Turkey is actually uh, doing currently. That's the only reason. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Uh, Thanos Dokos, um, this question of whether it would be a good idea to impose sanctions on, on Turkey. Mr. Economides raised the question of the European Union's attitude to Turkey. They talk about this, but they never do anything. Is this something that you think um, should play a role that Greece could be pushing for? Well, as the minister mentioned, it's not an end by itself, uh, but it can be a useful tool. Now, uh, if you ask me, am I optimistic that the EU is prepared to agree on meaningful sanctions? Well, that's that's, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic than I was a couple of months ago because I think uh, many EU states uh, are you know, getting tired uh, with, with Turkey's behavior. But if I may, I would like to, um, to, to broaden the, the discussion, uh, to go a little bit beyond uh, Greece, Cyprus, and, and Turkey. One looks at Europe's southern neighborhoods. Uh, and of course, one can understand that there are diverging national interests and, and, and different policies from, from various states. But, you know, one looks at what has happened over the past few years in, in countries like Syria and Libya and how the EU has been paying and, and some of its member states have been paying a very heavy cost as a result of what has happened in, 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 in a number of, of, of conflicts in the neighborhood. Now, if the EU continues to be incapable of shaping its its own uh, immediate neighborhood, uh, be that in the in the south or in the east, then we are faced with a major problem. So I think uh, the EU should get its act together at some point. We should formulate a meaningful and efficient neighborhood policy uh, and really shape our neighborhood. Because for the time being, we're paying a high cost as a result of Syria, Libya, and instability in the south. Uh, and we're just spectators. So this needs to be changed. Not an easy task, uh, but I think at some point we should get more serious at the EU level. What, what is your opinion, Mr. Economides, um, on what you've just been hearing? Well, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more, really. Um, I think what the European Union has done uh, in the last four years, essentially since it's published its European Union Global Strategy in 2016, is set out its stall as more of a regional power than a global power. There's absolutely no doubt the European Union has a global reach commercially. There's no doubt the European Union perhaps even culturally and normatively has, normatively has some kind of global reach. 
But the European Union Global Strategy of 2016, agreed by all member states, set out very clearly that the eastern neighborhood and the southern neighborhood were its main priorities, and that geopolitically, these have an immense impact on the European Union, not only, not only as a foreign policy actor, but as a union, if you take, for example, the migration problem into account and where the migration flows come from. So at some point, the European Union has to decide whether it's going to be credible in terms of pursuing the policies, policies that it's, it has set out. And this particular set of crises uh, and tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean highlights this. This is the point I was trying to make. I'm not trying to uh, blow the issue out of proportion. It's simply the European Union has set out its stall in a particular way, and if it doesn't act on it, then in effect, it lacks the credibility and it's not simply going to be considered a very serious actor internationally in the foreign policy and security field. Uh, I don't know if either of you were, were, were uh, listening to the previous panel um, with Nicholas Burns, but one of the questions he was asked by both them, the Cypriot foreign minister, Christodoulides and the Greek foreign minister, Endias, was if the United, well, they both said they want the United States to play a bigger role, particularly under a newer administration, to re-engage with the Eastern Mediterranean. Do you, do you see that as something that is both desirable and, and plausible to economy these first, and then Mr. Dokos? Well, I think there's almost an inevitability about this, simply because, of course, we have a pending change of administration in Washington, so there are high expectations of what it may bring to the game, but also because there has, there has, uh, there has been a sort of European vacuum in terms of reacting to what are called provocations in the Eastern Mediterranean. And we see that the cracks that have come out as a result of this imply that either Europe acts on its own and disregards the United States of America, or we need the United States of America to involve itself in the region for some kind of positive outcome to, to, to come about. This implies that the European Union has no pull over, for example, Turkey, and that the United States of America as a NATO ally, serious player on the international stage, has to come in and, and lay down the ground rules for some kind of negotiated settlement or dialogue, or at least easing okay. the tensions. And so I fear here that, um, you know, we, 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 we are in the sense, Greece and Cyprus are firmly ensconced in Europe, but they're seeking extra European solutions for a particular set of, of, of crises, which really does make it problematic for the European Union. And uh, Mr. Dokos, I mean, Greece is a member of NATO, along with Turkey, um, but Turkey is causing some problems for its NATO allies. And not just for Greece, mm -hmm. France as well. Uh, but let me, I very much agree with what Spiros Economides said. Let me add the following. I have no illusions that the, the U.S. will become the dominant Mediterranean power that it once uh, were, not because they cannot, but because they are not interested, because now they, uh, the focus, is, is, and it's something that started with, uh, uh, with Bush, continue with Obama and, and, and Trump, and I don't think that Biden will change that to any significant extent. The focus will be Asia and, and, and China. But I expect, and I think it will be beneficial for the region if the U.S., you know, increases its its attention and, and its footprint. You know, not significantly, but I think the U.S. is set to return to a certain extent to the region. And I also think that only the EU and the U.S. working together uh, could achieve some progress, and I have my doubts about that. It's going to be a very difficult exercise, but finding a solution to, in, in Cyprus, and one has to, 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 that's another interesting discussion, what kind of solution are we talking about? Uh, but the, the only way to, to have a serious negotiation uh, in, 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 around the Cyprus problem is to have a concerted effort by the EU and the US. So mm -hmm. hopefully uh, the Biden administration will uh, increase its attention uh, in the Eastern Met. And, and I'm, I can't resist, because of the country I come from, to mention a country that is not no longer in the European Union, but was once in the European Union, but has, in the history, in the past, had a specific role in Cyprus and indeed in the Eastern Mediterranean. Do you feel that the UK should play some role? I mean, France has been playing a role. The UK doesn't seem to have done very much in the Eastern Mediterranean recently. Mr. Dokos. And, and that's unfortunate, although we, we see a, a number of statements and a degree of interest at the level of the... Uh, uh, foreign ministry, uh, but I, I think the, the UK, but I think Spiros is probably better positioned to answer that question, is probably preoccupied with uh, its own domestic issues, with the Brexit, which is not a finished business yet. Uh, but once this is over, and hopefully it will be done uh, in, in the best possible way for both sides, the EU and the UK, 
when that happens, we expect the UK to be back in the Eastern Med in a constructive manner. Mr. Economides. Well, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank Fano for what we call in England a hospital pass and you know, <laughs> looking at the time bomb in my direction. I think basically what's at stake here is uh, trying to think about what the future relationship is going to be between the UK and the European Union in foreign policy terms post-Brexit. And that's something which is unclear. But I'm quite optimistic about it because um, for those of you in the know, Europe's foreign policy mechanisms are purely and completely intergovernmental. Uh, you can opt in and opt out at any possible point in time. So I'm quite optimistic that, that in the future, the uh, the foreign policy and security interests which the UK shares with its European Union partners will mean that it will be able to participate in European actions, uh, uh, including perhaps those in the Eastern Mediterranean. So the UK can play not a unilateral, but a multilateral role in the region. And it has got interest in the region. And potentially, it could add weight, uh, both diplomatic and potentially military, uh, to, to whatever may uh, develop in the region. So I think the future of Brexit uh, will show us more and the future of the security and, and foreign policy relationship between the UK and Europe will tell us more about whether the UK can and will be an actor of any kind of significance in the region. Okay. I echo yeah. what uh, Spiro said. Uh, I, I think there may be divergence on a number of issues, especially economy, trade and so on and so forth, but eventually I think there will be convergence in those issues as well. But when it comes to foreign and security policy, uh, there's no time to lose. I think uh, the interests are in the same direction between the UK and the, uh, and the EU, and we need to continue working with each other uh, without any interruption. And one more very quick question before we go from one of our uh, our audience, Lena Christoforou. She suggests, um, she thinks that Turkey is behaving badly, but she has suggested in one of her comments that, that Turkey helped to create, perhaps deliberately, a huge refugee wave to Europe. Do you think that's true? Or was it just one of those things that happened? That Turkey, it, it's a card that Turkey has played with Europe. Mr. Dokos. Well, no, I, I don't think that Turkey created the problem. Now, they, they try to instrumentalize it, to use it, uh, in certain ways, yes, that is obvious, and we uh, felt that on our skin uh, last uh, February and, and, and March in the border region between Greece and Turkey. Uh, but the problem was created elsewhere. Uh, but let me also add, uh, we are focusing on the refugee situation. Uh, the, uh, the, the migration problem uh, is the, the real uh, problem for, for the EU, uh, and it's, it will be with us uh, for for the long haul. I think we need to um, increase to, to, to agree at the, at, at the EU level on a common migration policy because people will keep trying to come to Europe because of climate change, because of poverty, because of conflict. So even if Syria is somehow miraculously resolved tomorrow morning and every Syrian refugee goes goes back to Syria, there will still be millions of people from a number of countries that will try to come to Europe. So we urgently, you know, as of yesterday, we need a common asylum and, and migration policy at the EU level. I'm sure that's right, but perhaps it would be a subject for another panel one day. Um, I'd like to thank both of you. I think we've lost the minister. He, he had to go, um, Petridis, but, um, but I would like to thank him as well, and Thanos Dokos and Spiros Economides for a very interesting and helpful panel. And we will now take um, a short break of another 10 minutes before we move on to economic and financial prospects. So thank you very much for um, both of you and for the minister. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back to the uh, 16th Cyprus Virtual Summit um, for this year. Um, we now move on from talking a lot about Turkey and security and defence to talk about the post-pandemic economic and financial prospects for Europe and Cyprus. Um, and we have a we're going to have a panel of three very distinguished speakers, followed by two two commentators from the business perspective. Um, so all of you are very welcome. We have to stick stick reasonably strictly to time. So if you're too long, I will try and cut you off. Um, uh, but I'm sure we can manage manage to do this. The uh, prospects for Cyprus, like the rest of the European Union and the Eurozone, this year has been a difficult year. Um, I think we are we are predicting 6% drop in GDP, and I think for the Eurozone, slightly more. Um, but we hope we can recover very more strongly next year. So let's hear first from Klaus Regling, um, Managing Director of the ESM, then from Jeroen Dijsselbloem, the former president of the Eurogroup, and after him, Harris Georgiadis, the former Minister of Finance. So uh, Klaus Regling, you have the floor. Yes, um, thanks, John, and um, good afternoon to everybody from Luxembourg. I always enjoy going to Cyprus, particularly in November, um, but I guess we all got used to work in this um, new format. Europe is experiencing, without doubt, the most challenging economic and financial crisis in our lifetime. Economic activity came to a halt in March after bottoming out in April. Data confirmed a strong recovery phase from May onwards as the lockdowns were lifted. However, the recovery lost momentum in August and now as we are experiencing the second wave, the pandemic weighs again heavily on our economies. Latest forecasts suggest that economic activity in the euro area will only reach its pre-crisis level again in late 2022. And the recovery is likely to be uneven across member states. How has Europe responded to this unprecedented crisis? Looking back, Europe provided a quick and well-coordinated policy response Already by the beginning of April, the European economy was protected by three safety nets worth 540 billion euro. Each of these safety nets has a different purpose. First, the ESM's pandemic crisis support helps countries to cover direct and indirect healthcare costs. And although no money has been requested, the mere existence of our pandemic red line has, has calmed financial markets. Second, the Commission's SURE program is the safety net for workers. And the third safety net, the new guarantee fund of the European Investment Bank, can be used to finance additional corporate investment. But the European rapid response did not end there. Monetary policy measures by the European Central Bank stabilized financial markets. And then in July, the 750 billion euro next generation EU recovery fund was adopted. The three safety nets and the next generation EU fund were all designed in a way that countries most affected by the pandemic will receive more support. This unprecedented degree of solidarity is important to protect the EU single market and to avoid excessive divergences in our monetary union. Cyprus will receive a substantial amount of money from the European funds. This money presents Cyprus with a good opportunity to continue its structural reform efforts. In addition to these Europe-wide initiatives, all EU member states responded to the crisis with extensive national fiscal policy measures, also Cyprus. The Cypriot economy put together, the Cypriot government put together a fiscal support package 
that alleviated the immediate impact of the crisis on the Cypriot economy. President Anastasiades mentioned at the beginning of this conference um, this afternoon that this policy package amounts to 1.3 billion euro. It protects the country's workers and firms. But every European country needs to recognize nice, that these immediate measures must be accompanied by longer term policies. And those policies will need to reflect the particular challenges in each country. Cyprus is a small open economy. It is exposed to a number of external risks. For example, during the first half of this year, tourist arrivals decreased by 85% compared with the previous year. Cyprus could make its economy more resilient by decreasing its dependence on tourism and diversifying further into other areas. The European Commission expects economic activity in Cyprus to fall by 6.2% this year before recovering in 2021 and 22. And Cyprus has other challenges to overcome, particular in its banking sector. The amount of non-performing loans in the balance sheet of Cypriot banks remains the second highest in the euro area. The Cypriot government has partially addressed this issue. Between 2014 and the first half of this year, the stock of NPLs declined from 24 billion euro to around 5 billion euro, a real significant progress, but still a high level. However, since non-performing loans will remain a challenge in the future, the legal framework needs to be strengthened, including the insolvency and foreclosure law. These are important challenges for Cyprus. The current crisis is very painful for all of Europe. But at the same time, it also provides the opportunity to accelerate structural changes in our economies and to accelerate progress towards deeper European integration, which I believe is crucial to overcome this crisis and to position Europe better in a changing world. Future growth in Europe is potentially affected by several problems. First, the pandemic destroys physical and human capital. Precautionary savings are up and some investors will be reluctant to invest for some time given the uncertainties. This will depress demand. Second, the collapse in world trade and deglobalization mean less competition and thus lower productivity gains and lower growth. Third, banks continue to make too little profits in Europe and NPLs will go up as, as GDP declines. This may limit banks' ability to provide sufficient credit for the recovery. And fourth, the higher public debt, although indispensable under the circumstances, can have a negative impact on growth in the long term. All these negative factors come on top of the well-known demographic problems and all this is likely to lead to a potential growth rate after the crisis that may well be lower than before the crisis. Faced with these challenges, what can we do? The European agenda must focus on productivity and competitiveness, on making the European economy greener and more digital. That is exactly the objective of the new generation EU recovery fund. A lot of money will be available. It must be used productively for investment and to support reforms in order to strengthen growth and to transform the European economies. In addition, we should also continue to deepen our monetary union. 
important steps have been taken during the last decade to complete this process and to make economic and monetary union more resilient and less vulnerable, additional steps are desirable. First, the completion of the ESM reform in the future with the revised ESM treaty, the ESM will provide a backstop to the single resolution fund, increasing its financial firepower to deal with bank resolutions. That step is important to complete banking union which also needs a common deposit guarantee and a better crisis management. Second, we need progress towards a capital markets union that would integrate the 27 national financial markets that we have today. Progress on the capital markets union would improve the allocation of capital in AMU, lead to more private sector risk sharing, increase the growth potential and make the euro more attractive for international investors. Third, a fiscal stabilization instrument would help to shield economies of the euro area against future shocks. This would allow for more fiscal risk sharing. Such a permanent facility, which could be a revolving fund and not a budget, would give countries the opportunity to expand their fiscal space in a downturn. Several of the steps I mentioned are rather controversial among our member states. It will therefore take years to reach consensus and to implement them. But it would lead to a more integrated Europe, a more robust economic monetary union, and stronger growth. Such measures will help us to reach a vision of Europe that is more innovative, more resilient, and more sustainable, and where the international role of the euro would be stronger. And that is the Europe that we all want, I believe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Klaus. A very comprehensive um, summary. Um, I turn now to Jeroen Dijsselbloem, um, who is uh, chairman of the Dutch Safety Board, but was also president of the Eurogroup. I think you were president of the Eurogroup during the Cyprus crisis as well, if I remember rightly, in 2013, which was quite awkward. I was. That was uh, the... We remember. Um, you, and I'm sure Mr. Georgianis remembers too, but you have, you have six or seven minutes to tell us what you think about the prospects. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, John. And thanks to The Economist for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to be with you. Like Klaus, I would have loved to have been in uh, Nicosia uh, in Cyprus for this uh, meeting and hope to be able to do so in the, in the near future. Um, with Klaus, I think that what we've seen in this crisis compared to the financial and sovereign debt crisis has been more impressive, it has been done quicker, it has been implemented quicker, both by monetary authorities, national authorities, what national governments are now doing to stimulate and support the economy is, I think, unprecedented. Uh, and also at the European level, and, and Klaus already mentioned, all the different instruments and funds that are being used uh, and are put ready to be used uh, throughout the EU. Let me underline from Klaus's speech two elements, which I think uh, I've done a lot of work on them in my time, but I think they're still extremely urgent. One is to complete the banking union. And there's a lot of misunderstanding also in the North, uh, in the Netherlands and in Germany about uh, the completion of the banking union because people feel it's about sharing risks and they will become responsible for bad risks. Uh, I think the key importance right now is to allow a full restructuring of the European banking sector across border. And in order to be able to do that and to allow that uh, consolidation process to take place, having a completed banking union, including an EDIS, uh, would be crucial. So this is also very much in the interest uh, of the banking sectors in all of our countries. Now, the second point I would like to underline is the Capital Markets Union. It's become a very technocratic project. 
it doesn't have the swagger that the banking union uh, in its early days did, but it is very important. Uh, just think back in the financial crisis, how the banking crisis hit Europe much harder and longer than it did in the, U uh, than it did in the US. And this has everything to do with the fact that Europe is very, very bank dependent. The economy of Europe is still financed for about 80%, 75% from banks and bank loans, which creates a completely different kind of investment climate. Now, if we want to really draw in investments to Europe, if we want to open up the risk appetite of our economies, if we want to become much more innovative, we are lagging behind compared to the US and China at the moment. We need deeper and well-integrated capital markets. Let me just underline the point that Klaus already made. It is crucial. Uh, and I think all efforts should be uh, on that. Uh, I'm an optimist at heart. I think that the EU has had a long tradition of strengthening its frameworks, its cooperation, its institutions in times of crises. So this, again, is a crisis which allows for next steps. Uh, the urgency is great, and we already are seeing some of those next, next steps. Of course, the recovery fund is not just a temporary fund. In fact, it has opened up a window in which the Commission can create uh, a sovereign debt at EU level, uh, which is a big step it has been debated long and hard for a long time. So it's really quite um, an important step that's been taken here. Let me make three additional points to Klaus. One is that I feel that if we are to take further structural steps to improve uh, the functioning of the monetary union, we must be careful to always keep responsibility and accountability together. Um, so if we want to create future budgets, for example, for a stabilization tool for our economies, then really it should be done with EU means. In other words, EU taxation. There is an opening now in the recent agreement uh, linked to the recovery fund, and that opening should really be used. Um, and of course, under the scrutiny of the European Parliament, and the money should be spent or invested within European frameworks. If we don't manage to keep these elements in one hand, uh, I think there will be a big pushback throughout the EU. You cannot accept that there will be a joint debt uh, at European level if it is not coming from, if it's not spent in a European framework and under control of the European Parliament uh, and funded with European means. I think that will really create problems for the future. However political difficult, politically difficult this will be, uh, I think we need to get it right. My second point would be, we need quite quickly to get more clarity on the future fiscal framework. The fiscal rules that we had have been set aside, understandably, uh, but some are now arguing that they should never be reimposed. Um, and I think we very quickly should have the debate on what adjustments we want forward, forward looking, uh, but not to have security and clarity both inward towards one another, as well as to outside investors or what the fiscal framework uh, will be like in the Eurozone, I think will create a strong risk. Third point, and then I'll close, John. Um, we should really use the current very impressive fiscal stimulus uh, coming from Brussels and national uh, governments to green our economy. And I think there are more opportunities there. Uh, certainly some national uh, spending is not being used to restructure the economy. It's basically in some countries mainly used to maintain the old uh, economy. And also the commission. The commission has done very good work, of course, in the Green Deal and uh, greening uh, some of the funds that are being made available. Um, but I would argue that also within the state aid framework, the commission could demand uh, more restructuring of the economy, of course, towards 
a sustainable economy that we badly need. Thank you, John. Thank you very much um, for those interesting points. And we now turn to, to Harris Georgiadis, um, former finance minister of Cyprus. You have uh, five to six minutes. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you to the Economist Conferences for the invitation. And let me say that I'm delighted to join uh, Jeroen Deiselblum and Klaus Regling for this discussion, though I, I regret not having the opportunity to welcome them both in person um, to Cyprus, uh, hopefully next year. Um, so there is no doubt that the world is facing an unprecedented event, uh, one that happens once every few centuries, which has thrown the global economy and the EU economy uh, into a steep uh, recession. Uh, but let me focus my comments on Cyprus. Um, in inevitably, the Cyprus economy has taken a hit. It is expected to shrink significantly by the end of the year, probably by five, six percent of its GDP. Um, we are still in uncharted waters. And this means that making forecasts is very difficult. Uh, I am, however, confident that next year will be a year of strong uh, economic recovery uh, across the EU and uh, definitely in Cyprus. So I do share your optimism, John, um, uh, and, uh, this, um, and the reason why I'm, I, I, I am optimistic, uh, well, has to do with the very good news regarding the vaccine. Uh, economic activity depends largely on expectations. The commencement of the vaccination process will immediately, immediately create a set of positive expectations, which will in turn uh, kickstart the economy. So the recession may be deep, uh, but it will not be long, it will not be protracted. But obviously it's not only the vaccine, um, economic policy will indeed determine whether we shall be able to smooth out the consequences of the recession. And if, uh, crucially, we shall be able to give the economy a push towards um, a strong recovery. In fact, the, the conference organizers ask, ask the question whether then there is enough ammunition to trigger the recovery. I, I believe so. Um, so Cyprus has entered this latest crisis with a strong growth potential and with significant fiscal buffers. Uh, Cyprus growth rates for the previous five years stood on average at 4.4% of the GDP annually. The economy was very near full employment with um, a fiscal surplus of 3% of the GDP and the primary surplus of almost 6% of the GDP. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, that's the largest in the Eurozone. And this is what has enabled the government to mobilize public funds and to run the largest fiscal stimulus since the, uh, well, since the inception of the Republic, actually. The budget for 2021 will continue to along expansion and expansionary lines, supporting growth with a further increase in public expenditure. And this offers a very, a very significant lesson for economic policy that governments should contain public expenditure during the good times, creating fiscal space and buffers, which can be mobilized when the economy will inevitably run into difficulties. And this is not austerity. This is a policy of common sense. And this is what our government has been doing since 2013. And uh, here I fully agree with uh, Jeroen this is the essence of the EU fiscal framework. It's not an austerity framework. It's uh, what will enable economies uh, uh, across the EU to avoid austerity and to have instead the fiscal buffers to um, give the economy a push uh, when, uh, when, it needs, uh, when it needs so. And this is exactly why I am rather upbeat 
about the prospects of uh, recovery. And the banking sector also is um, of crucial importance. It is in a better condition, uh, still with some challenges. I agree with what Klaus has mentioned, but it is able to support the recovery. It has significant capital buffers and immense liquidity, which it is already uh, being mobilized. But as a final word, let me say that my optimism is uh, conditional. It is conditional up, uh, upon our political system continuing to support reforms uh, and at the same time staying clear of the reckless policies of the past. In fact, this should be the, uh, the lesson uh, at, the, at an EU level. We do need to continue supporting growth-friendly uh, reforms. Uh, what the crisis has shown is that it is not populism which has the answers. It is rationality, reason, and the policies of uh, common sense. There are no shortcuts to a strong and healthy economy. And that's exactly my point. Thank you very much, Minister. I, I recall that um, at previous summits, Klaus has said that Cyprus was one of his model pupils, not always like some of the other um, countries in receipt of money from the ESM, particularly not Greece. So um, I guess he would say you've done quite a good job. Um, uh, and we now turn to for comments. Actually, before we turn to comments, I wanted to ask Klaus, if I may, just one question, because um, Jerome, one of the questions on the on the agenda is the Eurobond concept pros and cons. And I think what Jerome was saying was that the recovery fund was not a temporary measure. It would equip the commission with a new vehicle. It might even lead to some tax powers. And I wondered, Klaus, do you think that, yes, what we have seen this year, if it materializes past Poland and Hungary, is a prelude to a, to a permanent budgetary, central budgetary fund of the kind that um, sometimes France has asked for, but sometimes Germany has resisted? Yes, let me first make a comment on what you said. You are right, I often praise Cyprus um, for really implementing with great determination um, reforms after the 2013 crisis. Um, but I never said that Greece um, failed. Greece also exited its program in 2008, um, and we shouldn't forget that. So just to clarify that. No, that is a good question, um, and there is a debate in Europe on that question. And actually, when I talk um, with, with financial markets, which is half of my job, um, they often ask me the same question, and they're also debating, is this now something permanent, or is it a one-off? Um, I don't know. Um, it's certainly something that one can do again if a comparable crisis were to happen again. Because in Europe, like in, in also the national context, when something happens, one always looks back and, and tries to find the precedent. So if something like this pandemic were to happen again, then I'm sure one would again look at this um, recovery fund and say, make an analysis, did it work? Should we repeat it? In that sense, it's not a one-off. But I don't see it smoothly developing into a permanent fund because the decisions of the European Council, the summit, are very, very clear that it is a temporary arrangement. And without that um, statement, the parliaments and several member states would not agree on it. Um, so that is my balanced um, answer. Also, if you listen carefully to what I said in my introduction, when I said what's still missing um, to make monetary union complete, I did talk about a central fiscal capacity for macroeconomic stabilization. But I said one doesn't really need a budget for that because a budget has a connotation of annual inflows and outflows, which is not really what you need for stabilization purposes. Um, for stabilization purposes, there are maybe many years where such a fund is not used at all, but it is needed, I think, to make monetary union complete. That's why I argue in favor of a pot of money. Some people have called it a rainy day fund. Um, also, the ESM could play a role um, with our unused firepower um, so that money is made available when needed, not every year, when needed. And it should flow back within a cycle so that it can 
be used again for the next crisis. Um, that's how I would look at it. Why the recovery fund, which is now very important, um, is not so much for cyclical stabilization. It helps to stabilize demand, but the main purpose is really to promote investment and reforms, which is very important, but that's different from the purpose of the fiscal facility for macroeconomic stabilization. Very clear. Thank you very much. Okay, we turn to our two comment commentators from the business perspective. Starting with Evgenios Evgenyu, Chief Executive of PwC Cyprus and one of our sponsors, Evgenios. Well, thank you, John. Uh, let me say that I'm very happy to be participating once again at the Economist uh, Conference and in such a distinguished uh, panel. Uh, I will try not to repeat uh, some of the things that have already been uh, said. I'll just say that for businesses, this has been a particularly tough uh, period, a period of uh, extreme uh, uncertainty. Uh, and obviously, different businesses have been affected in a different uh, way. I mean, we carried out as PwC a few months ago an impact assessment uh, focused on Cyprus, and it was clear there that different sectors, for example, the hospitality and leisure, would have a different sort of impact compared to the health uh, sector. Uh, at the same time, uh, even within uh, specific uh, sectors, there are differences. So uh, shops operating in malls have been affected in a different way uh, from retailers that have managed to go online. So what I would say is that uh, the business uh, level, the, uh, the name of the game at the moment is still uh, building scenarios and getting ready uh, to face uh, the situation as it's unfolding. But at the same time, uh, businesses should be getting ready uh, for the day after. Um, and I believe that uh, what this uh, pandemic um, has led to is, a, is an acceleration of many of the trends that existed uh, before. Uh, the disruption of, of globalization, uh, the uh, transfer of the, the digital revolution, uh, and the uh, emergence of the importance of, of data um, and of uh, intangibles uh, in the economy, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, the, the forces of, of inequality uh, in society. And uh, what, what this uh, economic uh, crisis will uh, leave us with is high levels of debt, even higher uh, than before, and a low interest rate uh, environment. So in this, um, in this um, context, um, uh, businesses should build more sustainable uh, business models uh, aligned uh, with these uh, trends, uh, taking advantage to the greater extent possible of the uh, next generation EU and the EU recovery funding uh, in the spaces of digital and, and the green uh, economy. And this is relevant obviously for new emerging sectors and is relevant also for traditional sectors. And just to make my point more uh, uh, real, I would just uh, mention the real estate sector, a very traditional sector in Cyprus. Just a few days ago, we published our half yearly review and we included their recommendations for the refocus uh, in that sector. For example, uh, focusing on, on demographic trends, um, housing for the elderly, uh, focusing on social trends, affordable housing for young uh, couples and young uh, families, uh, refurbishing and uh, remodeling existing buildings to be aligned with the new demands uh, in terms of the, envir the environment and the, and the green uh, economy, uh, and a, num a number of other um, uh, recommendations, including the, the digitization of the land uh, registry and all the uh, real estate transactions in Cyprus and the creation of a, of a leases uh, registry that will bring a transparency and better allocation of capital uh, for investors. So these uh, reforms and this uh, refocus is applicable uh, for, a, for existing sectors, uh, but also it will facilitate uh, new sectors to, to emerge. And I, I will conclude by saying that uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't miss this opportunity uh, as a country uh, to go down the path of, of reforms. Um, I mean, this is not the time for quick uh, and easy solutions to fix the problems that have been created in the economy by the pandemic. Uh, this is the time to to move in the direction of uh, 
sustainability. Uh, we need public sector uh, reform. We need digital transformation in the public sector that will help uh, alleviate uh, bureaucracy. Uh, we need a greener um, um, economy and, and definitely something that I mentioned in previous years, we need a reform of our educational system and of our justice system. And these are changes that will drive competitiveness, they will drive uh, productivity, they will help existing sectors, but they will also importantly help uh, the creation and the emergence of new uh, economic sectors leading to a more uh, diversified uh, economy. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that uh, you know the uh, the public uh, support to businesses obviously is is welcome, and it was the right thing to do. Uh, but going forward, it needs to be focused. It needs to be uh, you know specific and uh, you know driven to specific um, uh, sectors. Um, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that as a country, uh, we need to, to, to maintain our investment grade uh, rating uh, going forward for a number of reasons, including uh, safeguarding the, uh, the banking sector, uh, which is important for the economy. So once again, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, Evgenios. Um, and finally, uh, Karis Boangari, the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Bank of Cyprus. We've had some comments on banks already from uh, from Klaus and others, so perhaps you could uh, offer us your thoughts. Thank you, Pete, and thank you for the economists for uh, this kind invitation. Uh, COVID-19 crisis finds Cyprus in its effort to come out of the banking crisis back in 2013, but things today are, uh, are completely different. Indicatively, uh, let me say and point out that the private debt consisting of loans to residents, non-financial corporations, and households, representing actually the productive lending in the domestic economy, amounts to 23.5 billion, or 113% uh, of GDP, uh, whereas these numbers back in 2013 were double. Okay, but uh, this is a good message. But there are still challenges, and we will have to raise up to them. COVID-19 will continue to be a problem in 2021. It is a health matter for most, but it also causes economic disruption when lockdowns and social distancing are imposed as necessary to contain the virus. At the same time, the global economy and ours with it is undergoing significant structural change. This structural change has to do with the transition to a digital economy and also to a green economy. There are so uh, two different themes going forward. First theme for the banks is finding the right balance, offering credit relief with financial responsibility. COVID-19 continues to disrupt and challenge economic activity. The banking system needs to play a leading role to help steady the ship via offering liquidity support to affected industries, SMEs and households to ensure that the restart of the economy emerges successfully on the other side of the crisis. The banking sector has so far successfully navigated the immediate pressures of COVID-19 pandemic and has acted as a conduit to pass on government support measures to businesses and households. The key is to safeguard the long-term perspectives of the Cyprus economy via supporting sustainable businesses that will be creating the new jobs we need and to restart the economy. The banks need to work closely with the clients to proactively identify where credit relief is needed and offer forbearance solutions where necessary. Moreover, every new viable investment initiative should be supported for the economy to grow. The banking sector can and has the will to support the Cypriot economy to recover. Second theme is that COVID-19 calls for business transformation. It now seems clear that the pandemic crisis has already brought about fundamental challenges that have reshaped consumer behavior for good. It also accelerated economic processes that were there before COVID. Businesses need to urgently reassess and rethink their operating models via embedding digital throughout their whole value chain and identifying the optimal way to capture the ever-changing customer needs in this new high-tech era. The depth of the economic crisis and the change in consumer behavior urges business to be flexible and agile in order to adapt 
to the new norm of continued disruption and uncertainty. This will enable enterprises to serve customers better through the right channels with relevant and dynamic products. In establishing a new growth model, companies will be faced with a gap in the right skills of the human capital. Businesses need to invest in the education and training of their personnel. The banking sector is not immune to those changes and it is in itself in a transformation brink. The use of internet and mobile banking has increased substantially during this crisis and this trend is set to continue. The COVID-19 crisis has squeezed what might have been several more years of progression into digital channels migration into the space of new months. Customer needs are changing. Good customer service means frictionless transactions, secure, fast, and automated. Nonetheless, the aim of financial services will remain the same, to support customers at the key moments of life. I sum up in four words that should guide us through as the COVID-19 crisis unfolds. Protect and recover, but also refocus and rethink. Our actions today will determine how we emerge from the crisis into the new norm that lights again. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Um, can I fire a question at you because it arose out of something that Klaus said. Do you accept that banks need to do more to reduce non-performing loans? Of course. Of course, we have to do more. Uh, we are uh, in a journey to single digit not performing loans, uh, every bank. Uh, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, we will be successful the next couple of years. Um, and actually, this question came up from the audience too. Um, uh, Andreas Stiliano would like to hear from um, Klaus, Geron, and Harris. Do you think that there is scope for, um, he calls it a European bad bank, which could take on or help with the burden of non-performing loans um, across Europe? Perhaps, perhaps I could start with Klaus. Yes, this is um, a proposal that has been around for some time. Andrea and Ria, the, um, um, the head of the SSM, um, made that proposal two, three years ago already, and he repeated it recently. But um, it seems, in my view, fairly unrealistic to um, expect a European solution. The situation in different European countries is just too different. Um, we, we saw um, two weeks ago the report from the European Commission, the SRB um, and the ECB on risk reduction in the European banks. And we know that only two countries are still above the um, the normal threshold that is considered to be satisfactory, 5% um, uh, in gross um, NPLs and 2.5% in net NPLs. There are two countries clearly above that, Greece and Cyprus. Um, all the other countries are below, below these thresholds and several are significantly below. So to have now one European institution to deal with all of that is probably not very efficient. Andrea Henry has also proposed as an alternative a network of European AMCs, of national EMCs, so a European network of national AMCs. I think that is more realistic, that might be possible. Um, but I think the progress we have seen um, until early this year, before the pandemic hit us unexpectedly, shows that progress is possible. Cyprus is one example. I mentioned the numbers. Um, reducing the NPLs in Cyprus from 25 billion to 5 billion euro within five years um, is a very remarkable progress, but it's not the end of the road. Um, so without the pandemic, I have no doubt it would have continued. Um, now we have to reassess what it means um, um, that NPLs go up again in all countries. They will go up in all countries, um, but unfortunately in Cyprus and Greece, it comes on top of a level that's still very high. Thank you. Um, Jerome, I'll put the same question to you then on the European bad bank. Um, I think very often the debate is about, is this a risk that should be carried at a European level collectively or should it be done national? And I think it's really the wrong debate. So um, I would say, is this a risk that is a private risk or is it a risk that should be or should become a public risk? 
Uh, and I think we've had some experiences with bad banks or uh, dif of different shapes and kinds. And in each example, we've pretty specifically tried to manage what part of the risks will go to, let's say, government uh, and require public guarantees or public uh, funds, and what part of the risks can far better be managed by private players and are, in fact, uh, private uh, risks to be managed. So my reluctance is that we shouldn't too quickly, too easily say all these private risks that are still around should now become a public risk and should be managed by public players. I think I know a fair few taxpayers that would not be very happy and enthusiastic about this. I think there are people who often say risk reduction should come before risk sharing. Um, well, that's a, that's a different argument, but my argument is rather that we should be careful. I think we've learned this from the banking crisis. We should not always immediately say, well, this is a, a private risk. It's been around too long. It's becoming very you know, difficult to manage. Why don't we shift it to the government? Why don't we make it a public issue? And then the, the private players can move on. Um, the electorate in a number of countries has not responded well to these uh, ideas. Harris, Georgiadis, do you, what do you think about NPLs? Well, a bad bank is not a magic wand, and um, I mean, let me try to, um, to 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 I mean to put what the Arun was saying with even simpler terms. Who pays? Who pays the bill? So uh, no bad bank comes um, uh, for free. Uh, there is a significant. Um, uh, there's a significant cost to carving out bad loans for the, from the banks. So uh, question number one is whether this money should be public or private. Question number two relating to an EU, a, a, an EU bad bank, um, if it's public money, uh, is it, is, is it um, member state money or is it some kind of uh, uh, undetermined EU funds, which will uh, fund the EU bad bank. Uh, I, I do not think there, th this is um, um, an, an easy debate, uh, and I would agree with Vierun. Uh, I mean, speaking for, from our side, we have already spent a lot of taxpayers' money to, um, to uh, 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 to clean our banking sector and uh, a significant part of this huge reduction, 25 billion to five, as Klaus has mentioned, has come at the cost to the taxpayer. So I would personally be reluctant to spend uh, uh, even a euro more uh, on, uh, of public money on, um, um, on, on, on cleaning the balance sheets of the banks. It should, uh, this should be um, a banking, uh, banking operation, um, privately funded, and uh, public money should come only uh, when it is absolutely necessary and when uh, financial stability uh, and uh, the stability of an economy um, is at the risk. So this is the crucial question, who pays the bill, uh, basically, and I would much rather see progress on completing the banking union, as Yerun has mentioned, uh, even completing the VETIS, the European Deposit Insurance Scheme. This, this will create a, uh, the foundations for a much healthier banking sector, uh, shifting the discussion in this direction, how we ensure that we do not have a, rep a repetition of the problems of the past, rather than trying to find, um, uh, to have a discussion on how to um, uh, fix um, legacy problems or new problems which should not be allowed to escalate in the first place. Thank you, I'm very clear. And, and Yeron, can I just ask you one more question about um, European fiscal capacity. Um, I'm not trying to draw a difference between what you said and what um, Klaus said, but you seem to be suggesting at one point um, a slightly more um, regular budgetary fund with some input from the European Parliament. Klaus, I think, thinks it's just it was a temporary measure. 
that it is a model, but it's not something you need to have every year. This is not this is not the sort of thing that that that, that would go forward. You seem to think maybe it was something that we need in the longer term. Am I right? Well, um, I, I, I don't think there's a difference with what Klaus said. Klaus described very precisely what has been agreed, uh, and he's right. Uh, but um, in my understanding, we have crossed a historical bridge. And the historical bridge is that the European Commission has now been given the mandate to uh, go to capital markets, uh, to create a Europe, European debt uh, at the level of the EU, and to be able to spend that, indeed, on a temporary basis um, uh, for the recovery fund. Uh, and also, uh, there is an opening to create European taxes, which, as you know, certainly also in my country, was always heavily disputed. Europe should not introduce new European taxes. It's absolutely unnecessary and unwanted. And these two big uh, issues, well, I I'm not saying they're all gone, uh, but we've gone across this historical bridge. And therefore, uh, I hope and also predict a little bit that we won't go back across the bridge. Um, we need to find, it's been debated for a long time, tools also to stabilize our economy within the Eurozone. Um, we need to also to get rid of this taboo on the issue of transfer union. We already have a transfer union and it will be inevitable in any monetary union to have to some level, sometimes temporarily in different directions, transfers. Um, so now that we've gone across this historic bridge, perhaps we can free our minds and have a debate about this stabilization mechanism. Uh, and there are different shapes and kinds to think about, but uh, I'm not sure whether you have the time for that now, John. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. But it doesn't sound quite like what, what we journalists like to call the Hamiltonian moment. Not, uh, not quite yet. Um, Evgenios, as a sort of outside observer, what do you think about the moves towards the recovery fund and a bigger, bigger fiscal capacity at European level? Well, I mean, I believe that it's uh, it's definitely uh, something in the right uh, direction in the sense that it provides um, uh, common funding across the European Union, but at the same time drives uh, reforms, uh, particularly in two areas that are key uh, for driving uh, competitiveness and relevance within the European Union. You know, the digital agenda, the green uh, economy agenda, uh, and also very, very important and relevant for Cyprus. But I would say that... Uh, uh, although I would agree with what was said uh, earlier, that the European Union is sort of responding um, faster and maybe more appropriately to this, uh, to this crisis uh, than the financial crisis, maybe because in this, in this crisis there is, it's not easy to blame someone. You know, it's uh, something that happened and it affects everyone. And therefore, it's easier uh, for uh, European member states to come together and find solutions. Uh, so although as Europeans we're doing better than, uh, than before, I think we should move uh, faster uh, and we should uh, with a greater sort of uh, um, uh, focus and intent in terms of, of the outcomes. Um, because the trends that existed before, and I have mentioned them earlier, you know, the, uh, the issues around inequality, the, uh, the, the rolling back of, of globalization are there, and those uh, give rise, obviously, to, um, uh, to, uh, to populism and to, and to other sort of ideas that are, are driving the European Union member states apart rather than together. So I think, I think this is a great opportunity for the European Union to, to come together and to also drive a reform agenda that will make the Union more relevant for its citizens in terms of uh, competitiveness and job uh, creation. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, can I, can I add something yes, to that? Please do. Um, I think one has to be really careful comparing this crisis with what happened 10 years ago. It's different. It's a different crisis. And it's a different crisis, as FG Neo said. And it's not surprising to, to some extent why it took longer, um, eight or 10 years ago. And Jeroen was for a long time chairman of the Eurogroup when it happened, um, because it was in a way more difficult. The mm -hmm. crisis now may be even more serious in terms of damage to the economy and to the, to, to, to the people. Um, but 10 years ago, um, the origin of the crisis was very clearly in 
in wrong economic developments during a decade before the crisis hit. The countries that needed money from the ESM had all lost competitiveness. Mm. Um, the data are absolutely clear. They had huge current account and trade deficits. They had lost competitiveness. Therefore, um, and fiscal deficits were very large. And therefore, um, adjustment had to be done. And that is very painful and had to be negotiated. And every country was a bit different. Um, that takes much more time. And it's not easy for the people to, to go through that. Now we were hit by an external shock. Nobody is to be blamed for that, as was said before. No need to correct wrong economic developments or to correct wrong policies. Um, it was just a question, not simple, but still easier to decide how to respond together to this crisis. And I think we have done a good job in Europe on this, but that it was possible to do it faster, for me, is not surprising. Yeah. No, I think that's that's quite clear. And can I? We we are we don't have we only have another two or three minutes. But I'd like to ask both you, Klaus and Jeroen. You talked about progress towards completing capital markets union and other changes in the future. Um, this is perhaps I ask this question because of where I'm sitting. Does it worry you at all in that context about losing London? London is the centre of financial expertise in Europe, but it's no longer going to be there. Not for you. <laughs> I'm, Jared, I'm, glad, I'm glad you added those few words. <laughs> uh, you got me worried for a moment. <laughs> no, no, I don't. Well, let's assume that just before things go wrong, there will be a deal. Okay. And I think that would also be very useful to maintain uh, a close relationship in terms of financial markets and the role of London. I think it will be inevitable, certainly in the near future. Um, uh, lots of companies that are crucial in this in the city have, of course, already opened up offices or front offices uh, in different capitals of Europe. So no, I'm not extremely worried uh, here, um, but it doesn't. Uh, uh, perhaps the only thing is that if people are worried about it, it should increase their urgency to work on these, this project of the Capital Markets Union. If you feel that Europe should be better developed in terms of uh, capital markets, deeper, broader, well-supervised, integrated, uh, then Brexit perhaps is another additional argument for it. That's interesting. Klaus, do you have a view on that? Well, I agree with that, definitely. And I'm not really worried that we will miss London so much. Um, for one, we can still do business with London. We do, be, do business from the Euro area with New York, with Singapore. So we will also do it with, with um, London. There might be a transition phase where a few things are a bit more difficult. But as Jeroen said, all the big London banks have subsidiaries in the Euro area. Some had always them now have some have created them newly in response to Brexit. I see it myself from the ESM. Um, we have shifted all our business that we had with London banks to their subsidiaries in Paris, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, Dublin, um, and so on. So I don't really see a problem. I'm not concerned about that. I'm really more worried about what's happening to the real economy in the United Kingdom, a little bit also on the continent but and an island, but mainly in the United Kingdom. Um, I think that's where the problems will be much more serious. Of course, some people will also lose their job when they work in the financial sector in London, um, but many of them have already moved to the continent. Yes, well, some of us share your worries about what might happen after the 1st of January, so let's hope there'll be a deal. Um, well, I think we're out of time, so I'd like to thank um, all of you for a very interesting discussion, um, a very rewarding, um, and I'm sorry we are not meeting in person, but perhaps next year we can be back in Nicosia in, in November again. Thank you very much, Klaus, Jerome, Harris, um, Evgenios and Charis. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.
welcome back to um, the next panel in our summit, the 16th Cyprus Summit, which we are doing virtually, The Economist, um, because of COVID-19. We have just been talking about the um, economic and financial prospects for Europe and Cyprus, and now we're going to talk more in depth about testing the strength of the financial sector with um, Michalis Atanasiu, the Executive Director for Global Corporate Banking and Markets from the Bank of Cyprus. We've just heard from one of your colleagues um, uh, in the previous panel. Atanasios Bambakidis um, uh, from the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Christina Torella from Fitch Ratings. And Michael Karalambidis from EcomBX. Yes. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Um, thank Even you. Virtually. Um, are the banking systems in a position to contain the recession and boost recovery, reducing non-performing loans? Cyprus, is there a risk of a new bank crisis? And how is the new normal accelerating the fintech revolution? Um, I think if each, of you, each of you is going to speak for something like four to five minutes, and then we'll have some discussion. So let me start then with um, Michalis Atanasiu from Bank of Cyprus. Thank you, John. Thank you to The Economist. Uh, a very warm welcome to, our, to my fellow panelists and, of course, all the people listening this afternoon. Some very interesting questions. I will try and go through them uh, as quickly as possible. Are the banking systems in a position to contain the recession and boost the economy? Well, I guess, John, this depends actually on who you ask. If you ask a banker, I guess the banker will be a little bit more positive. If you ask a regulator, the regulator will refer you to his actions and his rule books. And if you ask an investor, I guess, he will start looking at whether new MPs will start emerging or whether there are any other inefficiencies in the system. We have to admit that banking systems are inherently fragile because, especially under a crisis, because they are leveraged institutions. But uh, my current assessment is that the secret banking system is entering this crisis in a considerably more robust position. And I will give you a few reasons for this. First of all, the capital levels are at very high historical levels. The BOC's Q2C T1 level, for example, was at 14.3%. The banking leverage within Cyprus is very low. There is ample liquidity. We are at the final stages of dealing with RMPs. There is extensive management experience in dealing with crisis. And I have to admit that we have seen swift supervisory action, we have seen regulatory flexibility, and we have seen very quick action and targeted action by the government. So all these, I think, point towards a banking system that can support the economy and the recovery. There is this talk about mainstream and alternative ways to finance the recovery. There is a very nice phrase by the Vice Chairman of, for Supervision of the Federal Reserve, who referred to the actions to support the economy by the Federal Reserve as a kaleidoscopic gallimaufry of actions, which in plain English means that their actions are changed frequently and have a heterogeneous mixture. And of course, he called them like that because this is the reason to finance a recovery implies that our economy needs to find the best medium to ensure that credit and finance flows in the economy to support recovery. Now, what have we seen so far in this crisis? We have seen banks continuing to lend. We have seen banks granting forbearance and continuing to grant forbearance with cut to their customers. We have seen actions by the central banks, the ECB, the Federal Reserve, to ensure that there is a smooth sovereign market, debt market in, in Europe and in the US. And of course, we have seen action by our local government. So it doesn't really matter how you call them mainframe or alternative ways. The fact remains that those measures need to be there need to be there when they are needed, quickly, and if there are secondary effects, of course, they have to be dealt later. NPs, are they crucial more than ever? Well, when you're talking about NPs to a Cypriot institution, obviously, uh, it's, it's our everyday life. We started from post-2013 crisis with 65% NPs in our balance sheet, and we have worked very hard the last seven years to actually bring them down and actually enter this crisis at the final stages of, of our recovery. Now, why is it important? It's important for two main reasons to get rid of MPs. The first is that you free capital that you can actually use for the new problems you might have because of COVID-19. 
And the other very important reason is because you also have human capital that is dealing with these legacy MPs and the quickest you get rid of them, the quickest you will deploy these human resources to actually deal with any new issues that you might have from this crisis. Is there a risk for a new bank crisis? Well, dealing with COVID-19, I would call it uh, a known unknown for the industry. The known part is that we know its problems. We probably know quite well how to deal with them. The unknown component, of course, is that we don't know the duration and we don't know if it will leave any secondary effects or any permanent damage into the economy. At BOC, we make sure that, you know, we have the necessary products, the necessary policies, the necessary determination in place to deal with any new problems that we might face. And although a bank crisis can never really be excluded, we are pretty comfortable where we're sitting as an institution. A couple of words on the new normal and the fintech revolution. Obviously, the new normal following a crisis uh, points towards acceleration of digitization and the embracing of new technologies. This is experienced uh, by both companies, societies, consumers. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the statistics of technology, fintech, uh, banking disruption, because we all know them more or less. In my mind, for banks, we need to embrace change and ride the wave of the fintech revolution. There are many ways to do that, but definitely as an industry, we need to become more agile. We need to either partner, create, or do a common strategy with a fintech if possible. Definitely, we need to flatten the structure. And as McKinsey has so nicely put it, in this new normal, we need to learn how to learn. Thank you, John. Thank you for covering all of our questions quite um, briskly. Um, now I give the floor to Atanasius Vamfakidis from uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Managing Director and Head of G10 Foreign Exchange Tra Strategy for five minutes, Mr. Vamfakidis. Thank you. Uh, thank you also for the invitation to participate in this really interesting uh, event. Uh, I will focus primarily on the state of the global financial sector uh, today how the sector is dealing with this uh, crisis, uh, what are the risks, and uh, whether the sector can support the recovery looking forward. Starting with the overall uh, market performance this year, um, actually this has been a great year for markets. Uh, surprising, the year in which the global economy has the most severe recession since um, the Great Depression, much worse than during the global financial crisis, stocks, Global stocks today are at all times highs. Um, US, many other countries, global indexes. Uh, if you were to look at stocks and uh, somehow you didn't know what was going on in the real economy, you could tell there was something that went wrong in March and since then uh, they have been booming. So what is going on? I mean, how can we explain this? Definitely the fact that stock markets are doing well, risk assets are performing, um, is something good for the financial sector. But there is a problem when the uh, asset prices do not reflect the state of uh, the global economy. And although we expect a recovery of the real economy next year, given that it seems very likely we're going to have a vaccine soon, our concern right now is that not only the market has already priced this positive scenario, but actually it might have overshot. So one of the risks uh, in the sector looking forward is actually that for next year, we may have a scenario in which the real economy is recovering, but the outlook for uh, asset prices is actually uh, challenging. Now the financial sector itself uh, is dealing with uh, uh, the current crisis uh, relatively well. It helps that the financial sector was not the reason for uh, the crisis uh, this time. Also, the starting point was strong. Uh, in recent years, following the global financial crisis, uh, the financial sector uh, really uh, put itself together. Prudential um, regulations, uh, better organization, um, dealing with uh, improving asset quality. Of course, there were some uh, pockets of weakness, but compared to previous crises, the financial sector was uh, in a much uh, stronger uh, position. 
Also, although the recession uh, is uh, uh, deep and uh, widespread, not all sectors are doing badly. Uh, there are some sectors that actually benefit uh, from uh, this lockdown, uh, and these sectors uh, have been growing and are also offsetting some of the negative impact. The policy support has been massive. Uh, we had monetary policy uh, loosening and unconventional monetary policies, not just in advanced economies, but even in emerging markets. I could have never imagined emerging markets, um, central banks and emerging markets will be doing QE. Fiscal policy, uh, very responsive across the board. The average fiscal stimulus in advanced economies has been in double digits. At the same time, the banks uh, in particularly have acted responsibly. They have increased provisions substantially to deal with future deterioration uh, in asset uh, quality. They've also tightened credit standards, which up to an extent you can argue, wait a minute, should they do that? Actually, we need them to give more credit to the economy. But from the bank's point of view, that was the prudent thing uh, to do. And investment banks in particular uh, had a good year because we had market volatility. Uh, investment banks, uh, trading, they need market volatility. Fixed income in particular, which is much my sector, uh, has seen uh, a substantial increase in activities, more trading, and it has been good volatility because, again, uh, we have seen improving asset prices. So regardless of the recession in the economy, increasing asset prices and market volatility has been good uh, for the fixed income sector. Having said all, having said all that, uh, there are still substantial risks. After all, the shock continues. Uh, we are actually in the second wave, in the middle of the second wave of the pandemic. The recovery is likely to be weak. Even if we have a vaccine, to be able to go back to normal, we need actually to have a critical mass of people vaccinated. Actually, we expect that in a positive uh, kind of scenario, we are going to see a more sustained recovery in the second half of next year. And even by the end of next year, global output will remain well below pre-COVID levels. We will reach end 2019 levels of production in 2022 or even 2023. And compared to pre-crisis trends, we are going to have a permanent output loss. Uh, there is also likely a permanent damage in the economy. Uh, it is not clear which companies are viable, uh, companies that have been directly affected by the COVID restrictions, which sectors might need to shrink permanently. This is something that we're going to see in the years ahead. Up to an extent, the strong policy support has covered problems that will come to the fore in the years ahead and again are likely to affect uh, the banking sector. Also, zero interest rates is bad for bank profitability. Uh, actually, when you look at bank stock prices, they have recovered since the dip in March, but they are still well below uh, levels for the year as a whole. And definitely bank, sto bank stocks can perform much worse than uh, in most other sectors. And more broadly, the outlook in the years ahead is uncertain. This crisis has led to a sharp increase in debt levels across the board in advanced economies by as high as 30 percentage points of GDP higher, in some cases from already very high levels. And the over-reliance of the market on central bank support is a huge problem. Although inflation today is very low, we cannot argue that it will remain low during the recovery or in the years ahead. And at some point, if we see inflation, some inflation might be good if the debt is high, but inflation tends to be nonlinear and the, it will weaken the central bank policy support. So bottom line of all this, the banks are fine. The markets actually are more than fine. Actually, they might have overshot. But in order for the banking sector and the financial sector more broadly to support uh, the recovery ahead, it's a little bit a chicken and egg thing. Sometimes banks say to extend credit, we need growth, but to get growth, you need credit. So the question is how we can have the appropriate macroeconomic policies to create a positive feedback loop between the financial sector and the real economy at a starting point in which they have actually disconnected. So this is the challenge for policymakers in the uh, uh, during the recovery process ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for those um, for those thoughts. Um, now we move on to Christina Torella, um, Senior Director, of Financial Institutions at Fitch Ratings. 
Hello, uh, thank you, John, for inviting Fitch to, to this event. I'm not sure if this is the first time, but uh, we are very pleased to participate uh, here in Cyprus. And also thanks to the audience for joining this session. Uh, I listened to part of the previous session and, and, and as well my colleagues, so probably some of my keynotes uh, will refer uh, to some of the comments, but I will try to give uh, the angle from a rating agency perspective. So um, basically, let me share with you three uh, key headline messages and a concluding remark. I will focus on Southern European banks where I built my experience uh, in the past years. And uh, in particular, I will also focus on uh, Cypriot banks, on our view on Cypriot banks. So on my first message, uh, I would like to convey and share with you is how Southern Eastern European banks uh, enter the crisis. I think certainly uh, the, the, the coronavirus crisis has posed challenges for all European banks with no exception. And we have highlighted this uh, by taking broad negative rating actions across across Europe, uh, uh, particularly in terms of uh, outlook revisions to negative outlooks, but also a few downgrades. In particular, in Southern uh, Europe, uh, we have the vast majority of banks on negative outlook, but we also took uh, uh, some downgrades, uh, especially in Italy after following the, after the downgrade of, of the sovereign rating. And then we also downgraded three banks in Spain, one in Portugal and one in Cyprus, uh, just after the uh, uh, outbreak of the coronavirus crisis. And uh, we also uh, kept most of them on negative outlook and just a few on stable outlook. This is just to give you a sense that really the coronavirus crisis has, has affected all, all banking systems in Europe, so of course, to different degrees, uh, but clearly there are downside risks uh, coming in. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the, the, when it comes to Southern European banks, the starting point is different even within within the, the the banks in this region particularly if we look at the spain spain entered the crisis uh, after having reduced significantly the stock of impaired loans after the real estate crisis in 2011 and 2013 and this of course translated into uh, improved capital levels particularly uh, capital encumbrance to unreserved problem loans uh, because when you look at the capital ratios it is true that spanish banks typically uh, operate at the low end of, uh, of European standards. Then we have Italy and Portugal follow, following suit, albeit la lagging behind Spanish peers, with sector impaired loan ratios standing between 7.6% uh, in the case of Italy and uh, just below 6% in the case of Portugal. And again, in recent years, we've seen banks accelerating the de-risking process, and this uh, has been uh, 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 translating into improved capitalization as well. Now, lastly, when it comes to Greek and Cypriot banks, uh, and I think this has been uh, commented before, the uh, the starting point for these banks is 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 of, is of a weakness in terms of asset quality because their impaired loan ratios uh, are 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 significantly high compared to the European average. In the case of the Greek banks, the sector impaired loan ratio stands uh, at thirty seven percent, whereas in the case of the Cypriot banks, uh, this is around twenty two. Uh, percent. Uh, this uh, places the Greek and Cypriot banks in a vulnerable position in their de-risking uh, uh, strategies, which they started uh, in the past in the past few years and actually were evolving well. But of course, the pandemic has has sort of uh, 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 suspended this process. Now, the positive news, though, is that in the second part of the year, we've seen some some significant deals uh, in Greece and in Cyprus relating to asset disposal, suggesting that there seems to be some investors' appetite for 
Greek and Cypriot distressed assets. Nevertheless, uh, and I think and I agree with some of the comments uh, made before by some speakers, is that uh, uh, banks need to continue in this process of de-risking despite the more difficult operating environment. It's needed uh, and also this ultimately will translate into greater resources, capital relief to be able to on lend to the economy and therefore to support uh, the, the, the recovery. So this is sort of the first message, how, how the banks enter the crisis. So uh, in my second message, I would like to share what should be watching, what should be we, what should we be watching uh, uh, going forward? Um, I think, uh, and we've commented, I mean, the vaccine and, and progress in, in, in getting a reliable vaccine clearly can dramatically change the macroeconomic uh, prospects and, and therefore uh, banks' future performance. But uh, in our opinion, there remain uh, still uh, significant downside risks. So what should we be watching? First, uh, I mean, whether the recovery is softer and longer, either because uh, the second wave of contagion gets extended. Now we are experiencing this unfortunate uh, situation in many European countries. So we need to see what consequences derive from this, from this, uh, uh, both on the economy, but also uh, on the on the potential uh, asset quality issues. Uh, or either because uh, the agent's behavior patterns change. And I'm sure, I mean, uh, uh, we can speak about how digitalization can, can, can change these patterns. Now, the second point uh, we should be watching is, uh, I mean, uh, all Southern European uh, countries are net recipients of the EU recovery fund. But the but the timing of these uh, of these funds and the allocation are, are are key for the recovery. So it's something we should be watching. And thirdly, um, uh, the we should be watching, especially in in southern uh, European countries, uh, what are the effects of the removal of the different support mechanisms, both from the government or either private private support schemes, especially because uh, these economies, uh, to different degrees, have made large use of these support schemes. For example, uh, Portugal, Greece, and, and Cyprus in particular have, have used uh, the loan moratoria qu quite significantly. For example, Portugal, the percentage of loan moratoria accounts for 20% of loans, whereas in Greece, it's the same figure, but in relation to performing loans, and in Cyprus, uh, this figure uh, uh, increases to, to a roughly half percent of the performing loans. It's, it's worth saying, though, that the criteria uh, uh, for the application in Cyprus uh, were practically non-existent, and probably this explains why the usage has been much higher. Uh, just to give you some reference, in the case of Italy, the loan moratoria uh, was about 18% of, of loans, whereas in Spain we have a dual system where uh, the loan moratoria, strictly speaking, was 8% of total loans, but then you have a pack of state guarantees that if you add up, uh, you come up with a similar amount of, let's say, support uh, usage than, 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 than Italy. So we need to keep an eye on uh, what happens after uh, the removal of, uh, of the moratoria. So, uh, so ending with the yeah. Are you finishing? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, lastly, and just uh, to finish with our views on the Cypriot the banking sector, uh, just to, to give uh, our views on uh, the recent actions, we uh, just uh, after the coronavirus crisis, we downgraded uh, Hellenic Bank to uh, B, and we revised the outlook of Bancos Fibrus of, of to B minus, uh, I to, to negative, both remain on negative outlook. And basically, uh, the ratings highlight asset quality weaknesses, uh, constraints in generated capital internally, capital encumbrance to and reserve problem assets being very high. And therefore, uh, uh, in order to, to assess uh, our outlook uh, in the coming, say, 12 to 18 months, uh, a key priority for us will be how they tackle the asset 
politicians in combination how they uh, relieve uh, pressure uh, on capital. And one final remark uh, is, uh, and I think it's, it's been commented by some of the uh, speakers, uh, how important digitalization can be to remain competitive in the in, in future. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive um, and uh, very interesting. Uh, Michael, digitalization and the future of fintech. Yes. Hi, thank you. Thank you, John, for uh, giving me the last word. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, so um, th there's a lot of um, um, uh, explanations on how everything has progressed during the last years. I mean, we've been listening to uh, the words like uh, revolution or disruption. Uh, or even correction of the banking system or any economic system that is currently uh, being uh, in place. But we have been talking about disrupt disruption for the past uh, five years, at least, I would say, in terms of the fintech industry. Well, today our view is, uh, at least uh, based on how we see it on the global expansion of how um, the market is changing, I think we're at the uh, crossroads of rather a new evolutionary branch. So we're talking more about evolution rather than disruption. This uh, evolution, as always, it has um, a lot of uh, pain and a lot of um, uh, changes happening in the scenery. And in, in our case, I would say that um, the evolution is a result of a situation where you need to have specialization. So in this uh, fintech or digital era that we live in, um, digitalization and technology is actually a crucial role in creating a new plethora of services and solutions for the market. So um, in, uh, in the European Union, we have been seeing this uh, as a trend for the past five years, and we've been trying to make sense out of it and what the banks will play as a role into this system. Um, we have seen that most of the banks, at least in the in, uh, Southeast uh, European Union, we have seen that most of them, they suffer from the same uh, problems, which is mostly NPLs, I would say, in terms of uh, the products offered out in the market and in terms of services being offered. In, uh, in, uh, in our case, I think now that we're going to see a new way of how the banks should be operating in the market, we do see a defragmentation and an integration of different banks happening. Uh, we do see acquisitions between banks and uh, a shrinking of the existing banking system. This does not mean that the banks will be less because as the SSM has already um, allowed out in the market is a new uh, rules in order to establish neo banks, challenger, challenger banks, fintech banks. I mean, there, there's different unofficial titles to it. At the end of the day is again a banking license. Uh, this will allow a spring of new solutions and new participants with specialization into the market. Um, and this is what we're anticipating in seeing. Now, how we, we see the future, at least what the correct way of this evolution of the, of the future would be? Well, basically the banks should be specializing, at least the way we see it, the traditional banks uh, being carrying, with, uh, carrying along with them a big legacy and knowledge of the market. They should be specializing on upstream, upstream level of solutions into the fintech and banking industry. So I would say that uh, as my co-panelist uh, Michalis has said uh, very correctly, um, the banks would start and we should be seeing them to start work very closely with fintech companies. Whether these fintech companies are actually challenger banks, which I again insist it's wrong terminology because they, they are not challenging banks. What the new fintech participants licensed in the European Union are doing, they are offering specialized solutions. I mean, we're living in a world where specialization is critical in order to create a very complex engine of how things should be working. I mean, we live in, a, in an era where traditional eating is no longer valid. I mean, we have vegans out there, we have pescarians, we have vegetarians. Yeah, I mean, there's so many titles of specialization in eating that imagine how much complex it becomes when it comes to the traditional banking system. So the new fintechs, participants of the markets will be offering on a lower scale solutions that will allow the absorption of existing HR pool, which is now available in the market. Because we have seen during, I mean, during these times, we have seen an increase in unemployment. In Cyprus, unfortunately, we're a sea uh, battered island. We, we have seen uh, both uh, the pandemic, we have seen economic recession. I mean, hell, we have even seen uh, political, um, uh, I would say, uh, political plague hitting us. But that does not necessarily define us. And that when it comes 
when it comes to the Cyprus level, at least on on uh, on uh, my evaluations and how I see things. I mean, Cyprus is a country that uh, has been battered throughout the years and has been through tough ages, but it has always prevailed because of different solutions and because of the system that has been built based on the common law, based on the legacy that it has. There is a, a international corporate taxation system that allows tax planning. There is um, a close relationship with Greece that will allow the industry to reopen and prosper again in the European Union. But how this will happen and how this should happen? Well, I would say it's based on three pillars. One of them should be on regulatory or the regulators to have more flexibility and adopt new uh, harmonizations coming from the European Union and allow domestic players to use these technologies and means. The second one, I would say it's the stakeholders or the lobby groups in the industry. The fintechs with the existing players in the banking industry, which are going to kickstart again the economy, should be playing together in order to set the level, leveling the playing field as per the PSD2. And on the third level, I would say the third part is the industry players in terms of specialization. We should understand that the traditional banks are going to be offering upstream services to new participants, whether that's fintechs, EMIs, payment institutions, forexes, neobanks, they will be offering upstream services. Where, what do I mean by upstream services? That means anything from liquidity to hedging to payment channels, routing, um, investment banking, but a bank, I, the way we see it at least, a bank cannot do everything. Banks should be specializing based on what they have on their history, legacy and know-how and above all, technological advances to be able to offer this capacity. That's so cool. having- That's great. Take, and I'm finishing here and having right. and taking all of, all of uh, these uh, three pillars off, I would say that the way in order to actually take the market forward, uh, we should be looking at the banks uh, which are now shedding a lot of personnel into the market and I mean, they're increasing to the existing unemployment uh, percentages. We should be seeing sponsoring educational programs to allow existing bankers to educate themselves in technology, in different uh, advances of the economy, so that they will be able to be absorbed into new companies throughout the European Union, which is something that might eventually bring back Jean Monnet's dream in uh, mobility of, uh, of the European citizens across Europe in order to cross-pollinate the knowledge from one country to another. Thank, thank, thank you, Michael, that was great. And it's nice to hear about an optimistic future. Mm -hmm. uh, we only have about five to six minutes left. So I'm just gonna pose two questions that have come from the audience. One is to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Atanasiu on bad banks. We've had the question which we had in the previous, sorry, bad uh, non-performing loans. In the previous panel, we had a similar question, but he was asked by, um, by again, by one of our panelists. We have a question from Ioannis Kirkidis and also again from um, Andrea Stiliano. Does the problem of NPLs need public, a public role? Do you, do you think we need a bad bank? Do you think we need a European bad bank? Or do you think we need more help from the government to reduce bad um, NPLs? Or do you think the banks can do it on their own? Okay, that's not, an, that's not a straightforward answer to that, but I would say that uh, judging from our journey, uh, I think that uh, there is a lot of merit to argue that uh, the banks can actually deliver reduction in MPs, meaningful reduction in MPs, uh, on their own. Okay. However, if I would go back in time in 2013 when we were starting this journey, and we had to face a mountain of, of issues, I would say that if you find yourself in a situation where there is such a huge problem, definitely public, some sort of public intervention is definitely helpful. Because if you don't have it at the beginning and if you don't have it in, in a transparent and helpful way, then the effort of the institution that is facing the issue will actually be, be harder and it will take longer. And this is the experience that we had to go through in the last seven years. So the answer is somewhere in the middle. Yes, you do need perhaps some sort of public intervention if there is a big issue, but I think you should allow the private sector to also operate. And if there are private solutions that can be found, where institutions can dispose assets, then you should allow that as well. 
Very clear. We, we remember Likey Bank back in 2013. So yes, indeed. Um, and the other question was to Mr. Van Fakidis, I think. It's about the, the, the euphoria of the stock markets. Um, Savas Constantinou one worries that it's caused by excessive and cheap liquidity, and investors are looking for returns in high-risk asset classes, and particularly in technology stocks. I mean, you've said something about this before, but are, are you worried about the excess cheap liquidity driving asset prices and making them unrealistic? I agree that to a large extent it is the central banks to uh, blame. We have uh, uh, reached a point in which bad news is good news because we will have more central bank support. And whenever we have good news, the market get con gets concerned that central banks will tighten policies and the central banks say, don't worry, despite that, we'll keep interest rates low and we'll keep uh, uh, pumping liquidity in the system. So I think the central banks uh, overdid it. And this, to a large extent, explains why markets today do not reflect uh, the real economy. Mm -hmm. Now, to a large extent, central banks were able to do this because of low inflation. Low inflation is not a good thing, but it has allowed the central banks to act irresponsibly. But the problem, as I said earlier, is that once you get inflation, everything breaks. Because mm -hmm. even if central banks are willing to overshoot at the inflation target, this policy put of the central banks will be much weaker. Yeah, that's very convincing. I think a, a world of zero interest rates is not a, not always an easy, easy, easy world. And you, you, you yourself said it's not very good for bank profit. Um, and let me just finish with one final question to Michael um, um, on fintech in general. Um, my impression, as somebody who doesn't really understand it, is that China is way ahead of Europe. Um, is that a? Do you, do you agree with that? And do you think that's a problem for Europe? Well, um, yes, actually, China is always, I mean, Asia, I would say overall, is always ahead of the game when it comes to technology. Eh? And uh, one of the main reasons is uh, because of the fully digitalization that is happening in the governments and in the systems uh, and integration of different solutions. So an, an omni-channel solution or an integration of holistic solutions under one roof does allow people to easily access different technologies, while also the domestic knowledge in, in terms of verification of documents, KYC, biometrics, physical person, and any other programming that is out there in the market is actually more intrusive when it comes to individuals' life and different legal entities So, to, in order to verify them. This is actually something that kind of was a bit of a setback in the, um, on the global market and mostly in the European Union in terms of technology with the stricter introduction of the GDPR. So it is something that is actually GDPR, though it's very productive and very good, it is something that is keeping technology a bit at bay. And the reason is because it needs to adjust based on the criteria and qualifications of a lot of technology that is intrusive based on day-to-day -day lives. Something which in Asia, it's much more different. It's a whole different ballgame. So we need to worry a little about the future. And then my final question was to Christina. Um, I wonder if you worry, as, as somebody from Fitch, from, from ratings, about the reputation of ratings agencies. Ratings agencies are often have often been attacked over the last 10 years. Is that is that something that concerns you? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, we, we at least at Fitch uh, have... Uh, uh, taken uh, actions i mean and we learned also from the from the previous crisis we've been quite uh, responsive to the to the uh, effects of the coronavirus crisis in the different asset classes and uh, we ourselves i mean uh, keep keep monitoring all the all the situations so i mean uh, to answer your question i think uh, we are happy with with the way we do things, and we are also ourselves being being uh, scrutinized by the different stakeholders, not only market participants but also regulators. So, uh, I, th I think we at least highlighted where the risks are. And you have competitors. Very good. Well, that's been very interesting. Thank you very much to all 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 four of Thank you. Thank you. Interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank, Thank you. you. We now move on. We hope next year in, we will be in Nicosia. Waiting for you. Yes. <laughs> Ciao. We now have a break, I think, for 10 minutes.
Uh, welcome back to the, um, we're near the concluding session of the Economist Cyprus Summit, um, which is being conducted virtually. And we're back to discuss hydrocarbons again. We've heard a lot about gas and hydrocarbons and the Eastern Mediterranean already today. Um, and now we discuss it with some energy experts. Um, we're going to have um, Nataza Pilides, the Minister of Energy, Commerce and Industry of Cyprus, and then a, a recorded message from Alessandro Todi, the Under Secretary for Energy in Italy, and then we will have we will hear from Romaric Ronyan um, from Total, Ricard Scufias from Hellenic Hydrocarbon Resources Resources Management, and Konstantinos Filis from the Institute for International Relations in Greece, um, discussing global trends in the energy sector and hydrocarbons exploration in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we start with Nataza Pilides for five or six minutes. You have the floor, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, firstly, allow me to thank uh, the organizers of the Economist 16 Cyprus Summit. It's a shame that, uh, um, that um, it's not done in the usual, very uh, engaging way that we're all used to, but well done on um, uh, nevertheless not giving up and doing it online. I think it's a great opportunity for everyone to get together and uh, continue the conversations that uh, uh, were once considered normal part of doing business and hopefully we'll go back to that um, very, very soon. Um, of course, um, the sector of hydrocarbons has um, not been any less affected than any other um, sector from um, all the negative, I suppose, repercussions of uh, COVID and the different um, complications and that's um, forced I think um, everyone whether it be countries or um, companies or other players within the sector to reconsider and redesign uh, some of the aspects of uh, our strategies. Obviously we've seen uh, that COVID-19 has led to shrinking demand which we face particularly um, sort of shockingly 
um, in the during the first wave of the pandemic, and that's obviously led to um, prices uh, collapsing both in terms of oil and um, the LNG market. And that was the first, um, you know, obvious um, effect of, of of COVID, but also um, the logistical the um, the health risks associated to um, running operations normally has had uh, an effect as well. So, uh, as we all know, we've seen most major projects um, actually um, being postponed. There was a lot of um, cutting of expenditure, and that is definitely something that we are um, uh, having uh, to deal with. And um, uh, those are pretty much the um, the facts that we are uh, faced with. However, um, it's not really all uh, doom and gloom, as I was discussing uh, earlier uh, with um, some of my um, my fellow panelists. Um, I think that uh, you know, looking at the positive side, uh, we are now in a situation where we know how to deal with the pandemic uh, perhaps a little bit better uh, than uh, during the first few months. We have um, applied uh, some of the lessons that we've learned to build systems and to build ways in which we can uh, continue to do business both during the pandemic and of course to prepare for um, the day after. So in the case of Cyprus, uh, our licensees um, have rescheduled their drilling program, as we all know, um, for pretty much the second half of 2021. Uh, but given the restrictions that we still have on movement, uh, you know, closed borders in some cases, difficulty to travel, different measures that apply from airport to airport, um, these projects are becoming increasingly uh, complex. And that's why we are taking... Uh, every opportunity during this period to actually prepare uh, for the exact um, scenarios and ways of dealing um, with um, risks uh, arising from the pandemic. So we have um, developed various scenarios. We're working very closely uh, with um, the companies and we're very lucky actually to have constant uh, communication with, the, with all of them. Uh, and to share uh, mutual concerns and um, uh, various um, and our thoughts on the various matters coming up. Um, and we're confident that we will be able to resume uh, programs in a safe way. Um, we um, are in discussions also with um, Chevron and Noble, who, uh, with regards to the Aphrodite field, um, are also going through um, an important change, uh, which is um, which is of significance actually uh, to Cyprus, and again um, in that situation as well, the interest, uh, thankfully, in uh, the Cyprus EEZ and the East Med also uh, remains um, undiminished. Um, so our plan with regards to Aphrodite uh, for getting the first gas out in 2025. Um, still uh, remains unchanged. That target date still remains despite the various, um, you know, the slight reshuffling that we've had within the actual um, frame uh, sequence of events leading up to it. Um, and um, we're similarly uh, confident and hopeful uh, that the uh, plans that we have with Total and ENI, with ExxonMobil and Qatar Petroleum, will also um, progress in a very, uh, with a very, at a very good pace um, from 2021 uh, onwards. Um, as regards the wider um, discussion that's going on about, um, you know, LNG and whether it's going, whether the prices are going to recover, whether um, talking about LNG at the moment is is, um, is something uh, worthwhile even. I mean, we've heard, you know, a lot of opinions about uh, its interconnection with the Green Deal in the EU or with the wider um, sort of global environment. 
I think that um, firstly, natural gas prices will start to pick up and that is uh, something that we can expect once business uh, goes uh, back to normal. And I also think that LNG is a very, very important pivotal step in our transition towards a cleaner um, energy um, environment uh, globally. And I think that uh, uh, particularly the region uh, that we live in, the East Med, has um, a great potential to um, to utilize LNG in the years and decades to come. Uh, in Cyprus, we're particularly lucky that despite the spending cuts that we've seen, uh, we have um, commitment from our uh, the companies operating within our EZ to continue, and that is something that we value very, very much, and um, and we we thank them for that, and we hope. Um, that Cyprus, in the context of the wider region and the collaboration within uh, the region, will um, be an important uh, player in the supply uh, of, of LNG, not just to the region, but to the global market. Um, and in that context, of course, we very uh, much insist on um, regional collaboration as a key factor for making this happen. And for that reason, we're really uh, pleased and excited that we have had um, the positive recent developments regarding the EMGF, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, uh, which really strengthens the uh, collaboration of um, seven countries in the region in a way which not only um, reaffirms the country's commitment to, um, uh, to LNG as a very important um, economic activity in the next uh, in the years to come but it also brings in the companies and different platforms that are going to uh, basically look at and uh, discuss all the areas in which uh, there is a scope for collaboration so uh, hopefully once we are all able to uh, meet physically this will uh, the EMGF will become a much more tangible um, project and uh, of course uh, uh, even virtually there is a lot uh, that can be done in the meantime. Um, uh, I won't um, go on for uh, much longer as regards my initial uh, sort of introduction. I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, international collaboration doesn't just have to do with uh, LNG and with, with hydrocarbons, it also has to do with um, other energy projects that are very, very important, such as the electricity grid that's going to connect Israel, Cyprus and Greece, and also uh, Egypt, Cyprus, and then um, Crete and Greece. Um, so uh, we're working on a number of different projects that are of very, very um, high interest for us and I think for, the, um, for our neighbours, for other countries involved. And uh, hopefully um, this collaboration uh, will have tangible results that will actually affect um, uh, the citizens of our countries with cheaper uh, and uh, better quality um, fuel uh, in the years to come. Thank so thank you very much again for this opportunity and look forward to the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Minister, um, for those comments. I think we now have a recorded message from Alessandra Toddy, if we can get that moving in some way. Nowadays, the world has changed. The worldwide economy is facing tremendous difficulties. Investments in energy supplies are suffering slowdowns due to the significant fall of the demand and the prices trend in the raw materials. The importance of international collaboration is crucial. Italy believes uh, that in the current energy transition scenario, international opportunities and synergies are crucial and strongly endorses the post-pandemic recovery measures uh, implemented by the EU. Those provisions will provide stimulus to invest in energy transition, contributing to mitigate the climate change and reduce vulnerabilities. In this regard, I would like to recall an important result that Italy and Cyprus achieved recently, the establishment of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum as an international regional organization for cooperation in the gas sector. The statute was signed by Italy, Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, Jordan, Israel and Palestine as the seven funding countries last September. 
From the beginning, Italy in Cyprus uh, ensured the support to the MGF for its value in terms uh, of energy security and diversification, for its contribution to the decarbonization of the Mediterranean region and for their prosperity in this area, considering the role uh, the, of the natural gas will play as a bridge for the energy transition. Italy, along with the other funding members, is deeply convinced that a strength and cooperation in the field of energy is fundamental, not only for the security of energy supply, but also for the stability and the prosperity of the region. Uh, thank you, Minister. I'm not sure everyone heard that, but um, uh, we heard something about Italy's uh, enthusiasm for the East Mediterranean Gas Forum and collaboration in the Mediterranean. Um, and now we go to Roma Rick Ronian, um, Vice President North Africa for Total Exploration and Production. Um, you have the floor for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, John. I also uh, want to, uh, uh, to thank you for uh, inviting me on this panel and giving me this opportunity to engage. Um, I want to share the Minister's thanks uh, for uh, the economists for keeping the forum on the agenda, uh, despite the impossibility to, to gather physically, so I'm joining here from, from my home in Paris. Uh, I think it's important indeed to continue the, the global conversation to try to make sense of, I think, the unprecedented events that we're facing currently and try to, to build some kind of common wisdom of uh, how we will face the challenges ahead. And uh, in this, I would like to offer a perspective of an energy uh, major, such as Total, uh, both on the crisis we're facing and its ramifications, but also what it means for, uh, for this uh, Eastern Mediterranean region with a focus on, on Cyprus. So first for us, <clears throat> this crisis has meant not one, uh, one pandemic, but in fact, three crises. First, um, the, the health crisis that we have been facing with uh, the threat of COVID-19 to human lives, has led us to, to take all the, really to, to prioritize taking all the necessary steps to, uh, to protect our employees worldwide, uh, all the people who work for us, employees and contractors. So that was really the primary focus. Um, doing this, uh, our second focus has been trying to keep uh, production on stream uh, in order to, to continue to feed the markets. Uh, both so that Mr. Dupont in France can have uh, can fill his tank uh, with uh, gasoline, or, and that uh, um, utilities can continue to receive uh, LNG to uh, continue to produce electricity. And uh, this was really the the core focus uh, of our activities throughout this pandemic. And um, in this uh, period, we had to deprioritize some activities uh, that were either. I would say less critical, uh, less urgent, or too risky to be performed um, reasonably in this uh, very uh, volatile context. And uh, obviously, drilling operations, which are core to uh, hydrocarbon exploration typically, um, have been often uh, deprioritized in this context because uh, it was just not reasonable to continue to carry uh, them on uh, given the associated risks and uh, on the completion of, of the work. And I will come back on, the, on this when I, when I touch upon the, the region, of course. Um, the second shock we had to face was the commodity prices uh, crisis. Uh, obviously for us as a comp private companies, uh, it has, uh, I mean, the, the, the freeze in global activity has led as the, the minister described to a very brutal uh, removal of uh, 20 million barrels of oil per day on, on the market, uh, demand on the demand side of the market. And so uh, the market has reacted as a market with a very brutal price uh, adjustment. Uh, the prices in 2019 were above $60 in average. Uh, the prices dropped in uh, around $20 per barrel uh, at the end of March, early April uh, this year. And since then they have uh, with uh, the reduction in production that has occurred uh, throughout the decisions taken by OPEC, Russia, even the US uh, has stabilized in the range of $35, $40 per barrel, but it's still very volatile. And so in this environment, uh, of course, we, we focus as industry uh, actors on what we, on the leverages we can control, which is mainly our costs. So uh, we have continued to uh, focus on uh, saving our uh, 
uh, OPEX and of course uh, increased uh, capital uh, expenditure discipline. And the third crisis uh, that uh, we should not forget about is the climate crisis. The pandemic has not uh, distracted the world from the climate crisis. We, we can see growing expectation of governments, uh, of our financial partners, of, uh, of customers for green energy, for climate action. Uh, the basic is that uh, the world sends us the message that it needs more energy to continue to, to grow. At the same time, it wants less carbon to, to survive. And so in this context, Total has announced uh, at the end of September, a new strategy uh, to bring our response to these expectations, to these challenges at a new level. Uh, the idea uh, is uh, to really transition from an oil and gas company to a multi energies companies where the cash flows stemming from oil and gas business will fund the transition uh, to the energy transition to renewable energies, building a, a strong portfolio in this domain and uh, reaching uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 or, or uh, earlier. And so, so how does this all uh, reflect uh, on our region, the East Mediterranean region and, 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 and Cyprus? Well, first, uh, gas is a major comp component for us uh, of this energy transition because it's cleaner than oil, cleaner than coal, of course. And once again, uh, with uh, the cash flow generated with, uh, with the gas business, growing gas business, we think we can use these cash flows to build a very strong uh, renewable energy portfolio. So we need to continue to produce uh, gas and to bring it to the markets. And this region is uh, rich in, in gas, I think. The, the game changer on this has really been around 10 years ago when we have been able through uh, new uh, technologies to, to unlock very thick accumulations of gas beneath uh, the uh, uh, thick layer of, of salt that was accumulated five millions of years ago when the Mediterranean Sea evaporated. And, um, and so very large discoveries uh, occurred uh, back in 2009 in Israel uh, with uh, Tamar Leviathan. Of course, there has been the, the, the Zor field discovered in Egypt, which is a, a really major discovery. And in Cyprus, three, three very important discoveries, major discoveries, Aphrodite in 2012, Calypso in 2018, and, and Glaucus in 2019. And, and collectively, all these uh, discoveries hold amount, uh, almost, we estimate, around 70 trillion cubic feet of gas, which is a very material um, resource uh, that uh, has uh, to be produced. Um, so it's a very prospective gas basin for uh, further exploration. Total is very well positioned in this basin. We have seven exploration blocks just in Cyprus, two in Egypt, two in Lebanon, and we have already drilled two exploration wells in Cyprus. So what have been the immediate impacts of COVID for us? Uh, well, COVID-19 struck us where we were starting a deep water uh, well in Lebanon with a plan to continue drilling uh, in Cyprus. And at that time, we decided to complete the operation in Lebanon. Uh, but after a very careful review, very close engagement with uh, the ministry, uh, with uh, our uh, rig contractor as well, we decided to postpone the, the Cyprus uh, campaign. And it was a, a very tough decision to, to make, you, you can imagine. But deep water drilling is a very complex operation. It involves a, a lot of logistics, suppliers, contractors with very specific skills. And you can't risk to have one, one element of this chain uh, missing at some point. So uh, we had to take this decision. I, I would really be remiss if I didn't uh, thank uh, the authorities of Cyprus for really the, the quality of the dialogue we had and we continue to have uh, in, in this uh, period both on very, very concrete and down-to-earth uh, issues of uh, access to the country, uh, tests uh, being made, uh, uh, logistic uh, topics, so very down-to-earth, and, and the broader strategic issues on which we also need to, to continue to, uh, to, to have this very open dialogue. And so six months ago, uh, when we had to make this decision to stop, we said, well, we'll come back in six months and, uh, and, and uh, hopefully with a plan. And six months later, we're in the midst of this second wave of uh, COVID-19. So obviously we need more time. Uh, uh, we, uh, we need to continue to, I mean, we are doing some work, very, uh, very down to earth work also right now with the partners, ENI, with, uh, with uh, the ministry, with the, uh, all the industry, the contractors to, to, uh, to try to rebuild the capacity to, um, to drill. That's our intention. 
but we will do this when we are ready, uh, hopefully before the end of 2021. That's really our uh, uh, target. Uh, but we have to be very humble in the face of uh, the formidable scale of the challenges that, uh, that we're facing and, and, and to recognize that uh, we cannot control everything. Um, beyond uh, exploration, uh, as the minister said, we, we have al already a lot of uh, discovered resources in the region. Uh, in order to be produced, they will need to find markets. The local markets are too, uh, too tiny, I would say, to, to uh, absorb all the, all the production capacity. And so there needs to be uh, export markets identified. Europe is clearly, I would say, the closest and the most obvious market. Um, so now the question comes of the infrastructure. Should it be a pipeline or LNG? Uh, both uh, solution will any way be competing with a very strong competition from Russia, from Caspian Gas, from uh, US LNG as well. And so the, the key imperative would be to, uh, to really look at the lowest cost solution. And so here also, I would like to join the minister by uh, uh, paying tribute uh, to this uh, very productive dialogue that has engaged uh, with Egypt, uh, Italy, Greece, uh, Jordan, the Palestinian Israel. Uh, to establish this uh, East Mediterranean Gas Forum. It's a, it's a very, uh, I would say, promising forum. We are part of it as a, as a number of companies um, to represent, to bring the solutions that the private sector can, uh, can, uh, can bring to this discussion. And we really, we really look forward to, to continuing this discussion to, to hopefully uh, come up with material uh, projects to, to be delivered. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you for your comments. Um, and now we go to Ricard Skoufias from Hellenic Hydrocarbon Resources Management. Five minutes. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's, a, it's very nice to be back again with the economist, uh, the minister, and, uh, and a number of uh, old friends. Uh, I don't think I need to spend my minutes reiterating that the hydrocarbon sector has had a challenging year. Uh, so I will give it a little bit more sort of the underground perspective from our end. Uh, and as I do that, of course, there is one distinction that I would like to start off by making. Uh, the distinction between analyzing the global sector overall and, and Greece's opportunities in the upstream sector as a producer country. Uh, of course, the two are interlinked. But uh, from our perspective for Greece, this is about how do we monetize uh, the natural gas assets, assets for which we know there will be demand uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, uh, and as we consider that how, uh, in our debates, there's basically two sides that need to be balanced. Uh, on the one hand, there is the, the prize with a Z, the potential benefits and contribution of a dynamic gas sector to Greece, financially, strategically, as well as macroeconomically. And on the other, there are the uh, very important considerations that need to be taken into account uh, when we discuss how to make this work for Greece and, and the Greek people. So if I start briefly on the price, we've been at this for a while, uh, but we still need to accelerate a better understanding of the hydrocarbon geology. Uh, as we do this, I, I will be daring and, and quote our new CEO, Aristofatos, who recently said that once we do, we are quite likely to have some very good news. Now, I cannot speak today with certainty about the magnitude of those good news in terms of reserves or, or even less uh, revenue, because the truth is that until exploration and appraisal is conducted, uh, one cannot know, uh, but one can have very good indications. And as some previous speakers today mentioned, I think it was Minister Christo uh, there was a reference to the uh, US Geological Survey, which estimates that in the region, we may see uh, something around 300 TCF of natural gas, which of course would translate into uh, anything between 500 billion to a trillion dollars equivalent in value. Uh, but as I said, un until we get the work done, uh, these are 
hypothetical numbers about potential reserves. I think, however, it's fair to say that there is a likely significant prize available to Greece, commercially, strategically, and economically, uh, from developing and monetizing uh, these assets. There is still certainly a window of opportunity to do so, but it has, has been mentioned, uh, things are evolving fast, so there is no time for complacency. But the upside, the potential upside, uh, I believe, is, is very significant. But having said that, of course, we also must uh, address the other considerations, and they need to be transparently and openly debated. And uh, I think the first one is, uh, also as Romerick said, uh, the first one I would almost describe as an ideological debate. How do we view hydrocarbons in a context of a climate change of what is increasingly accepted to be uh, almost existential in nature. As we do that, though, I think it's very important not to lose track of the fact that this is not uh, an either-or debate. Uh, it's a question of finding the right balance to maintain a functioning energy system whilst at the same time accelerating decarbonization and the transition towards alternative and renewable energies. Now that debate in itself requires a, a sophisticated, certainly not a binary debate about the energy mix that we wish to achieve and how we can pace that transition. My, my second observation, the second consideration is really about supply and demand. Demand for natural gas will remain. But as for the supply side, of course, the truth is that that demand will be satisfied by those actors and geographies that will be most competitive. And that competition will have a technical, a financial, an environmental, as well as a social parameter. Now, there are elements to this which we cannot control, geology, water depth, and other issues which I think are best left to the engineers. But there is also elements that we can control. Uh, there was a reference here from Total about the great collaboration they've had with the Cypriot government, and I think that's very important. We can control how we support partners and investors in the sector by making sure that we have attractive and transparent processes for investment, licensing, permitting, inspections, etc. And, and for me, that, that critical importance of collaboration and efficiency is really the third key consideration which leaves me on to my fourth and last, but certainly not least, I would actually say, in my opinion, the most important consideration, which is how we build and protect a social license and public acceptance uh, for the hydrocarbon and natural gas sector. It's, it's very easy to agree that the revenue side is very desirable. But this will only work if there is public trust that we can achieve that in ways that also protect environmental and social impacts to the highest standards. And I think we're all aware that in, in, in many, if not most geographies, we do face a trust deficit uh, among stakeholders about this. But I would say that I'm equally aware, and I hope I've made some contribution as well in the past, uh, that we can show that these energy projects can be executed in a way that builds uh, social legitimacy and conveys real tangible value across the board. So in, in very short, those are sort of the guiding principles uh, that we look at from the HHRM uh, perspective. Uh, so John, if you just allow me half a minute to point out uh, just a little bit of information about us because we've, we've had quite a lot of changes recently. So as of July this year, uh, we have appointed a new CEO with a very long standing career in the Norwegian upstream sector. And we are absolutely delighted to have him on board. Uh, we have a, a new board of directors that are drawn from both Greece and internationally with established commercial expertise uh, and expertise in health and safety, social and environmental impact uh, management. 
And though this new constellation has only been in place uh, for a couple of months, uh, I'll say that it has been characterized by a fantastic support and commitment uh, from day one of the appointment by Prime Minister Mitsotakis through frequent engagement with our energy minister, Hatsidakis, and the critical day-to-day -day work with communities and investors uh, and partners, including Total. Uh, we have already been able to conduct a pretty comprehensive review to strengthen uh, and build governance on these issues. And uh, reactions from investors and stakeholders has been really positive. So we are delighted about this, but we are of course taking on board the challenging environment. And we are very much cognizant that these are our first steps on a journey, which is often referred to, sorry for being a bit cliche, but the new normal. And I think that is very true also for the sector. Uh, as we seek to accelerate the pace uh, as we go forward. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that uh, contribution. Um, Konstantinos Filis to, to finish us off from the Institute of International Relations in Greece. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, with, uh, with economists and uh, sharing uh, my, my views. Um, the Eastern Mediterranean has, uh, has uh, certainly been affected by the uh, pandemic's impact on prices. Uh, there are other, of course, more qualified members of this panel who have already uh, talked about this issue. So I will focus on the uh, Eastern Mediterranean's importance from a European perspective, uh, which is already kind of, of waning uh, for three main reasons. Uh, first, uh, it's uh, uh, uncompetitive prices compared to the current rates at which the EU buys gas. Uh, of course, prices are expected to rise from 2022 to 2025 uh, due to a supply gap, uh, due to the increased demand expected in Asia, and until the new projects go into operation. So there will be a brief window of opportunity, but in the long term, prices will be about what they are right now. So time is not on the side of the region's producers, as has already been said. Second, the relatively limited deposits, although the quantities are adequate to supply, for example, the East Med and other projects, in fact, I would say that based on the existing fines, and I stress existing, the region could send uh, the European market around 20 BCM for a period of 20 to 25 years, uh, which might not make much of a difference with regard to Russia, but it can be added to the uh, sources uh, supplying the European Union. Uh, after all, Azerbaijan will be supplying similar quantities uh, at its peak. Uh, but the main reason uh, is uh, the European target of uh, cutting CO2 emissions by 55% by 2030 and attaining zero emissions in 2050. And these two goals will lead to a constant fall in European demand for natural gas. And there are EU studies which project that uh, demand will fall by about 25% by 2030 and by about 80% by 2050. Uh, therefore, the EU has started to cut back on its investments in fossil fuels, including I think you may have frozen. Can anybody else hear Konstantinos? No. Oh. Oh. Try, try. Constantinus, we can't hear you anymore. You, you seem to have frozen, if you can hear us. No, sorry, I think you might need to unmute and mute again or, or something technical. Um, no. That's better. Well, we'll come back to you when, when we can hear when, when, when we can hear you again. I wonder if I could ask the minister to respond to some of what's been said. I mean, particularly, I think I'm very interested in continuing talk about climate change, um, the rising, the, the falling price of renewables, how Orsted is now more valuable than BP, Tesla is more valuable than four of the next car companies put together. I mean, if I were a, a, a really rabid member of Extinction Rebellion, I would say, why don't you just leave the gas in the ground? Um, you know, we should, we should leave everything there. 
What do you feel about the challenge of climate change, Minister? Well, look, I think climate change is something that's happening and it's undoubtedly something that we need to address. And I think that uh, uh, developing the LNG market is undoubtedly one of the uh, parts of this wider strategy. Um, definitely, I think that there is a very uh, fair point to make as regards the European market itself and the potential competitiveness of um, more traditional um, sort of uh, fuel uh, vis-a-vis renewable uh, sources within the European market. However, um, the um, decarbonisation process will be complete uh, no earlier than 2050. And I will agree that that means that there is a time frame and a window within which um, development needs to take place. However, um, what, what we're focusing on and what I think um, is relevant is that, um, uh, of course, we have this transitional period in which we all need to make um, a very significant leap. And I think that uh, natural gas can be a key part of that. And um, I think that that was something that was mentioned by Total as well, that, you know, in the efforts of the companies themselves to decarbonize and to move on to different types of fuel, we need to have a roadmap that is very clear and that uses all the uh, different um, resources that we have available in order to reach uh, that target. But the other um, point, I think, has to do with the regional aspect and the fact that, um, that you know, markets are not solely focused on, on Europe, and I would totally agree with that and, um, um, and, and agree that we need to be looking at global markets and we need to be looking at um, uh, countries with very large demand, which do not have adequate demand to... Uh, adequate supply to satisfy that demand and one example in the region would be um, Egypt but there's also um, various um, examples in Asia as well for that. Um, So yes we are very committed to moving to renewables and I think uh, uh, the companies themselves have to be committed to moving to renewables because that is the um, that's where we need to go and I think everyone is committed to making those um, those targets within the time frame, uh, but we need to do that in a pragmatic way, which utilizes all the um, methods available. And I think another key point uh, uh, that Romerick made is that we need to um, use uh, the funds that will arise from uh, the traditional uh, sort of OMG um, exploration and utilization to action fund. Um, what will be our uh, green future. Fine. Uh, Constantinos, now you're back. Do you wish to just have a couple more final words? Because we are very short of time. I, I apologize. Uh, there was a, a technical failure. Uh, just just two uh, uh, words on, on my behalf. I was uh, referring to uh, the European Obdusman, which launched an uh, uh, inquiry uh, into the inclusion of the IGB and the East Med in the PCIs, the projects of common interest, uh, given that these projects concern uh, hydrocarbons. So th- this is highly indicating of um, the situation as I described it before. And uh, uh, before I conclude, an observation with which I suppose we, we all agree is that uh, in the long term and uh, bearing, of course, unforeseen developments, we will see stabilization of demand for and uh, penetration, of course, of uh, renewables and hydrogen, uh, with natural gases, sir, remaining stable. But at the same time, we have new sources uh, entering the market from Australia and and North America. And uh, these, of course, are going to be uh, competitive for the uh, East Eastern Mediterranean uh, overall as well. So that's it for me. Thanks. And again, apologies for the technical failure. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and we've, we've had one question already. I was just going to comment to Romarik. You mentioned Total. I don't think, do you, do you use the phrase beyond petroleum, which BP does now? Or, or I mean, that is what you're looking for. Well, I think we, I mean, well, thank you for, uh, for uh, throwing the question. I, I think it's, a, it's a really a very valid one. But um, I think we have a, a a different approach to, to BP um, in the sense that well, I, it would be more fair if BP was there to, to speak about themselves. But, <laughs> uh, in total, we, we see, uh, I mean, we, we think we can't just flip a switch and uh, 
and make, uh, just as uh, the minister said, uh, all the uh, carbon, uh, carbon energy disappear. And so it will take time, it will be a process, um, just because uh, first the society has to evolve uh, and we have to, to keep pace with this evolution. And also because a, a, a huge level of capital investment would be needed to replace the existing uh, uh, generation capacities uh, relying on carbon energy, hydrocarbons, um, in order to, uh, to be able to generate equal and then even more uh, electricity, uh, electrons to, to, to fuel growth. And so um, to do this, uh, we think uh, first, uh, we should deprive. I mean, we should start to de decarbonize, uh, aiming at the the, the more, most polluting uh, hydrocarbons, which are re obviously uh, coal today and uh, and uh, oil, uh, and then uh, gas being the less uh, polluting uh, uh, should continue. And once again, we 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 have we think there is a, a very strong case at using the the funds. Uh, generated by uh, LNG uh, uh, pipe gas growth uh, continuing to 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 serve as a, the engine uh, for to to finance uh, this uh, transition to renewables. I, we believe that, uh, and where we are different from uh, from uh, from BP is that uh, we we intend to continue to grow our gas business, especially whereas from what we understood from their strategy, they really uh, aim at shrinking. Uh, their oil and gas business uh, by uh, 2030, which is not, uh, which is a difference from from our perspective. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. I'm afraid I think we're out of time. I mean, the only thing I wanted to say to the minister, if she was, she wasn't listening to much of the conference this morning. There was quite a lot of discussion about Turkey. You mentioned um, big markets in the region. Of course, Turkey could be a big market in the region, but at the moment, Turkey is more of a problem than um, than a potential partner. But I would guess that if you could work with Turkey, that would help a lot in, in, in the East Mediterranean Gas Forum. Uh, absolutely, John, and I think the w one very important point to note is that um, the EMGF is absolutely not um, closed to new collaborations. In fact, the whole uh, premise um, of, um, of, of the organization is to uh, be open to new members, whether that be observers such as the EU and the US, uh, um, or whether it be uh, actual members, with um, the only prerequisite that they um, share the values and follow um, uh, the discussion in a constructive way with similar uh, strategic aims. So, uh, of course, um, it would be it, it would be wonderful if that could happen, and um, uh, and um, you know it would be to the benefit of everyone. And I completely agree uh, with the very valid point of, of, of Turkey being a very big uh, potential market. Now, um, yes, unfortunately, I wasn't uh, following uh, all the discussions earlier, but. Um, uh, we really do hope that the initiatives uh, being uh, taken at the moment uh, will lead to a constructive conversation starting up again soon. And I, and I think that um, the, the oil and gas um, matters should fall within the framework of that discussion as regards the specific Cyprus uh, uh, problem. But from um, a, a sort of gas uh perspective um you know we are uh continuing our discussions with the companies as uh, we mentioned earlier in a very hopeful uh spirit uh, despite the difficulties of um covid and and related sort of from um, financial uh and other repercussions um with the, the hope that in, in parallel to that other discussions can take place for a um, for a solution of the Cyprus problem within the framework uh, discussed and agreed in, in prior uh, such, uh, such uh, negotiations and discussions. Well, um, and, and yes, the EMGF is um, a forum uh, which basically wants to nurture and, uh, and, and uh, take forward a fruitful uh, discussions 
um, of all countries interested in, in, in participating uh, on that basis. Splendid. Well, that's very kind. We've run out of time. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much um, to all of you for your um, interesting discussion. And we will move on to talk about hydrocarbons again. And I'm sure we'll talk about it again next year. So I hope to see you all in Nicosia one, maybe next year. Hopefully. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Uh, right, welcome to our next panel, which is discussing energy transition and digital transformation, Greece's significant role in Southeast Europe. Um, and I'm going to be talking with Andreas Shemichis, the Chief Executive Officer of Hellenic Petroleum Group, which is one of our sponsors for the 16th uh, Virtual Cyprus Summit. Um, so, Mr. Shemichis, um, thank you for coming. Um, and perhaps I can ask you one or two questions to, see, to, to, set, to set the discussion going. Um, I mean, the first, perhaps, biggest question, what, what was the impact of this terrible year of COVID-19 on, on, on the industry and, and, and indeed on your company? Um, how have you managed? Well, uh, good afternoon, Kalispera Seolus. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you tonight. Uh, it's a pity we haven't been able to have this um, uh, session physically in Cyprus. But um, nevertheless, I'm sure that we'll have the opportunity uh, next time round. Um, well, COVID-19 was actually something like a big pause on, on the world. And um, a number of things have been um, described in uh, previous sessions. Um, but in terms of summarizing the impact, uh, we, we've seen the, the huge impact on um, uh, our industry. We have... Um, uh, a massive decline in a very short period of time in terms of demand, 20 to 30 million barrels a day of uh, demand destruction, which hasn't come back uh, as yet. So that's the obvious impact. However, from a corporate point of view, I think we should be highlighting the issues and the challenges for a company of our size and our uh, breadth of activities in, in uh, all of the region in maintaining all of our uh, people safe. We have close to 10,000 people in our ecosystem, if you will, uh, which um, they needed to be kept safe. We need to keep the security of supply in the markets to avoid having a health crisis turning into an energy crisis. So that was um, uh, an important part. And also to stay afloat in terms of uh, financial liquidity. Last but not least, uh, I think it was an opportunity for companies uh, like ourselves to demonstrate a, uh, a much um, uh, more uh, strong um, community uh, interaction program, which we did in most countries that we operate. And I, I don't know if you managed to hear some of the previous panel, um, uh, Mr. Shemichis, but we talked quite a lot there about um, about climate change, among other things, and the transition to um, what the European Union is hoping to be net zero by 2050. Um, and of course, we have the the green, um, the, the new green plans of the European Commission. Uh, they obviously have very big impact on, on a company like yours. Um, and I wonder how whether you have thoughts on, on how a company like yours is, is, is moving towards what you might call to be transition from fossil fuels. Mm. Now, that's, um, that's clearly uh, a big challenge. If I may share a couple of, uh, of, uh, of, of pages on the, on the group overall strategy, because that is something that we've talked about um, quite a lot. Uh, just give me a second and I'll make sure that we have this. I don't know if you can see it. I, I'm sure we will, if you share it. 
Yeah, I just did, but for some reason it's <laughs> not working. Technology is not our strong point. <laughs> oh, it's going to come. It's going to come. There you are. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, Hellenic Petroleum is a bit of a misnomer uh, for our group because um, we do have our stronghold in uh, in in oil with uh, significant operations, but uh, we do have power in gas with uh, 800 megawatts of CCGTs. Uh, we trade in in gas and and um, and energy. And uh, recently, we have uh, grown in the renewable space as well with about 1.2 gigawatt of portfolio in various stages, of course. It's not in operation. Uh, however, I'm, I'm proud to say that we do have the fourth largest photovoltaic plant in uh, Europe, which is under construction in northern Greece. So that's the petroleum part. The, the Hellenic part is also a bit of a misnomer because we are really a regional player. We export about 60% of our production. So we're quite engaged in this um, um, uh, regional discussion. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the green uh, uh, agenda, it was quite interesting to hear uh, the previous speakers saying, uh, I, I made some notes about somebody mentioning that, why not leave um, gas in the ground? I think it was you. Um, Is it with me? Yes. <laughs> As part of this um, uh, agenda and a number of other comments about um, uh, how relevant this discussion is. Uh, I need to make two points here. First of all, uh, even in the most aggressive scenario in the next 20 years, 50% of energy will be hydrocarbons based. And that is very important to keep in mind. So I would not rush to strike off oil and gas from the energy map. The second um, word that we need to keep in mind is the transition process. It's not flicking a switch. You cannot move from stage A to stage B without uh, actually uh, going through a transition phase. So <clears throat> what we are doing is uh, effectively accelerating this transition from um, what has traditionally been an oil-based uh, uh, group to something which will incorporate cleaner energies. Uh, our strategy and our target is uh, by the end of 2030, so in 10 years from today, to reduce our uh, CO2 footprint by about 50%. And I think we're on track to achieve that. And, and the other sort of big theme for this for this panel and this discussion with you is about what we are calling the digital transformation. Um, I, I mean, how does, I mean, much of your company is, is quite a traditional company, but how does digital technologies contribute to, to, um, to the future? Well, I think the most obvious example for digital transformation is what we have been living in the last six months. I think most people have learned to work from home. I see that uh, um, most of the speakers are actually sitting in their home offices. So that is um, as close to a transformational uh, um, uh, business model as I have seen one. Uh, but in, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, moving forward, the uh, our industry, which is a big numbers industry, um, digital transformation becomes very important. And I think that uh, uh, we have a number of examples to, to share uh, in terms of uh, how we run our business, <clears throat> how we use uh, AI and predictive modeling, how we use uh, big data analytics in order to make uh, the decisions uh, become so much better in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, and economic um, uh, performance. On the other hand, I would probably say that um, the digital transformation is a huge opportunity because it is something which doesn't necessarily require huge amounts of capital investment. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, we see that as an opportunity, uh, not only for Greece, but also for Cyprus. And, and if I may offer a, an example here, we've launched a regional, um, <clears throat> uh, if you will, lab, digital transformation lab with uh, the cooperation with uh, uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, which will uh, employ uh, a number of people 
mainly based in Greece, and it will tackle our activities in all of the regions in the Balkans and the East Med in terms of digital transformation projects. But Cyprus is actually quite strong on that because we are cooperating with a, a Cyprus-based company, Hyperion, which is helping us to develop optimization algorithms for our petrochemicals plant. So I see that as a big opportunity for Cyprus, given the very high level of human capital and educational level that um, uh, the, the island has to take a, if you will, a regional uh, championship role in that respect. Very interesting. I was going to ask you as a final question to, to, to or any further comments on, on, on your company and Cyprus. Um, I mean, Cyprus is, is, is more of an energy player than it was because of the East Mediterranean. Um, but do you have any particular messages for Cyprus for the future? This could be my last question. Yes. Um, actually, there are three points which uh, I think are important to, to highlight. And um, we can, uh, we can uh, bring our expertise uh, in Helen Petroleum and a market which um, uh, Greece is a, is a larger market and has gone through a lot of the changes that Cyprus will be going through with um, a, a time precedent, if you will, 10 to 20 years ago. So first of all, it's, um, it's an energy transition game. So Cyprus is going through an energy transition game. It's going from a 100% oil-based uh, economy to something which will involve gas and renewables. Uh, it's going from a 100% state-owned energy uh, provider to something which is uh, a more open market with uh, private companies and eventually a target model. It's opening up its connections with um, other markets, which means that Cyprus will need to develop a different set of skills. And that will involve uh, trading skills, risk management skills, and of course, regulatory skills, because that is something which is a highly regulated market. So in that respect, we are, uh, if you will, able to support this process. The second item, which is a little bit more tangible, is that as we embark in this um, transition agenda and we are building a new uh, business portfolio in renewables and other services, Cyprus is an area where we are interested to invest. We are the number one um, liquid fuels provider in, uh, in the island. And uh, we see no reason why we should not be investing in material opportunities in renewables, bring e-mobility solution in the island and uh, effectively accelerate this transition uh, in terms of uh, uh, product offering and services. Uh, finally, I will go back to the digital transformation and I would uh, uh, invite our um, uh, colleagues and friends in Cyprus to take that seriously. We will be engaging uh, in uh, active um, um, investigation of, of opportunities uh, in Cyprus to use it as a hub uh, in order to be able to uh, capitalize on the very high human capital, as I said, uh, that is uh, available in uh, in Cyprus. That's very that's very interesting. And my my personal experience of Cyprus is that it ought to be strong in solar as well one day. <laughs> so maybe there is a future there, as there is in Greece. Correct. As well. Thank you very much for your time. That was uh, very interesting, um, and uh, good luck for the future. Thank you for supporting our conference. Thank you very much. Take care.
Uh, welcome back to our, our closing panel of the 16th um, Cyprus Economist Cyprus Summit, virtual summit this year, um, which indeed is going to be discussing towards a post-COVID-19 growth and business model. Um, we've heard once or twice today about um, next year and the hope from vaccines. So the time has approached when we need to think about the world after COVID-19, innovation, flexibility, competitiveness and technology. And we are going to hear first from Goran Tinjic, the program manager for Southern Europe for the World Bank, and then from Christodoulos Angastini Otis, the president of the Cyprus Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, about five, five minutes each, and then we hope to have a little time for discussion. So first of all, Goran Tinjic, you have the floor. Thank you very much, John. And let me first thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to participate um, in the 16th Cyprus Summit. Um, last year, my predecessor, Mark, Marcus Heinz, uh, delivered a presentation at the 15th summit, and his presentation was entitled, Are We Ready for the Next Shock? He must have known something that we didn't. He must have known what was coming. So uh, in my presentation, I will focus on a couple of things. Uh, I mean, just a few words about the shock, about the COVID-19 pandemic, but then I will focus on the very theme of today's summit, which is in the need of a new growth model for Cyprus. So I will talk about productivity, competitiveness, and human capital. So first about a shock. Uh, the COVID-19 has pushed the global economy into the deepest recession since the Second World War. According to our latest forecast, uh, the global economy will shrink by 5.2% this year. This has major implications for poverty reduction. The reduction. This is very close to the World Bank's heart. Uh, the poverty is rising for the first time in more than 20 years. It is estimated that with the combination of COVID-19, climate change and conflicts globally, we may have additional 150 million more people falling into extreme poverty by year 2021. This is a stark warning. The crisis has not spared Europe, including Cyprus. The EU GDP is projected to contract by about 7.5% this year. And in Cyprus, the GDP growth is projected to fall by 6.2%. As you, John, said, I mean, we still have many unknowns. Uh, we still do not know the exact duration of this pandemic. How long will it last? Uh, there are promising news on the vaccine fronts, but there are still unknowns as to the distribution and rollout of the vaccines, and in particular to reach out to those who are mostly in the need. And there is a big unknown on the behavioral changes on potential long-lasting effects the crisis may have on households, on firms, on governments. We are learning that in Cyprus, uh, six out of 10 households were economically affected by COVID-19, with four out, out of uh, 10 households having more than 20% drop in income. This is indeed very serious uh, economic impact on households in Cyprus. So, in this context, uh, I mean, few words about productivity. A small economy like Cyprus that is heavily dependent on tourism may experience a slower recovery than the rest of Europe unless a comprehensive policy or effort is undertaken to address a pre-COVID-19 long-term structural challenges related to productivity growth. Indeed, Cyprus has experienced sharp decline in productivity, with productivity growth falling from an annual growth of about 3% in the 90s to less than 1% in the last decade. And the pandemic, unfortunately, is likely to have further impacted this decline. So, we know that productivity agenda is complex and broad. So what, are, what countries need to focus on in the context of post-COVID recovery? Few things, strengthening governance, improving the regulatory environment, 
fostering innovation and digital development, investing in human capital and climate resilience. These investments will be crucial to raise living standards and foster inclusive and sustainable growth. Now a few words on competitiveness, and in particular one dimension of competitiveness that will be a great opportunity uh, for a country like Cyprus, digital. The World Bank has just published a report entitled Europe 4.0. Uh, warmly recommend this, uh, this report, which is very pertinent uh, to the current moment. So the report is Europe uh, 4.0, addressing the digital dilemma. Uh, very timely and, and provides an insight in, into how the region, Europe, is performing in the digital arena at the global and local level. The report recognizes that Europe faces a triple imperative, economic competitiveness, market inclusion, and geographic convergence. The report concludes that Europe faces a digital dilemma. While digital, new digital technologies create access to markets for smaller firms and lagging, lagging regions, they also create challenges if such expansion is concentrated only on large firms and leading regions. So what can be specifically done in Cyprus to address this digital dilemma? What are the low hanging fruits, if you want? One, invest and leverage digital technologies, including in tourism, to improve market intelligence and destination promotion. For an island that is dependent on tourism, this is very, very important. Two, increase broadband penetration for businesses, in particular for small and medium enterprises and for young, young enterprises, for young businesses. And three, and this will not come as a surprise coming from the World Bank, improve the business environment. The current uh, doing business ranking of Cyprus is uh, 54th, uh, out of 190 economies. Continued efforts are needed to make it easier for opportunity-driven entrepreneurship. Finally, um, the digital agenda that I just mentioned needs to go hand in hand with investment in human capital. Again, you will not be surprised that we are talking about human capital. If Cyprus wants to be well positioned in the new normal, it needs to combine the opportunities of innovation with modernizing the foundation of education systems, increasing access and improving the quality of tertiary education and in particular. And while we are focusing on tertiary, let's not forget those with lower skills. So training and skills recycling for lifelong learning are needed for a smooth transition and for shared prosperity. So let me sum up. We are living in an unprecedented shock, which also provides an opportunity. This opportunity must be taken in Cyprus to promote a new growth model that will, base, that will address structural challenges to productivity, boost competitiveness, and strengthen human capital. These days, we are hearing one, uh, one uh, sentence over and over again, which is build back better. And indeed, this is the opportunity. This crisis, with all its unfortunate uh, events, uh, offers an opportunity uh, to build back better society in Cyprus and <laughs> Europe. With this, John, over to you, and thank you. Thank, 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 thank you for your, for your comments. Build Back Better, of course, is now associated with Joe Biden in America and also with Boris Johnson in Britain. So everybody wants to do it. Um, uh, Mr. Angasti Niotis from the um, Cyprus Chamber of, of Commerce and Industry, I'm sure you will agree with a lot of what you've just heard, but, but give us your perspective on, on the, the next stages of growth and business. I certainly agree with most of the things the previous speaker has mentioned. I need to say, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me express my sincerest thanks to the organizers of today's Economy Summit for inviting me yet again 
and giving me the opportunity to be part of a session that would deal with the need of a new growth and business model for Cyprus. At the Cyprus Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we have been strongly emphasizing for a number of years now that our country needs a new growth and business model if it's to face successfully the challenges of our times and strengthen its competitiveness in the years to come. This we have been doing before COVID-19 appeared. For us, the pandemic has just made this need much more pressing and imminent through exposing more vividly the vulnerabilities of the Cyprus business model. The three key words that come into my mind when talking about a new business model is transformation, diversification, and innovation. We have been for many years now proponents of the need for the digital transformation of the country. Digital transition will give increased efficiency, the previous gentleman said productivity, increased efficiency, higher levels of productivity, enhanced innovation, new products and services, and the penetration into new markets. The related EU funds offer a unique opportunity to increase our digital infrastructure, both in the private and public sectors, and to turn the country into an attractive investment destination. Transformation of our economy does not confine itself to the digital dimension, though. We need to place much more emphasis on the green and blue dimension, as well as the circular economic model. These are the areas on which the EU is attributing a lot of importance and is dedicating substantial financial and other resources. Cyprus can utilize these resources for its transition, diversification, in another important aspect. Tourism is a prime example where there is an overdependence on a limited number of markets. Similarly, there is overdependence on the construction sector. We cannot rely on these two sectors as the only sectors that will secure our economic future. In addition, we need to practically support industry and enlarge our industrial base through the production of high added value and technologically advanced products. In this direction, we need to adhere to the strict implementation of the National Industrial Strategy of Ours 2019-2030. Health and education are also very promising and more investments need to be challenged, uh, channeled towards these sectors together with their intense promotion abroad. The transformation of the education and training systems is another area where we need to focus our attention. Digital transformation cannot be fully achieved without the effective contribution to the education system. At the same time, though, we need to strengthen the position of Cyprus as an international business services and investment center, as well as our efforts to attract productive foreign investments into our country. In this direction, we definitely need to revisit our investment framework by removing all the deficiencies of the past, the long-awaited reform of the judicial system, and the repeat of the transformation of justice will contribute decisively to our efforts, as well as the reform of the public sector and the further simplification of our regulatory framework. We need to engage actively in restoring the reputation of our country. Rebranding our country should be a priority. The IO management guru, Peter Drager, once has said, if you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. While Thomas Edison said, there is a way to do it better, find it. This is effectively the essence of innovation. Innovation, should be an all-embracing concept of our future growth and business model, since it is through innovation that economies can sustain competitive advantages and growth. Research is also a concept closely associated to innovation, since it is effectively the means of innovation. It is therefore essential to practically support businesses to invest in research and innovation and commercially exploit the research results. We also need to be practically support 
existing but also new startup innovative business as well as entrepreneurship because without entrepreneurship there can never be investment in research and innovation. Our country is at the crossroads. Now is a good time to demonstrate that the necessary to demonstrate the necessary will to make the necessary to make the much needed transition, support the recovery and invest in our future through a long-term sustainable business and economic model. Concluding, I would like to stress that our chamber is ready and willing to contribute to the establishment of a new growth and business model and is eager to cooperate actively with the government and all other stakeholders in achieving the same. I'm confident that the discussion that may follow will give the chance to all of us to have a good debate and become wiser on the issue. I would like to thank you for listening to me and I look forward to any discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, 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 those, for those words. Um, I, I find that you, the two of you, had very similar messages in many respects. And I, I'm sort of left wondering a little about what, what are Cyprus's real competitive advantages? Um, I mean, you've mentioned many of them. It has a very strong tourism industry, so it's well located for that. Um, uh, it has um, an education sector. I think you put a lot of emphasis on education. We heard from Mr. Hadji Kiprianu. Um, from European University Cyprus about the importance of developing the, the education industry. Um, but as, as I think we've just heard from Mr. Agastiniotis, Cyprus in the past has depended perhaps on things which were not so reliable for the future. It had a long standing history of depending on Russian, Russian money and Russian investment. Programs like the famous Golden Passports um, have been discredited. Um, you, Cyprus needs to sort of find more lasting and permanent advantages. And I, I wonder if I could ask um, Goran Tinjic, the English language, that must be something of an advantage for a country like Cyprus. And we heard from Mr. Agostiniotis about the need for judicial reform. Do you think that the public sector in Cyprus really does need some substantial change when you look at other countries of Southern Europe? Or does, does it have advantages? Because again, its judicial system is also quite admired. Thank you, John. Excellent question. Uh, the advantages. Well, it's, it's a bit of a crystal ball at this time to look into advantages. I mean, but, but Cyprus does have many advantages. I mean, its geographical position, it's an advantage. Well, in the current um, era of tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean, you may think otherwise. But it does have, it's at the crossroads of, uh, of, uh, of the roles, if you want. Uh, I mean, tourism, definitely. Uh, education, absolutely. But I mean, you, you pointed into a, a, a very important issue, which is the issue of public sector and the issue, issue of institutions, okay? <clears throat> so if you read the latest uh, EU reports, I mean, the issue of institution is very prominent, strengthening institutions, public sector governance, etc., uh, etc. Et so, I mean, no country in Europe, including Cyprus, is immune to focusing on strengthening public sector institution, transparency, governance, uh, quality of services, etc. I mean, if you allow, John, I would just like to underline one, one very important yes. uh, point that, uh, that was mentioned by Mr. Christo Doulos, um, which has to do with research and development, okay? I mean, this is a summit uh, that, uh, that is discussing, among other things, innovation. I mean, research and development is at the core of the innovation agenda, as Mr. Christodoulos correctly emphasized. So you asked about public sector. Public sector needs to find, I mean, act in two ways. Increase expenditure for research and development on one hand, and on the other way, find ways to mobilize private sector and private sector resources in the context of research and development. So, I mean, these are my two cents on this. Over to you. Thank you. No, I, I think that's very interesting. And I, going back to Mr. Angus Diniotis, one, one point actually that, that Goran mentioned was that Cyprus ranks, I think you said 54th out of 190 countries in the doing, the famous World Bank's doing business um, rankings. I mean, there are other countries, even in the region, I'm thinking of the, of the three Caucasus countries, a country like Georgia, that are much better on that, that rating. Um, Mr. Angus Tiniotis, you said you wanted to work with, with, the, with the government. There is, a, I think, a legislative election next year, indeed, in Cyprus. Do you think the government is always 
helpful to business or would you, do you think it could be more helpful to business and creating a, a more attractive climate for business? In a few words, I could say that the government could be a lot more helpful to business. Unfortunately, we, have, we cannot resolve a problem unless we face it. Our public sector is bureaucratic, is slow, is ring-fenced, and is protected by the union. So transformation of the public sector is a must, but is extremely difficult. It's even more difficult when different issues go to the parliament, where there is no majority of the government, so very few things can change easily in our country when it comes to the public sector that has an extremely powerful trade union. We are bureaucratic, we are a very, you have a very difficult public sector. Now, the private sector is a lot more effective, but is facing all the time obstacles in performing business. Most of our low ratings in the West Bank doing business report come from inefficiencies that originate from the public sector or the semi public sector. Uh, justice. We always used to say that justice delayed is public, is justice denied. And I think we all know that very well. If it takes you five to seven to 10 years to get through a simple court case in Cyprus, even if you win the case at the end, there's no point in, in it because the, the things, the, the, everything has changed around you or in the business you are, you are in. So this discourages international companies to put Cyprus as the jurisdiction, as the jurisdiction where they have their making agreements. Nevertheless, we have positive, there's a positive side. We have a very good human capital in Cyprus. Like uh, Goran has mentioned, we are at the crossroad of the three continents. We all speak English. We have a very successful, uh, we have a very, very good private sector, very good professional services like lawyers, accountants, and the uh, Highly educated people, and uh, of course we are probably one of the best destinations for headquartering or regional headquartering, which is something that we should improve in the future. Now that we will not have the work and passports program as an income in Cyprus, and construction is going to decline obviously in the forthcoming months and years, I think we should look into into attracting a lot more headquarters in Cyprus. But to make the environment attractive, we need to do certain reforms. The regulatory system, the justice, the public service are the challenges we have to, if you want to see, to issue a simple building permit, for example, it may take years, whereas such an operation in other countries will be done digitally in a few days, sometimes in a few hours. So these are the things you have to change. We are trying to do it. Certain things have been planned and are working towards it. We have a long way to go. We have to admit that. And I'm not the kind of person, kind of person that will say everything is paradise in Cyprus. Although I've been heading the Cyprus Investment Promotion Agency for years prior to becoming the president of the chamber, I know our weaknesses and we cannot resolve our problems unless we accept them and face them. And this is what we are trying to put through to the government in every single meeting uh, because it is important. There is the will from the government. Most of the transformations that have not been done have failed at the House of Parliament. Perhaps, perhaps it's because of your British inheritance that you've had so much bureaucracy and regulation um, in uh, in Cyprus. <laughs> but the best of luck is fixing it. Do you have any final comments, um, Goran? We are running out of time, but any final thoughts on on, on, on Cyprus and where it's going? No, I mean, uh, I, I very much like uh, the many comments that Mr. Christodoulos uh, mentioned about all the comparative advantages of, uh, of Cyprus. I mean, let me just, I mean, underline... Uh, uh, location, location, location. I mean, it, I mean, it is re really located in a, in a fantastic spot and should could take advantage of that. So that's um, uh, that's something that I would uh, like to reiterate. And finally, I mean, it may it may sound like a cliche, 
But I really believe that this is the time to take opportunity and to build back better. And also to build back, back uh, more resilient societies. I mean, last year, as I, as I said, we, 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 we were firing warnings about not being prepared for shocks. And while we, we probably did not uh, talk about shock of a pandemic, I mean, generally, I mean, our societies are not prepared for all sorts of shocks. I mean, uh, including climate uh, change uh, and shocks related to climate. We need to recognize how vulnerable we are and build societies and economies that will be more resilient. So this would be the final message that I would like to, to leave. Thank you very much, John. Well, thank, thank you very much. I'm just, I'm just reminded that, um, that Cyprus bounced back really quite impressively from the terrible period of 2013 and the crisis of the euro. So, uh, so it, is, it is a resilient country. Um, thank you very much to Goran Tindic and thank you very much to Christodoulos um, Angastiniotis. Um, and I'm sorry we're not meeting in Nicosia, but maybe next year we will do. Um, so with that, I think I need to bring the, the 16th Cyprus Economist Summit to an end. Um, uh, thank you to all of the speakers, um, and thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to the audience who sent in questions. I'm sorry I didn't manage to get every question asked, but the ones that I saw, I tried to draw on. Uh, and I'd like to just thank once again our sponsors, uh, particularly PricewaterhouseCoopers, Cyprus, Bank of Cyprus, ExxonMobil, the European University Cyprus, Chevron, and Hellenic Petroleum Group, and all the rest of the sponsors and partners. And I hope that we can meet again next year. And I would like to thank Hazlis and Rivas for organizing once again the 16th Cyprus Virtual Summit. Um, and see you next year. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>that advance modern life. Energy is essential.
for providing cleaner air and water, access to education and healthcare. Reliable, affordable energy improves lives. Exxon Mobil. European University Cyprus is a leading international university which stands apart with its high academic values, its modern campus and its commitment to the wider community. With an important regional presence, European University Cyprus has distinguished itself in teaching excellence, academic and scientific research with an impressive rate of growth. QS Top Universities, the most authoritative international rating organization, ranked European University Cyprus among the top universities in the world, granting it a five-star rating in the fields of teaching, facilities, internationalization, employability, inclusiveness, and social responsibility. In 2020, the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings placed European University Cyprus among the top 101 universities worldwide for innovation, industry and infrastructure. Its auditoriums have hosted globally acclaimed personalities. Its lecture halls have been graced with internationally acknowledged academics. It is here at European University Cyprus that Microsoft established the Microsoft Innovation Center, one of only 110 operating globally, connecting knowledge and research with entrepreneurship and innovation. Take one step forward onto the unfolding path of your future. European University Cyprus will give you the knowledge and the power to take that journey. For 140 years, we've been enabling human progress, knowing that everything we do everywhere in the world is in service of people. Generations of our problem solvers all around the globe working brilliantly, collaboratively and inexhaustibly to provide more reliable, more affordable and ever cleaner energy. For 140 years, we've been enabling human progress, knowing that everything we do everywhere in the world is in service of people. Generations of our problem solvers all around the globe working brilliantly, collaboratively and inexhaustibly to provide more reliable, more affordable and ever cleaner energy. The population has access to only basic forms of energy. Each of these global citizens deserves access to a better quality of life. Affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy and the human progress it enables is essential to this basic right. We believe life depends on human energy.
in a world that never sleeps, your money should work for you 24-7. That is why you need a truly global account with a professional team to support you. At Ecom Banks, we gathered a team of the best global tech gurus, experienced bankers and finance specialists to create the ultimate e-accounts platform. The result is astonishing. Welcome to the era of Ecom Banks, a platform to rule them all. With global reach, intuitive user-friendly interface, and secure transactions, EconBanks very simply is the ultimate international e-money and e-accounts platform. EconBanks can process more than 1,000 transactions per second, hold millions of accounts and data, while communicating with a complex network of more than 20 European and international banks. EconBanks platform will rock your world. With intuitive and modern user interface, solid security features, communicating through a multi-tier network of servers, exchanging and verifying data in split seconds using biometric user verification methods. Did we mention it was created by bankers? Therefore, there is a love for regulation, making EconBanks a European authorized and licensed electronic money institution and a member of SWIFT and SEPA payments, issuing unique IBANs, empowering you to convert and transact with immediate liquid access to 100% of your funds. We make the world a smaller place with close to zero time wasting and moving your funds from east to west and south to north. While others think in a box and still use traditional means, you can be the one who breaks free, the one who sees and uses the future. One account, everything. EconBanks will allow you to interact through multiple bank accounts globally with our PSD2 API integrations, using your own IBAN and our network of correspondent banking. That's how you keep your money fit and global. Will you be one of the thousands of transactions per second on our futuristic platform? Will you give power to your money? Ecom Banks, FinTech eAccounts platform. With us, the future is today.
from our platforms to our labs, offices, and facilities, and in communities around the world. We're continuously innovating to find better, cleaner, more efficient ways to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. Energy is essential to providing cleaner air and water, access to education and healthcare. Reliable, affordable energy improves lives. Exxon Mobil. European University Cyprus is a leading international university which stands apart with its high academic values, its modern campus and its commitment to the wider community. With an important regional presence, European University Cyprus has distinguished itself in teaching excellence, academic and scientific research with an impressive rate of growth. QS Top Universities, the most authoritative international rating organization, ranked European University Cyprus among the top universities in the world, granting it a five-star rating in the fields of teaching, facilities, internationalization, employability, inclusiveness, and social responsibility. In 2020, the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings placed European University Cyprus among the top 101 universities worldwide for innovation, industry and infrastructure. Its auditoriums have hosted globally acclaimed personalities. Its lecture halls have been graced with internationally acknowledged academics. It is here at European University Cyprus that Microsoft established the Microsoft Innovation Center, one of only 110 operating globally, connecting knowledge and research with entrepreneurship and innovation. Take one step forward onto the unfolding path of your future. European University Cyprus will give you the knowledge and the power to take that journey. For 140 years, we've been enabling human progress, knowing that everything we do everywhere in the world is in service of people. Generations of our problem solvers all around the globe working brilliantly, collaboratively and inexhaustibly to provide more reliable, more affordable and ever cleaner energy.
in a world that never sleeps, your money should work for you 24-7. That is why you need a truly global account with a professional team to support you. At Ecom Banks, we gathered a team of the best global tech gurus, experienced bankers and finance specialists to create the ultimate e-accounts platform. The result is astonishing. Welcome to the era of Ecom Banks, a platform to rule them all. With global reach, intuitive user-friendly interface, and secure transactions, EconBanks very simply is the ultimate international e-money and e-accounts platform. EconBanks can process more than 1,000 transactions per second, hold millions of accounts and data, while communicating with a complex network of more than 20 European and international banks. EconBanks platform will rock your world. With intuitive and modern user interface, solid security features, communicating through a multi-tier network of servers, exchanging and verifying data in split seconds using biometric user verification methods. Did we mention it was created by bankers? Therefore, there is a love for regulation, making EconBanks a European authorized and licensed electronic money institution and a member of SWIFT and SEPA payments, issuing unique IBANs, empowering you to convert and transact with immediate liquid access to 100% of your funds. We make the world a smaller place with close to zero time wasting and moving your funds from east to west and south to north. While others think in a box and still use traditional means, you can be the one who breaks free. The one who sees and uses the future. One account, everything. EconBanks will allow you to interact through multiple bank accounts globally with our PSD2 API integrations using your own IBAN and our network of correspondent banking. That's how you keep your money fit and global. Will you be one of the thousands of transactions per second on our futuristic platform? Will you give power to your money? Ecom Banks, FinTech eAccounts platform. With us, the future is today.
from our platforms to our labs, offices, and facilities, and in communities around the world. We're continuously innovating to find better, cleaner, more efficient ways to provide the energy solutions that advance modern life. Energy is essential to providing cleaner air and water, access to education and healthcare. Reliable, affordable energy improves lives. Exxon Mobil. European University Cyprus is a leading international university which stands apart with its high academic values, its modern campus and its